This conference will now be recorded. Is reimagine, recreate, restores. In quest for survival and development and industrialization, human beings have done a lot that have a radical impact on environment, physical and biological system within which they and other organisms live. As a result of human activities, soil erodes, cropland and forest disappear, population pollution spreads and millions of people suffer. We are facing the problem of climate change, desertification, deteriorating water supplies, food crisis, and disruption of biodiversity that threaten the very future of humankind on this mother earth. <clears throat> World Environment Day was established by the United Nations General Assembly in 1972 to mark the opening of the Stockholm Conference on Human Environment that was June 5, 1972. 58 countries participated, including India, in that conference. The purpose of World Environment Day celebration is to bring to the forefront the environmental problems and issues to the enhancement of public awareness and concern for the human environment. Another resolution adopted by the General Assembly the same day led to the creation of United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. The slogan of this United Nations Environment Program is Think Globally, Act Locally. The Stockholm Conference resolved to take appropriate steps globally for the preservation of natural resources on, of the earth, which among others include the preservation of the quality of air and water and the control of pollution. The occasion serves to inspire political and uh, community actions, governments, individuals, non-government organizations, business industry and media undertake a variety of activities aimed at renewing their commitment to the protection of the environment and hence for the sustenance of modern art. Every year, the United Nations places one theme as a global issue. This year's theme is ecosystem restoration with a special focus on creating a good relationship with nature. In the next 10 years, the United Nations, with the support of countries, partners, and people, want to focus on the preventing and uh, reversing the loss of degraded natural ecosystem to fight the impacts of climate change and prevent the loss of millions of species and enhance food security, water supply, and livelihoods. Reviving natural carbon sinks such as forests and pitlands could help close the climate emissions gap by 20% by 2030. Replanting with native tree species can also help buffer some of the aspected devastating effects of a warming planet, such as increased risks of forest fires. Currently, 3.2 million people which is about 40% of the world's population, suffer from the continued degradation of ecosystems, for example, by losing access to fertile soil or shed drinking water. The end of this decade is also the deadline for the Sustainable Development Goals and uh, the timeline that scientists identified is significant to evade the consequences of climate change. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It aims to integrate three dimensions of sustainable development. Number one, economic. Number two, social. And third one is environment. Till recent past, there has been little, uh, little attention paid to the social environment needed for sustainable mode of development. Until and unless 
the social environment is transformed goals of sustainable development cannot be achieved empowered with unique demographic advantages and guided efforts india is poised to position itself among developed economies within the next 10 to 15 years every year a country is to host the world environment day this year pakistan will host world environment day 2021 and uh, pakistan will do 10 billion saplings to be planted next to combat the global climate change next to encourage using the electric vehicles next to initiate policies for conservation of national parks etc observation of world environment day calls on each and every one of us to contribute to the healing of the healing planet art in spite of considerable efforts and significant achievements many of the problems which black the art during the 20th century still linger more than ever we need to take the necessary steps to ensure that the environment remains at the top of the global agenda let us use the occasion of the world environment day to remind every citizen communities and uh, the business and the industry that the art is in our hands by joining together we can take the common sense steps we need to take and uh, be proud to pass along a safe clean world to our central and our general children world environment day is a once a year activity however it does not mean that we should only pay attention to the environment on that one day only irrespective of the day organization event country team preservation of nature is our responsibility let us join united nations generation restoration movement for recovery of ecosystem that has been degraded and combat the mass extinction of biodiversity let us remember man is part of nature his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself that was said by russell carson the great environmentalist sundalan bhaguna said i caught the war this war is between man and nature if man wins, he will be perished and gods. If each and every citizen of the whole globe is having a green mindset, then we will be able to make our mother art green. With this background, I would like to conclude my talk and I would like to thank all the participants and also the organizers for arranging this World Environment Day 2021 and also having a very, very important international conference on environment, agriculture, human and, in, and animal health. I wish the observation of this observation of World Environment Day and international conference a grand success. Thank you all very much. So now we do have our uh, next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Wilson Aruni. Uh, he is a pro vice chancellor of uh, Satibama uh, University. Uh, Dr. Wilson has taken up the portion of uh, pro vice chancellor of Satibama Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai, on sabbatical leave from Professor Department of Microbiology uh, in Fiji Business and Global Health, California University of Science and Medicine, Loma Linda, USA. Uh, principal scientist u.s department of veterans affairs loma linda ca usa adjunct professor stem cell core facility university of california riverside usa he has served in various academic and administrative positions, especially in the university academy affairs curriculum revision and accreditation in the united states of america he has been involved in active teaching and research for a period of uh, 24 years uh, previously, he was working as professor at the Center, uh, Center for Excellence in Animal Biotechnology and Immunology 
and also at the Department of Microbiology, Madras Veterinary College, Tamil Nadu, and uh, Animal Science of the University, Tanuas, Chennai. Uh, during his tenure, he had occupied various academic capacities as head uh, University Bioinformatics Center and Advanced Imaging Facility. As an experienced academician with a vast ex international exposure, uh, he's uh, also a well-trained researcher in the field of microbiology and biotechnology. Uh, his research focuses on studying infectious pathogens, their uh, virulence, and their importance in systematic diseases. His expertise in the field of biomedics and nano vaccine delivery system is well acknowledged. Uh, he received his BVM degree from India, and his uh, doctoral studies focused on studying the virulence of RB viruses and um, what performed in studying their morphogenesis at the All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, India. His postdoctoral training at the University of California, Davis. Uh, brought uh, both uh, seminal publications, uh, that is USDA and uh, BBSRC UK. His finding works also uh, culminated in two patents. Uh, one of his uh, other pioneering work through postdoc fellowship at the Laboratory of Gene Structure and Expression, National Cancer Center of uh, Singapore, uh, studied the halo uh, haplotype variations on the enterocytes uh, and the hepatic expression of p glycoproteins. Uh, he's also trained through an NIH uh, postdoctoral research fellowship exploring the molecular aspects of human microbiome infections. His research work at the Loma Linda University uh, School of Medicine is uh, on studying the virulence, determinants, and uh, host pathogen infection of uh, world pathogens and their casual role in systematic diseases through uh, an integrated proteins approach. Uh, his studies were the first to explore a new oral pathogen, uh, filifactor losses and its virulence potential. His publish have been featured in the cover page of prestigious journals uh, like uh, Nature Communications, uh, Infection and Immunity, uh, Protein Mix, and in other peer-reviewed journals of high impact factors. He has been invited internationally to present his professional work and currently serving as a faculty in many institutions abroad. In addition to his research initiatives, he has uh, completed four extra mural grants funded by DBT, DST, and ICMR and currently funded with two grants from National Institute of Health, the NIH, as a principal investigator. His research work has uh, uh, culminated into 88 publications, uh, three books and five book chapters. He has a strong record of mentoring more than 21 graduate and eight doctoral students in India and in the United States. His students have been well praised in reputed uh, academic and research institutions internationally and nationally. He's currently serving on editorial boards of high impact uh, peer reviewed journals in the field of medical microbiology, biotechnology, and bioinformatics. Uh, he has served uh, surveyed, uh, serving as a member of uh, task forces in DBT and DST. He is also currently serving as a member of National Institute of Health uh, Grand Review Study uh, Sections uh, Task Forces, serving as a member of the Grand Review Panel on Vaccine Research Initiatives Grants, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and a current Grand Review, uh, Review Panel member of uh, Medical Research Council, MRC, and uh, BBSRC UK. Uh, with this introduction, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Wilson to give his keynote address. Welcome, Thank sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, welcome. Um, can you just give me an access for sharing the screen, please? Yes, sir. I made you as a presenter. Okay. I hope all can see uh, my presentation, right? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. okay. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, organizers, for giving me an opportunity to give the keynote address uh, in this August gathering. It was uh, 415 years ago in 1600s, where when the first microscope was identified and it was invented. It was Antony von Leeuwenhoek who found little organisms which he named as animalcules. And he found that in a small piece of a car. Later on, the development went on up until studying microbes everywhere, especially in every part of the environment. No matter what environment you would take, you would see microbes everywhere. There are microbes in the soil, there are microbes in the 
water, there are microbes in the sea, there are microbes everywhere, inclusive of in our body and outside our body too. So there is a lot of leap and bounds with regard to the research development, which you could see here, where people had moved from human genome project, where people started studying earlier the genes and the genome of human being. They now transitioned into studying human microbiome projects since 2008. And each and every microbiome plays a very vital role. So then what are microbiomes, by the way? They are a collection of uh, the microbes which live in our body and outside our body, which clearly sets a very good environment interaction with the host. So the talk caption would be the human microbiome and the hidden health factors. So what if the research is not going to be useful for the human mankind? What if the research is going to just culminate in only publications and patents? What if the research is not going to be useful for the longevity and the health of the human being? Hence, this is a very important burning topic in the whole world where people are focused on studying human microbiome. There are two important captions in the whole world. People are just chasing the wind. Number one, people are trying to live healthy and people are trying to age healthy. These two are very important things which are being sabotaged by many environmental events, such as uh, the ones that is currently going on, the COVID pandemic. So having said living healthy and aging healthy, people focused on three important factors with the research and development going on, with the initial focus on the genetic part of the human being. People thought that the genes played a very vital role in the longevity and health. And it is only our parents who give the wealth to us. Later on, there was a different school of thought which said that the environment and the environment modifications play a very vital role. For example, a person who smokes will not live longer or will not live healthier because of the epigenetic changes that happen in the gene because of the environment. The recent trend is that environmental interactions play a very vital role. There are constant environmental niches which are there, where we are already interacting with since the day we are born, such as the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the organisms that we that live inside our body, etc. So I'm going to focus on the third important point, the environmental interactions. So having said, initially, the genetics was playing a very vital role in the longevity. So when you see this picture of the whole world, the color coding says that the more it is yellow or orange, the less the people lived in these places. The bluer they are, the people live longer. For example, in the United States, the average longevity rate is 82 years and above, whereas in case of humans in India, it is only around 65 to 68 years. So initially, people started chasing research. And uh, I'm giving you two important examples here. Number one is the, the first known centurion who had lived for 100 years, documented in history, Jean Calvin. Yes, she lived for 100 years. But whereas when you just see this lady, she is a chronic smoker. So, you, despite of her smoking habits, she lived for 100 years. And people said that genes are very strong and she had a very good genes that made her live long. On the right side, you see a marathon runner named Jim Fix, who started running marathon only getting very scared after his father's death at the age of 45. He thought that he will also die very early. So he started running at the age of 40. When he started running at the age of 40 marathons, he was found dead running a marathon at the age of 42. So he couldn't beat the genes. So on the left side, you see a person who beat the genes. The other one couldn't beat 
the inherent property that we inherit from our parents. Having said this, the life expectancy in the Indian population, what you see here on the left graph, is around 66 to 68, as whereas compared to the all developed countries, which are very high. What really clearly makes a difference in this health and longevity, especially in this part of the continent versus the other places? The initial research on health and aging dated back to 1935, when a scientist called Mackey said that if you are going to eat little, you are going to be very healthy. So you see two monkeys, one on the left side, another one on the right side. On the left side, this monkey was given a restricted feeding versus the right side monkey, which was given ad libitum feeding. So the more the monkey ate, more the merrier it was. But at the age developed, it became so sobered and it became so sluggish. This was the first experiment by Mack. He wanted to prove this, so he himself went into a diet restriction to see how health and longevity played a very vital role. On the left side, you saw the same person, the author of this one, with the high body weight, okay, the, the vitals, the cholesterol, fasting, glucose, blood pressure, all very high versus on the right side, where it's a controlled eating habits, which made him so healthy. Even you could see this in my life, where when I was in India some 15 years ago, you would see here, I was so hefty, and whereas this is what I look now, with an age difference between 35 to 55. So is this really making a very vital, important role, as the food plays a very vital role in health? Where people went to five different places in the whole world where people lived more than 100 years. These places or these spots in the whole world are called as blue zones. One among the blue zones is the place where I come from, Loma Linda University, Loma Linda, California. So people thought that there should be something different within these people here, the habitat, which played a very vital role that increase the longevity and good health conditions versus the other geographical area. There were a lot of books that have been written on diet, life expectancy, secret of living long, etc. in the blue zone. And what you see are our publications from the Loma Linda University. And the Loma Linda legacy had started since very long, where you might know that the Kellogg corn flakes was first invented in Loma Linda, and these two are the Kellogg brothers who gave their whole wealth to our university, where the university is sustaining on research by their own endowments. So with this legacy of uh, good habits of feeding, a long study on longevity was conducted by National Institutes of Health in the US. It started in 1955. It is still going on. And this study is not through any lab animals, but with the human, real human being. That they are taking into consideration different feeding patterns, or food patterns by which they eat, what is the size of their meal that they eat, what is their physical activity, or what are the parameters that play a very vital role from the environmental, etc. So what you see down is a a total swimming pool exclusively for people who are 70 and above. And this is the food. And I should say that in Loma Linda, everybody is a vegetarian and there is no smoking within the city limits. So they say that being vegetarian makes you live longer because of certain obvious reasons where I'm going to just discuss now. But whereas when you just take our Indian counterpart, we live to eat and we eat to live. And people are very much fascinated about eating all meats of food. And this includes me as well. And people who ate a restricted diet with the vegetarian base really live longer. And what you see these two young people here are our administrative peoples of the university who still live and are very hale and healthy. 
one important thing is the activity that played a very vital role where people there at loma linda they run marathons very well as i was just telling you an example of gym fix so what you see here is a 85 year old our indian american who's a cardiologist who is our marathon guru and what you see here is me who's a beginner long before in a marathon so why am i saying all these things i am talking about vegetarian diet i am talking about running marathons they are all environmental cues that make us live healthier and longer so coming back to the system again genetics and genes had been proven false epigenetics is somewhat proven correct but whereas they are not the real real culprits for a health and a diseased state the environmental interactions are the main focus that is given now by the research science so we are going to talk about the microbiome which is nothing but the environment a human being is surrounded by and hence they are called as human beings are called as super organisms so human beings are different because each and every human being are unique by their microbiome or the bacteria or the viruses that live within us the microbiome totally if you are going to take them out numbers the human cells by 10 is to 1 if you have 10 cells of human being human cells one sorry one human cells to 10 bacterial or microbial cells four pounds of the total dry weight matter is only the microbes with such an effect of microbes in your body what you would see here is an analogy is that the 10 trillion human cells would account for 100 billion microbes. So to say that the red part which I'm just showing you here are only the human beings, whereas the white part that you see is all microbes. So now you imagine each and every one, just close your eyes and imagine that how many microbes live, how many microbes live within us that creates a very constant environment that is going to be interacting with us. This has been taken care of initially by researchers where people started taking the microbes from obese individuals and lean individuals. They gave it to lab animals to see how they looked like. And they found that obese uh, microbes that are taken from the obese individuals made the mice so big or obese versus the lean uh, microbial content taken from a lean person made the, the mouse very lean. So now people even had uh, patented certain bacteria within this lean kind of stuff. One good example is that there is one bacteria that is being patented in Japan, where you might have seen Japanese who are always slim despite of eating more food. So the community assembly that takes from the mouth until the rectum where the feces goes out bacteria and viruses and the microbes are there everywhere and what you see here is the the last column that i'm telling you is that the more you reach rectum there are cells more cells that you see here. so these bacterial cells are constantly there in your system and they play a very vital role in your health and in your disease state. so this is one of our uh, good examples of recent publications that have come out from one of our collaborators where he has taken a very extensive Western lifestyle, non-Western lifestyle from countries like Asia. And he wanted to see what is the real thing that is, that is happening with all those people. And he found that more than 154, 73 microbial genomes have been initially found where 77% were very new. So to say that the microbes that live in your body are not even named now. There are a lot of microbes which are waiting to be named. No matter we are talking about E. coli, Salmonella, etc. But whereas you need to know that there are 77% of the microbes that dwell within your system are not being named and they are very new and people do not know what are the microbes. And they vary between the Western lifestyle and the non-Western lifestyle is just because that the food habits are entirely different between these two 
group of population. So what really happens when you take that kind of a food? There is a constant tussle between the health and this and the disease state. When if it is going to be a healthy or a normal state, there is symbiosis among the bacteria and the viruses that live within our body. But whereas it slowly progresses when there is going to be detrimental bacteria that enters inside your system, which makes a symbiosis a state called dysbiosis. Why this is more important? Because it is only the bacteria and the viruses that dwell within the body. They produce vitamins for you. They prevent you from the disease. They enhance the immunity. For example, in case of COVID conditions, etc. And they resist colonization of detrimental bacteria. So hence, this is more important that keeping a good microbiome within our system is very important for the healthy state. Why is that? Because these bacteria and viruses, they produce antibiosis. And they also produce probiosis or the probiotics that produces good bacteria to be grown there. And ultimately, both together form the microbiosis that exists within our body, which is constantly fighting the bad bacteria. So the pictures which I'm seeing and showing you here is Alexander Fleming. And what you see here on the top is the, the penicillium notatum um, that is producing penicillium, penicillin. But whereas the one that you see in the blue color agar are the bacteria which are called as New Delhi meta, uh, metallo uh, beta lactamase one which is a very detrimental bacteria where no antibiotic is available. So antibiotics are being used very scrupulously, but we do not know that the antibiosis happens within your body. But when you are going to take this kind of pill, you are going to just kill all the good bacteria within your system. Antibiotics are there everywhere, starting from antibacterial soap to deodorant to face cleansing products, toothpaste, mouthwashes, etc. Not alone, the microbiome of the human being plays a very vital role. The positiveness of the microbiome of the soil, I've shown you here, a very important species of uh, bacteria, streptomyces, produces a lot of good antibiotics that are currently in existence. Now. Not alone the soil microbes, but also uh, what I'm showing you uh, here is the gut microbiome of nematodes um, that is being used for producing the recent antibiotic, which is called as Darbank. So the human microbiome, the soil microbiome, the microbiome of even the worms, the microbiome of even the whole environment, they all collectively bring about the antibiosis of protection and immunity. Hence, antibiotics are now not being trying to be used, but whereas there are a lot of alternatives to antibiotics that have come here. One good important thing is the peptides and the small molecules that are being produced by the microbiome. So I'm just showing you here antimicrobial peptides and the modifications of antimicrobial pe peptides that are being currently being produced by the microbiome, which are being used for, uh, for clinical use. One good example is the lysines, which are being used to kill the bacteria. It's, it's, it's like a, an antibiotic where these lysins are being added with, with fortified with endolysins to produce RT lysins, which are, which are very important and potent lysins. They are being produced only by the bacteria that are present within our body. So ultimately what we get is a very good antibiosis that we get. So I'll show you two videos over here. Number one is the ordinary lysine here. We just see how long it takes to kill the bacteria in vitro. So it takes longer to kill the bacteria and the bacteria is not killed properly. Whereas the RT lysine, you would see here, the bacteria is killed within a matter of quick seconds. So I just want you to remember that they are being produced by the microbiome. With such a lot of diversified microbiomes, which I'm showing you here, the fecal microbiome, the oral microbiome, which is here, skin microbiome, etc. What happens is this microbiome begets prophylaxis by competing with the 
detrimental pathogens are protecting the mucosal barrier, modulating the immune system, and also giving an antimicrobial peptide kind of a stuff in protecting the environment. So ultimately, what do we need for a good microbiome to exist? We need a good diet that will produce good microbiota, and ultimately, the host is being protected. So a balanced diet with high fiber will bring balanced high diversity of anti-inflammatory microbiota, and ultimately, a balanced, healthy, symbiotic life. The vice versa happens in an imbalanced, non-symbiotic context causing the disease. So this kind of diversification is the one that we see within our human system. So this is a, uh, the map of diversity of the human microbiome that exists within our system, where you will see such a lot of diversification that exists within our body. How does this diversification happen within our body is just because of the food that we eat. Okay, if that is the case, is dietary diversity playing a very vital role? But whereas you need to know that only human beings eat 12 species of plants and five species of animals. Rest, we do not eat anything. And more than 150 to 200 species are only being used among the 250,000 to 300,000 plant, edible plant species. So you can just think about how you eat and what you eat. There is no diversity in what we eat. For example, a human being, a, an Indian, in the morning he takes idli, afternoon rice, evening dosa or something. So there is no much of a diversity in the diet. But whereas diversity in diet plays a very vital role in good microbiome. Why? Because they produce a lot of molecules that bring about many variations and many phytostimulants pigments, enzymes, etc. For example, this is a lettuce that I'm showing you here, which has a novel bioactive compounds, okay? The greens that we are going to eat has certain bacteria called Enterobacter, Polito, Trichum, Pomposis species, etc., which exist within as an intracellular state within the bacteria, uh, within the greens. So these are all a couple of studies that we did it. As I was just talking about the uh, 1915 study that happened through the progress. What I'm showing you on the left side are the fruits and vegetables that help in the longevity and health. So you, we have just done this with vegetarians, lacto-vegetarians, people who take only milk, peso-vegetarians, people who are vegetarians but they take fish, semi-vegetarians, they take egg. You would see here pure vegetarians are the ones where they are going to be a very good health and these are the fruits and vegetables that play a very vital role or supplement in health and longevity. Starchy foods, okay, they are all negative fats. Fat, sweets and snacks, which Indians are very, very known for. And they are also being corroborated uh, with certain important cancers, for example, breast cancer, colon cancer and prostate cancer. You see here the green block here represents the vegetarian, the vegans, where you would see here they have the less incidence of all the cancers, three collectively. The same way we did a multivariate hazard analysis between male and female data together. So what does this actually do? It takes into consideration the whole environment in which he lives, he or she lives, with the diet that he is going to take for a quite a long time. And what is the accumulation pattern that takes care of modification of the microbiome? And ultimately, what is good and bad is being reported here, where the vegetarians produce the highest, sorry, the lowest multivariate hazard analysis. It means that the vegetarians are more protected when compared to all the non-vegetarians or lacto-vegetarian or peso-vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, etc. Likewise, I'm just showing you the same for a prostate cancer for the for the males. Having said that, what is so unique with the plant diet versus animal diet? So we did a, a very extensive study with plant diet and animal diet, not with the guinea pigs, but whereas with the human beings, and we found certain important bacteria which are highly upregulated 
in the system. For example, they increase the short chain fatty acids, which reduces the inflammation. But whereas animal proteins increase the TMOA, trimethylamine oxide, which causes cardiovascular disease, but whereas they reduce short chain fatty acids, and that's, that is how they do not protect the individual. Likewise, the gut microbiome diversity is being studied uh, and we studied with three different diets. One is gluten-free diet, another one is Western diet, another one is Mediterranean diet. And I've shown you the data between the Western and non-Western diet, where Mediterranean diet comes from the Mediterranean region like Saudi Arabia, the Muslim countries, where Western diet from the, from the West and gluten-free diet to some extent from the Spanish side. And we found such a lot of variation in the gut microbiome. And what I've selected and I'm showing you is the beneficial microbes that are there that bring about a very good positive note to the health and life. This is the data to back up uh, what I have done earlier, what, I, what we have just given earlier, where this gives a species abundance of the good bacteria in different places of the microbiome in the oral microbiome, in the mouth, in the gut microbiome, stomach, small intestines, et cetera, inclusive of anterior nares. It means that in the nose. So bacteria do live in our, your, our air cavity, which can protect, uh, play a very protective load, role. So this is how the relative abundance have been identified in a positive individual, for example, this is being done with the candidate subjects of low um, per se. So how do they go about? Because they produce certain small molecules. And I've just given you on the right side, certain small molecules that are being produced from detrimental bacteria, which are currently used positively for treatment. So what we did was we did a genomic approach versus metabolomic approach. See, altogether, when you just see and study the metabolites of small molecules, the metabolites of small molecules in the microbiomes are very rich. And you would see one into 10 to the power of 30 exists in the whole biosphere, in the whole environment, which is being not tapped, where approximately 25,000 is being well studied here. So what we did was we took this microbiome study. We did a very extensive uh, study to see what is the interaction, what is the positive negative interaction. I don't want to go very deep into the data, but what I'm showing you is we have taken, for example, PG is a, is a bacteria called Parformus gingivalis, VP is Valinella, Fusobacterium, FN is Fusobacterium nucleatum, etc. So what we, we found was with the base of the bioinformatic analysis and the proteomic approach, we found a lot of uh, small molecule candidates that I'm just showing you here. And to make them sum up, we found a lot of small molecules that are produced by certain important bacteria. And these small molecules are also increased in capacity, increased in concentration when, it, when people eat a lot of good diet, such as ginger and certain important mushrooms called as shikate mushrooms. And these two are found to be a high immune boosters of the diversified microbiome. So to say that it is only the diet that diversifies a very good microbiome. And you know, this is a smoothie candidate very commonly being used in the Western world. So to make it a nutshell, when you do a research with the microbiome, the ones that you see in red are all very detrimental bacteria. The ones you see in blue are all good bacteria but there are black dots which represent certain bacteria which neither become good or not become bad. But at the same time, when more good bacteria are there, this black becomes more blue. When more red bacteria are there, the black becomes more red. It's like a mischievous uh, a class where many people become so mischievous, etc. So microbiome played a very vital role. Why? It's just because if you take diets with vegetarian you also take soil microbiomes as well and ultimately we did a very extensive analysis with two important bacteria that you would see here and this is a electron micrograph that was published in the cover page of infection immunity which said that when two bacteria join together they produce a lot of havoc with the human cells you could see here the whole 
human cells become so rumbled uh, and stratified like a noodles. Whereas the inset that you see here on the right side are a single bacterial candidate affecting the human cells. And you will see the variation in the human cells where the human cells are not targeted. We also wanted to know what is the main reason. So we did a whole global proteome variation of the human host cells. And we found a lot of uh, studies. One important uh, finding was that certain group of bacteria called odoribacter produce, produce certain important small molecules which are very positively helpful for the microbiome to combat disease conditions. So, many bacteria from our study we found to be used for reducing obesity, to reduce arthritis, to reduce peptic ulcers, to improve immunity, and certain important lactobacillus species we uniquely identified improve overall health. So now the question arises that if we say that Western world, the Eastern world, uh, which uh, group of people have the good microbiome? And this is a study from one of our collaborators from Harvard where they have found out a group of people in Tanzania called Hazda tribe, where the people who had the very extensive, good diversified microbiome, and I should say that uh, from their feces, bacteria have been identified and they are being used as probiotic desiccated cultures. So this is the ones has the tribe hunters. And these are the diversified microbiome candidates that are being used for a diversified microbiome study. So now comes a tussle between biology and chemistry. As I've already told you, we were talking about microorganisms or the microbiome. And these microbiomes produce small molecules, which is nothing but the chemistry. So now, which is really good or which is really the best, biology or the chemistry? It is always a, a very big question between the biology and the chemistry. But whereas if you people could remember this particular thing, uh, a, a, a Tamil, uh, this thing from Kalinga TV, Manada Mailada, where everybody says that your chemistry is important, chemistry is important. Ultimately, we are in a condition where the chemistry is not at all working anywhere and we are totally isolated within a single room. So now the chemistry is not working anywhere. But ultimately, we need to know that biology always wins here. The reason being, the recent havoc of evolution of this pathogenic coronavirus that we are facing right now. It is just some biology, a slip of the biology mistake that has been made in a high security laboratory at Wuhan, which has brought a very monster coronavirus, COVID-19, that had got disseminated everywhere in the world that is creating a lot of problems. And you will see here, and this is being ultimately published, where there are a lot of other things that happen too. Because, you know, when you just take the total human population into concern, there are only three places in the whole world where many high security pathogens are being protectively stored, such as smallpox, um, plague bacteria, etc. But whereas, you know, this is a recent thing which I'm just showing you here is that the there is a uh, settling loss of a smallpox vial from a high security laboratory. So imagine biology always wins here because biology creates the chemistry. And I should certainly say that they become the uh, nature's weaponized uh, means where the biology is being weaponized to produce a monster super SARS virus that we are focusing on. As you all know, that the experiment to produce a super SARS virus had mishap to produce a COVID-19 mutation in bringing about the COVID-19 pandemic that we are facing. So having said that, with all Indians suing the Wuhan BSL laboratory in China, biology or chemistry, ultimately, this is the century of biotechnology, where initially people started exploring biology. It was, they were isolating new bacteria, and then finally they moved on to designing biology. It's like they started cloning genes. But now people have started building biology. It means that they are producing new entities of bacteria. For example, the one which is being published in Science 2019 by Craig Venter, you see on the right side, a pioneering man who had first uh, synthesized 
482 protein coding genes with 43 RNA genes to produce a pathogen, uh, to produce an organism called mycoplasma genitalia, which is the first synthetic uh, um, microbe to be produced. So starting from exploring biology to designing biology through cloning, we have ended up in building biology. And people now are focusing on genetically engineered machines, which could do a very synthetic work. So I was very privileged to do my postdoc in J. Craig Venters Institute. What you see on the right side is Craig Venters Institute, and what you see here is me. And this is a, our small group at Loma Linda University who were very helpful in carrying a part of the research. I am not given very extensive data about what I presented, but I just wanted to tell it on a sequence to tell you that microbiome is a very potent environment that plays a very vital role because it has constant interaction in bringing good or bad to your system. So these are the couple of references uh, uh, from us. And to talk about Loma Linda University, a couple of good things that uh, we have, we, we were the first one to be patenting the cardiac skin that uh, currently being used for heart attack. And uh, this is the cardiac transplant. These babies are being transplanted with the new heart. And he is Leonard Bailey, doctor who did that. We have a proton therapy center, which is state of art in the United States. And I also represent Loma Linda University. What you see here on the right side is the Center for Research, Center for uh, uh, CDD, Center for uh, Drug Discovery and Development. What you see here down, we have a biosafety level, PSL3 laboratory. We do very extensive research on human pathogens. Um, and uh, this is a screenshot of uh, our laboratory. and. This is Satya Bama. We are both academic as well as our research component blended together. And with this small note, let me thank all uh, the participants for giving me an opportunity to share my views about one of the important integers of environment in this environment day, which is nothing but a microbiome. Thank you very much. And uh, now I request uh, uh, Dr. Binotta Thakam, uh, one of the co-organizer of this uh, international conference uh, to give a, a formal word of thanks to the uh, uh, Professor uh, Raj Mohan, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, um, uh, Manjuri University, and uh, Dr. Wilson Aruni right. of uh, Honorable Professor of uh, Satibama University. Uh, we, are, we are very happy to have you all here, first of all. Uh, good morning to all the respected officials and all the participants present here. I'm very much blessed uh, to honor you all and welcome you to our uh, this international conference. I hope it will be very much useful to you. And we had wanted to give a small thank you masses before our president and our guest speaker leaves. Leave, however, since they are having um, this uh, uh, other engaged work, but let me do the formalities, okay? So first and foremost, we would like to thank our special guest, Dr. Uh, Professor Nongaitem Rajmohan Singh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dhanamanjuri University, Impal, Manipur, who despite his busy schedule, had found time to grace this occasion as, the, as our president, okay? Thank you, sir. Uh, we were really blessed to have you here. Your talk was quite insightful, and also we express our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Wilson Arodi, Honorable uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, Satyavama Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai. Sir, your gracious presence and your contribution on the topic, the human microbiome, the hidden health factor has been of, of quite a value to us and very informative. I hope the medical facts that he had said can also be applied in fighting the ongoing COVID. Okay, since they have gone, let me just wind up here and we, we, we welcome the distinguished invitees present here who had also accepted our invitation to share some of their valuable knowledges. So let's hear from other invitees now. It will start from Dr. Sandeep K. Malhotra, our respected prof uh, professor from Allahabad. Okay, uh, Dr. Ram? Hello? Dr. Ram? Yes. Uh, can you please yes, proceed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gunatha. Uh, uh, now we do have our uh, next uh, plenary lecture by uh, Professor Sandeep K. Malhotra. Uh, thank you, sir. Like. Uh, 
when I requested him to uh, be a speaker of this uh, conference, he immediately given his consent and uh, he uh, like you know, uh, he joined with us today. And uh, I would like to give brief introduction of uh, Professor Sandeep K. Malhotra. He has been member steering committee interim of Association of uh, Commonwealth Universities Extension Professionals uh, between 2008 to 9. He has been associated with the university uh, uh, teaching and research for the past 46 years, during which he worked on Department of Biotechnology funded research projects for seven years, besides uh, 15 other major scientific research projects sponsored by uh, Board of Research for uh, uh, Nuclear Sciences, uh, Mumbai, uh, DST, UGC, ICAR, World Bank, and others. He was a member steering committee in the of Association of Commonwealth Universities Extension Professionals between 2008 to 9. Currently, he has joined uh, uh, rejoined the University of Allahabad as professor. He has uh, he has the distinction of uh, being uh, decorated with 15 gold medals uh, for uh, pursuing research interests. Uh, the silver lining uh, being UGC Career Award. Uh, his uh, uh, award. Uh, uh, he has uh, one patent number 282490 uh, and more than 250 research publications, including nine books and seven reviews to uh, Institute of Oceanography, Goa, and uh, UNDP uh, MOEN, second. And uh, we study eight countries abroad for various uh, uh, academic and business assignments. Currently, the vice president of uh, two societies, Indian Society for Parasitology and Indian Society for Helminthology. He has been a life member of uh, several distinguished uh, international and national societies and he had fellowships of several of these like uh, FDSI, FHS, FSB, FSESC. Uh, Professor Malhotra delivered uh, more than 70 invited guest lectures at uh, the different uh, international and national conference uh, seminars and was in invited as a judge at the two meetings in USA. Uh, one at uh, San Francisco and the other at uh, uh, Nashville. Uh, Professor Malhotra has been the keynote speaker and the chief guest at 18 other scientific meetings nationally and internationally. Uh, with this introduction, I would like to uh, welcome Professor Sandeep K. Malhotra uh, to give his presentation. Welcome, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Rajesh. And I uh, place my bundle of thanks, in fact, you, you have been kind enough to give me space over here and uh, I would be thankful to the audience if they are able to understand what I present from my field work. In fact, this is uh, the kind of opportunity which seldom do we get. I got an opportunity to stay over the Garhwal Himalayas for quite a longer period of time for about 12 years. And then I came down to River Ganges area in the plains and finally we started work at the seashore areas in the uh, uh, Goa. So this gave us a rare opportunity to have a comparative account of pathogens, how they are changing patterns of distribution and under what conditions the environment is influencing them. And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever you call, this COVID-19 came down in 2020 and ultimately uh, we started their changing patterns and other things showed their lot of impact on human life. So this is precisely what I'm going to present here, that pathogens and their health significance. So the current one, which is uh, coronavirus, and uh, I think uh, we have labeled this as zoonotic significance organism because of its uh, mysterious characters. It's not yet decided and they consider it as intraspecies transmission possibility, then interspecies transmission into different organisms you see in the screen, ultimately transferred to virus, uh, transferred to human beings, and this is the position where we consider this as uh, the individual of organism of zoonotic significance. There is a doubt that it has been transferred from bats to pangolin, and that is the host which has been instrumental in transmitting it to human beings. This on the left hand screen is the SEM stage of uh, coronavirus. 
uh, quite dangerous from the point of view of its uh, possibility of invading whichever areas do we have. There are other things which we worked upon, the fishes and their bioinvasion of parasites through fishes. Practically every area they could invade. And once we utilize waterways, the aquatic possibility of these uh, uh, transmissions become much more greater. And this is the parasite, which is uh, we had been able to conclude that it has traveled through Arabian Sea from Goa. We got it in 2001. And uh, these are electron microscope photographs of three different varieties. This is at the bottom right is, uh, this one is Iringus caris. This is Rossless caris, which has traveled through to Alaba. This was mysterious that the 20, uh, 35 PPT saline water condition is not enough for this worm and it has been able to adapt into the freshwater Ganges conditions. That mystery was further becoming uh, very, very obvious because people would have thought this is a new species or newer organism with, that has uh, traveled from ocean areas to the fresh waters around 2,500 kilometers away. But to our surprise, their DNA nucleotide analysis revealed this to be the same worm. And there where the problem starts. If this is the same worm, it has zoonotic significance itself and has the possibility of transmission to human beings because it's a part of any secondary family which has been reported to be causing much harm to human disease aspects. And uh, spreading disease through nematodes becomes quite serious at times because when we see the fishes in uh, larger water bodies like oceans, they are uh, mostly the catfishes involved. And when they are transferred through uh, areas of Bay of Bengal to Allahabad, that is the ocean passage, and uh, water conditions, fish variety is much too many. In fact, there is no other fish other than catfishes involved that have been instrumental in transmitting Rossless caris, which is the worm. So why not other variety of fishes is a big question mark. There, is, there are a huge number of species in oceanic waters and uh, around 29 to 30 reported at Allahabad, now, now called Prayagraj. So this condition is very specific that the worm has certain things to the liking as far as environmental influence is concerned. And it has carved its own niche. That is how I'm going to explain things here. First thing we come across is the morphological nature of the oral armature. You will find at the bottom right figure four is ankylostoma, and that is parasitic in human beings. Look at the armature and the strength of this area and compare it with rustless caries on top right hand. These are the things that kept us baffled that what is the evolutionary significance of this parasite occurring in fishes? Because we know that with the passage of evolution, parasites have evolved in the form of co-evolution. And gradually as they proceeded, as the vertebrate evolution proceeded through amphibia, fishes through amphibia, reptile, birds, and mammals, these ankylostoma occurred in mammals. But on the contrary, morphology being almost to the same strength in Rossless caries, these worms were directly occurring in fishes. What it has to communicate. The environmental conditions have a greater thing to communicate because there are much harder things expected from these worms and they are able to survive under adversaries in the environment and they are able to match the characteristics of ankylostoma that itself has the cutting teeth in the uh, oral area. This oral armature has been comparable. 
why i show this is that every vertebrate uh, every invertebrate like uh, parasitic pathogens uh, they need an intermediate host so what is most surprising that any cicadae worms have the intermediate host uh, which are the dolphins and they have been reported to transmit these to what from the water bodies to human systems that any cicadae has pathogenic significance is an established fact uh, i mean causing diseases in human beings these dolphins are not very common in every water body normally they are the indicators of clean water so we found it in area around prayagraj extending up to fatehpur this is the part where the dolphins are greater in number and to our surprise fishes in this area bagarius bagarius in particular who existing with this dolphin the same water body the string stretch of river ganges up to patna these bagarius were only harboring rustless caries any second worms like any secus this any secus typica is the species which occurs in human beings in particular it has a specific characteristic to uh, possess excretory pore at the top near the mouth so these are the specificities and uh, about papillae i'll come a little later the question was these are the total any second worms which have been occurring around in water bodies but never or oh, i would say seldom have these have been reported in fresh water they have all been the residents of uh, marine waters and now what we report is the worm rustus caris having reported from ocean areas at goa now are occurring in river ganges and to a certain extent to river gomti i will, I will explain it little, little later i think as caris we described from goa contrasecum rapidus caris anisecus rustus caris and hesothylisha these are the, some of the most common things and i have shown the characteristics how to persons expect uh, interested in taxonomy of these worms would be in uh, getting the morphological variations step by step i have tried to uh, give you an account along with their photographs so that you understand what are the specificities of these worms when we encounter i think is there is look at their body segmentation that's very curiously dense in uh, comparison to rustless caris that you saw earlier and any secus seldom has that kind of segmentations on body um, contrasecum seldom has i mean they are very limited very uh, fragile kind of segmentation visible in the electron microscopy but certainly not in um, light microscopy it's very difficult to study those things but the morphological features the amphits and the excretory pore near the mouth these are certain interesting features in morphology of these and it's a second where we differentiate rustus caris comes near rapidus caris and that is how we can see that those interlabia and the modification i showed you in the first slide the interlabia of rustus caris are very very peculiar look at this these interlabia on the left hand side top they are uh, and the segmentation uh, you can compare it with irangus caris as well so these are the specific morphological features which are visible only after we study uh, electron microscope so in this typica i have shown you already the uh, uh, what i show here are the papillies great variety of papillies on uh, rustus caris and they are to be differentiated from other worms one on the right hand side top is sunflower papilla that's a very peculiar thing that we are getting these sunflower papilla only in the worms that are being reported from river ganges now a lot of years ago arthur reported uh, uh, an goisia the worm had papilla like this sunflower papilla but this goisia was reported by him from bangladesh from a river tenulosa that crosses across river ganges at the level of these uh, tributaries that cross over from india to bangladesh from west bengal to bangladesh so in those areas when the rivers flow then the fishes also go across to bangladesh and goisia was the first worm 
ever to be reported with sunflower papilla. And later now we have reported these things on practically every any second. Uh, I'll show you a little, little later about the specificities of these uh, sunflower papillae. I want to give you an idea of uh, serine areas we have in West Bengal. They are normally extending up to um, say about uh, five, five to 20 kilometers uh, from the Bay of Bengal actually. These are the actual photographs which have been taken by my students uh, in 2013 before the cyclone. And you can imagine this area where practically fresh water extends into, uh, I mean, marine water extends into the fresh water zones to look at this. When the cyclone comes really at the top speed of 185 kilometers per hour, like it did in Orissa uh, a few days ago, this enters, this oceanic water enters up to the extent of 100 kilometers inside the surface areas of West Bengal and uh, all the lives are disturbed. You know much things about this. So this is Goa. Estuarine area in Goa relatively calm waters and they extend into those uh, at the distance you see the ship those people in, in enjoying in merriment and uh, this again is the shrine content where this is to the extent we can see in mandavi riverine estuary this is alaba what is happening here is there is a fish market from which the water flows into the river yamuna since yamuna this spot is very close to Sangam, where Ganges and Yamuna do meet. And uh, you find these migratory birds. That is one feature which I wanted to show that just before their um, actual arrival of rains, when the river will have uh, its full water content, I say this because its water content is stopped at higher reaches of Himalayas near Tehri Dam. The, when the Tehri Dam blockage of riverine flow is affected, this water becomes very less in Sangam area when you are seeing this. So this is a Nala, the outlet of fish market, or you can say uh, the fishes are being collected and uh, thrashed into uh, different kinds of uh, formats to sell it in the market or packed for the market selling. So from that area, only dirty water is coming down to river Yamuna. And these migratory birds, which have a role in spreading those worms from Goa or other oceanic areas to the river Ganges and Yamuna, they do not go to Sangam area. They come down to this place because they get uh, fish, fish and their uh, dirty flesh inside these waters. So they need very good food which they are getting here, but their natural color is extreme white, shining white. But look at these, they are appearing as dirty black because they most of the time before the arrival of rains, when the water is less in the river, they stay here. And this kind of transmission possibility from Goa to Allahabad, because fishes will feed uh, on the feta, uh, fetal matter of these birds. And this is one of the possibility that the things are spreading. Look at the dirty food coming from the fish market, the area which I say this Nala and the locality of fish market on the up, up, uh, uphill area, small uphill area uh, by the side of a river in Alaba. Now I come down to the sunflower characteristics, the papillae. These characteristics are from different fishes. I have put it in one place to give you a comparison. On the right hand side circle, top is Rosless Terris from Allahabad. Look at the different format of sunflower papillae here. And then the second one down right side is the actual one which I showed you from Goa. This is Rosless Terris from Goa. So the sunflower has a different shape as visible in electron microscopy. And the extreme left is Anisekis. This is a human worm, Anisekis typica. And look at their sunflower papillae. They again show a different character, different 
morphological feature characteristics or the group punches or the groups so these are the differences which we see this is not an anisakid worm uh, the one which we got from xenentodon this parasite we got from xenentodon a nematode indospinesia we reported it for the first time from alabad only and you can see the difference in morphology of these sunflower cloacal papillae which are visible in uh, electron microscopy not visible in ordinary photographs this is the magnified ones and so why i emphasize on caudal papillae the sucker the the uh, sunflower papillae there is a mystery which we are not able to resolve as yet why these are occurring only in worms of river ganges so the fishes harboring gangetic waters or of course the bengal uh, area where bay of bengal is there and then it it uh, does cross over to bangladesh why these associated streams only have fishes that parasitize that are parasitized by these worms which have sunflower papillae no other fish reported from anywhere from the country any water body marine or fresh water has these kind of sunflower papillae so we we are still able to uh, still not able to resolve this mystery this is anisakis typica the anterior end you can find the electron microscopy shows how uh, dangerous is the structure when it attaches to our elementary canal inside the body these are the posterior areas of different kind of uh, rustless teres from alabad from goa and uh, different spiny structures are visible which are otherwise not on not present on any part of the body of rustless only this tail portion has small length of tail portion tail spine area <laughs> i was telling that the body depression of the body in a simple fashion i was telling that uh, this on the left hand side you see the evolution and the parasites which have to evolve along with the hosts but in this case the sustains are ankylostoma uh, similarity to the kind of hosts divya is divya please mute mute, mute your mic are occurring and because of this the sudden involvement of sturdy oral armature characteristics are become very specific in worms of fish how bioinvasion could have succeeded i have tried to put into this count that these are the things which are negatively impacting the net natality survival and growth are important for the invasive species and when the invader has established itself then it has the potential to influence resources that is the positive and negative side of things when i describe these species and their interactions into the environment this entered into um, fresh water zones possibly through the migration of fishes or through the movement of ship that movement started in 2001 when jahazrani nigam or uh, the shipping corporation of india started movement of uh, large ships from alabad to alabad uh, that is saraswati ghat at alabad and uh, two hubli areas in west bengal so this movement of ship brought water the ballast water from uh, some of the, from the seashore area and then released it into river ganges here over the period of time when the water was released here their developmental stages were released in river ganges the fishes became infected and ultimately they proceeded up to fatehpur upstream that is the kind of movement we can decipher other than the this is the fish with that about which i am talking about in from which rostus teres has been reported begarius begarius and uh, uh, apart from that the birds that i talked about are uh, possibly bringing those developmental stages from uh, ocean areas to riverine waters and uh, this is a summary of those diagrams which i showed you uh, the pictures 
you can understand. This is the place where the ship arrives and leaves uh, oceanic water into river Ganges. I was worried about how life cycle of this worm from marine water is being continued. Is it possible that the developing stage is required, which has which should have 35 ppt marine water, and we do not have marine water here. What has happened to those developmental stages that has arrived at Alaba? Possibly this is one place uh, near Alaba, some some 80 kilometers away, uh, before Alaba, towards uh, the oceanic areas, towards Bay of Bengal, where these are certain river river zone is this. It meets river Ganges. And near this area, we have found marine water characteristic outlets. You can understand below this freshwater zone, we have marine water outlets. Now, possibly the developmental stages of rustless carries could get access to this marine water for its transformation from larva to adult. And this is what is possibly helping or maybe certain other outlets where they have um, contributing saltish water to the river and Ganges area, and we are not aware about it. We only blame pollution for occurrence of these kind of things, but we have to understand there are certain things which are necessary for the survival of marine organisms, and if their life cycle has to be completed, the water should have 35 PT for a PPT for a smaller period of time. I have a simile. Uh, when I talk about uh, development of um, giant freshwater prawn, this giant freshwater prawn has almost the same requirement that this is marine water where its larval stages transform, and then after that it passes on freshwater life merrily. So this could be one characteristic which is supporting the transformation of marine. Uh, nematodes into the freshwater zones. Otherwise, the man-made alterations would have been responsible, which we are normally able to discuss, that there are certain activities related to pollutants introduction through dam activities or even the uh, uh, digging of this riverine area, so which you call dredging. When we had to establish a uh, large ship movement, then uh, this dredging had to be uh, taken into effect from Ganges to Bay of Bengal. That actually took over um, those uh, species which were on the surface of water and from deep below the level of water, these kind of characteristics which were never known to aquatic life, they were added to riverine areas in river Ganges and possibly these man-made alterations supported these bioinvasive parasitic organisms, and that is how they are now survived. This is Doha where we have worked at Dona Paula, and from Dona Paula to Bay of Bengal, you can understand the movement through uh, Vizek, the Indian Ocean, and then into the Bay of Bengal. This is the fish movement, and we understand that the cat catfishes and uh, sharks are supporting this restless carries inside oceanic waters and their transmission to the freshwater stages. From Bay of Bengal, the migration activity of the fishes to Allahabad takes over. And we, we were also discussing this area where uh, these Adams Bridge was uh, is present. And we were talking about dismantling those things, but it did not happen. So the ship movement from across this area and uh, normally the animals do not do not uh, uh, obey these barrier disciplines so they cross over these areas to pass on the developing stages into the freshwater zones gulf of manar which we call park strait this area through which the ship also can move but it doesn't move at the present it takes a uh, encircling area around this ocean and uh, possibly if we break open then these species would give a direct entry, uh, get a direct entry into the Bay of Bengal. Upstream movement of fishes from Bay of Bengal, that is what I talked about, makes an effective bioinvasion possible. Transport host, which is carrying the pathogen from Bay of Bengal to 
those areas at uh, fresh water dredging about which i talked about that actually happened for around um, six seven years from 2001 the ship started moving from hubli to bay of bengal hubli to Allahabad, that is saraswati ghat which i showed this was another fish that we caught that means there are invasive fishes also which we are getting not only that the resident fishes are migrating this fish we got from uh, the conjunction that I showed uh, for uh, Son River into the river Ganges. So this marine fish and the whole family we observed and we found this camp pass surviving in river tones and then uh, our belief was certain that there are certain marine organisms that are surviving in the freshwater zones and why are they occurring in the tones area? Possibly because some outlets uh, below the freshwater streams are giving us saltish water and they are possibly supporting the marine um, organism requirement to survive in freshwater areas. So this is Aries calcareus is the catfish that I told you and Rinkodon typus in which Iringus caries and Rustus caries have been studied. Silagos Shama and these are the other, uh, other fishes in which we studied other parasites belonging to any second species. Silagosyama did not have uh, rustless hairs, but any secondary infection it declined, declined in April, May in the normal areas when um, COVID conditions were not prevailing, uh, salinity effect in summer period was observed. So that is a summary of what I got in rustless hairs, sharks and catfishes in Arabian Sea, Mistus and Clarius in Ganga in uh, 2001, since 2001. Now we have encountered during pandemic situation. Now we have encountered this parasite in Clarius in River Gomti. I'll show you where Gomti has, what Gomti has to do with River Ganges. They join at Sapkul. River Gomti joins River Ganga at Sapkul, but we never found this rustless terrace other than uh, streams related to flowing through Allahabad, Ganga and Yamuna up to Fatehpur on way to Kanpur. But now only a few months ago, we found these uh, rustless terrace occurring in fishes of river Gomti, Clarius. So this is what is surprising that pandemic environment gave clean water conditions. DO was 12 and this uh, dissolved oxygen level told that the water was very good, but the parasite merrily survived and passed it on further to river Gomti. So transferring into the streams would mean any fish catchers or persons that uh, culture fishes, they would take those material from river Gomti or river Ganges and then pass it on to their ponds in village areas. So that will be a cultural revolution and man-made alterations and bio-invasion would be the two three key factors that would be affecting those. So the bio-invasion, in fact, it causes genetic erosion that you have seen they are bringing prominent evolutionary changes and decrease in biodiversity. When the organisms that can survive in polluted conditions do arrive in freshwater conditions, then it will create havoc in evolutionary process. Any sacidosis is the disease of human beings. This is the ship that carried from uh, West Bengal to uh, Saraswati Ghat at Prayagraj. And that is what I told you that the ballast water of this ship might have transferred their developmental stages. We have the knowledge that hydrographic conditions are changed because of blockade of riverine water at Tehri Dam. And that is how the density of water is much low. Uh, this stream flow is declined. Siltation pattern is changed. And because of this conditions of eutrophication occur, which has been the talk of the day these days at Allahabad that the stream has become green only because of eutrophication, oxygen going down, and uh, dredging has given a way to the invertebrate variety that is an intermediate host to nematodes coming up from the bottom. And the ones that were appearing on up, upward stream, they have disappeared now. So how do helminth infections relate to COVID? Is there any connection of Helminths with COVID conditions. The odds of having NCDs were lowered by a respectable 
you can understand that the severity of COVID was lowered when helminth infections were analyzed. And this is the recent study. These COVID low infection fatality is related, I mean, it is presumed to have been correlated with low and medium income group countries. And uh, this is the uh, recent research idea that those groups must be surveyed about the immunomodulatory responses of parasitic species inside the human body that contribute to hyperinflammation and thus the COVID-19 is declining. So in those particular communities which have parasitic infection by helminths, COVID-19 has declined. That is the observation. These are the entamoeba, giardia, uh, toxoplasma, cryptosporidia that survive merrily in human intestine. These are the other worms which you know already, mosquito packed worms and the, the vectors, I mean, and those kind of things that can carry a developmental stage from a mollusk to fish and fish is being eaten by human beings. So this is the cycle is being com getting completed. Food bone trematodes and cystodes tapeworms and bottom is the nematodes about which I talked. When the fishes are carrying them, there is a likelihood that fish passes it to the human beings and look at the graph. When COVID was asymptomatic, the condition of helminth was high. Mid, mild and moderate, it carried on a little downward trend. And then severe COVID condition was very, uh, uh, was only possible when helminthic infections were low. That is an interesting finding that, that needs further research. And on this WHO has also focused that these kind of analysis should be done, that very critical COVID is present when no helminth infection is present. Possibly uh, in European countries, we had uh, very high COVID severity and uh, in pockets in our own country, we saw this, but not as a whole, it was very low uh, COVID prevalence in India, but the severity was uh, much high in European areas. Parasites that cause chronic infections are known to enhance T helper cell responses and induce predominant regulatory Treg responses. That is the chemistry inside the body. Generalized immunomodulation may occur in response to host gut microbiome changes due to chronic parasitic infestations. The speaker before me has described microbiomes and its activity in detail. So these are the parasites within the gut that have disturbed the microbiome in chronic parasitic infestations to a huge extent. Both factors may alter the outcome of SARS-CoV-2 infection in patients. Thank you. At the end, I am thankful to the audience for the patient hearing. Dr. Rajesh, I am much obliged that yes, I got an opportunity to this program. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I request uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sivas Subramaniam. Sir, are you there? Yes, sir. Do you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I request uh, Professor Sivas Subramaniam to give formal word of thanks to Professor Sandeep. One second. Okay. Uh, I think it's a very interesting topic. I mean, a lot of information. And Professor Sandeep uh, Kamal Hotra has given us a lot of information on the parasites of uh, fish and other aquatic animals and how they move from one place to another and uh, is it beneficial or not. But uh, one thing I found was when you have uh, the uh, infection with parasites, the COVID is not entering. That is really interesting. I think it requires a lot of study. And uh, I think the previous speaker also talked about uh, various uh, biomes and the bacteria which are beneficial. I think uh, these both the um, lectures, I think it gives importance for the local uh, biome that we have uh, in the in the in our body and uh, how it helps uh, preventing uh, the parasite, other uh, pathogenic organs to enter. Although the uh, uh, speaker also spoke about uh, the economy, the ecological uh, changes that is happening and then mixing of various species from freshwater to marine and marine to freshwater and how we talk i mean alters the ecosystem uh, all these things are there but i'm more interested in this covid 19 
and how it is not entering into places where these uh, pathogens or parasitic um, i mean uh, parasites or pathogens are um, in in high number thank you very much uh, dr malhotra the next speaker will be uh, dr ch victoria devi assistant professor extension education department of social sciences college of horticulture and forestry central agricultural university pasigat and she will be speaking on covid 19 resilience with community based agriculture okay let me give a brief introduction dr uh, chabungbam victoria devi is working as an assistant professor in the department of social sciences college of horticulture and forestry pasigat she has completed her phd degree in agricultural extension from vidhan chandra krishi vishwavidyalaya nadia district west bengal she is rendering her full time service in teaching undergraduate and post graduate programs as well as research and extension services she is involved in various capacity building programs for the upliftment of students youth resources of the university she has various publications including book chapters and research papers and she has also achieved uh, various national and international awards and she has got an a handful of projects in her hand right now she is a very young and dynamic researcher please welcome uh, dr victoria devi uh, i will, i know that i'll be talking to a very beautiful groups of like panel people from across the country who are dedicated in uh, conserving our environment agriculture and animal health uh so uh today i would like to speak on uh, covid-19 resilience and what can be done in our community level uh from uh, during this covid-19 pandemic and beyond uh next slide please so nowadays the buzz word is community everywhere we go we hear about uh to make our to boost our immunity Uh, next slide. Ma'am, have you logged into two accounts? Pardon? Have you logged into two accounts? No, I can't get you, sir. Have you logged in two accounts, like you know, two different accounts? Because it's it's getting echo. Oh, is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, I, I I shall continue. So there is we all know that there is no superfood to boost our immunity. It is the long term impact of our well balanced diet. Next slide. So when we are very safe, when we are in the lap of the mother nature, this is fresh and green. And now it is the time for we human to think. whether what what do we have to decide our lust or our life we stay very close to nature and we don't have so much tendency to face the risk and the nature still gives us lots of food and god has given so much in our northeastern india that if we don't become if we don't take care of our crops and if we don't become self reliant this is the time to think what we should decide next slide next slide so like augmented living conditions as a result of our need get transformed into great leading to new threats like the corona virus that we all know next slide see due to the cemented world okay and then we are busy building our cemented world and nowadays we are crying for oxygen so next slide so you please see uh, this one just one minute So, which market do you prefer? On the left hand side, uh, I am showing the our local market in northeastern India and other parts of India. And on the right hand side is what we get food in big malls. 
this uh, food mainly consists of uh, foods what we call the genetically modified food. When uh, it is due to the development of agriculture and many other resources, which are coming, which are developing nowadays. But then, though we are, but when the genetical system of a food is being modified, there is some changes we are bringing to the nature, and then there is some kind of uh, changes in the food chain system, and and we all don't know what might be the result. This uh, such changes. We all know that such changes is the result of many diseases which are coming up, like the maybe like this COVID-19 pandemic or other very serious diseases like the cancers and all that. And we are very fortunate that in the northeastern India we still get our farmers' food. So why not we adopt our farmer that we can adopt one farmer and we can get the uh, fresh vegetables from the farmer, which we all know that that is a very immune boosting. Uh, one, so let's uh, let uh, we can uh, start off the uh, branded food for the local uh, food we find in Northeast India. It is in very high demand uh, across the country. Next, uh, next slide. See our farmers, our farmers just sit on the road to sell the best immunity local food. So why don't we think about creating the farmer supermarket? Just what uh, just now what I was thinking instead of handling to the big corporate. See, we can adopt a farmer for our food and support them. So it is in the hands of us that the consumers to develop the independent farmers. Next slide. So, out of uh, during this pandemic, when the situation is becoming serious, so what can be done at our home level, like uh, not for those uh, who are doing many research in agriculture, but at the local people, the lay people, the laymen, what we can do in order to uh, come out from this uh, uh, pandemic is that we can start uh, from the uh, level, like we can create an immunity garden uh, with a weapon against the pandemic and the uh, for and for kind of preserving our mental health. Next slide. So we all know that these are some of the uh, immunity boosting herbs. We all know that if we take uh, uh, this green tea, ginger, turmeric, and a citrus food, these are all immunity immuno uh, immunity boosting herbs. Next slide. So during the COVID pandemic. Uh, I also had created a very small anti-COVID anti community garden in my quarter. So uh, I have this, what we call this Nomangkha in Manipuri. Uh, this is the Phlegocanthus trichiformis. Uh, it has got uh, a very anti-fungal, anti antibacterial properties, which are becoming very popular for uh, using as in the steam form. And then we, I have got the Indian tulsi, the turmeric, the ginger, and this, uh, what we call in Manipuri, the peruk, that this is the Indian uh, penny word. And I have got this rosal. Rosal has uh, becoming very popular nowadays. It has got a very uh, immunoboosting uh, characteristics. It has got lots of uh, vitamins and minerals. And when we have this rosal, we, we have we get a stress boosting, boosting effect. And I have got this uh, turmeric and the king chili. And what I suggest is that uh, you can all also start an anti-COVID garden, a small garden, anti-COVID immunity garden in your house, be it in your balcony or in your small garden, and you can grow all the types of herbs instead of totally depending on medicine. Okay, so in the morning, when I work barefoot for at least 10 minutes in this garden, I connect to the mother earth, and then I can put in the fresh oxygen. So what can be a better uh, exercise to take for our health uh, than this during this pandemic? So uh, please skip to the next slide. So uh, there will come a time, there will come a time when only those uh, who knows how to cultivate, how to plant will be eating. So uh, last year during the lockdown, we we find very difficult to get our daily bread also. So at a small level, we are in, uh, instead of uh, uh, applying 
very high doses of uh, uh, this one or uh, inorganic fertilizers and pesticides or whatever you can get uh, fresh organic vegetables at home next slide so farming is an art with full of time farming is an art with full of compassion farming gives us food and livelihood we all know that nobody out here and nobody across the country lives without food but very few youngsters dreams to become a farmer. So I would like to highlight some the youth status in India. India with a population of 1 to uh, 1.22 billion, of which 604 million are under the age of 24. Uh, so the rising population is likely to increase and it is going to cross the is going to face the overall food consumption problems in India. And then 35% population of the Indian population are youth. So India has the largest youth population in the country, in the world, and it will continue for the coming 20 years also. So the primary sectors like skill development for youth in order to boost the agriculture and the life sector is becoming very important. Next slide. Next slide, please. So, and we all know that youth is a special time, a very special time in the uh, in our lifetime. So, and then unemployment is a very serious disease for the rural youth of India, which is causing uh, migration, crime, wastage of human resource, and insurgency. And India has the largest youth population, I just told, and it will continue so for the coming 20 years. So, what can we do in order to save? this special resourceful life of our youth uh, we can do you please uh, sit to the next slide this is one program that is, is aria program after our honorable prime minister narendra modi he started this program after three years of his government it is attracting and retaining rural youth and agriculture how can we attract the roots in the youth in rural areas so that they don't migrate to other countries and their uh, next slide please also we know that please shift to the next slide okay so i was talking about aria uh, it is uh, it started by our honorable prime minister narendra modi Zee, after three years of his government so the uh, the entire principles of this program is how we will address youth and retain them in agriculture so that they don't migrate to other countries and then our and then we save their land and we save agriculture so uh, we uh, across the countries there are many christy vegan centers so in and in, in so one christy vegan kendra they used to select around 200 and 300 youth and then they are giving training in value additions and what can be done in order to become an entrepreneur so that they don't keep on waiting for a white collar job so that they can stand on their own feet and become self-reliant next next slide So this is one area program which I'm involved in my university. Here we are training the youth how to grow crops and how can they sell in the market, how will they bring their crops in the market, different uh, seasons crop, we are training them. Uh, we thought, we told them, uh, we guided them like it is free of uh, fertilizers applications and pesticide application and it is fully organic and we brand their, uh, we brand their product as organic organically produced and it is of high demand in the market and out of this program so many youth in the rural areas of our natural practice they are becoming self-reliant we are in touch with them whenever they have a problem we are there for them so uh, we could save them migrating and leaving their village and going to the uh, big city next slide next slide please Another program is the uh, Student Ready Program. Uh, this is the Rural Empowerment Awareness Development Yojana. It is initiated by the Indian Council of Agriculture Research in the year 2015. So this program also aims for rural entrepreneurship awareness for the youth. 
and their practical experience in real life situation in rural agriculture. We guide them that just by hearing the word agriculture, how can they do practically and how can they grow their native crops and how can they grow, uh, can they conserve their uh, traditional and indigenous types of vegetables and other food items available in their uh, own local areas. See, whenever we are born in a place, whenever we are born in a place, God has gifted us something which is uh, suitable with that particular area. So instead of totally eradicating and uh, uh, this one, totally eradicating and growing uh, high yielding variety crops and then the uh, other uh, hybrid crops from outside, we are guiding them how can uh, they conserve and grow their traditional crops which are already suitable to the areas and then nowadays immuno uh, immunobusting and then people they care take care of their health very much so high high uh, there is high demand of locally produced organically crops across the country not only in northeastern india so we try to save the indigenous vegetables and the crops of northeastern india uh, but right now where i'm working here uh, in uh, in such kind of program next slide please So uh, this is our during the stud uh, student ready program. We involve our students also, and this is and uh, we are doing so that we empower the youth on ecologically suitable farming, and and then we lead them towards entrepreneurship. Next slide. So uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, during the pandemic, our students, uh, they could not do the student ready program. So uh, we guided them how they can, uh, uh, how they can start an immuno an organic uh, kitchen garden at their home level and they can uh, spread how to grow such kind of crops in the little area available in their village. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so uh, these are the crops, uh, students. So it was one day. Uh, it's the uh, it's showing the result after 21 days. So you see, like uh, we can get our harvest within a very short duration. So we can all try during this. In, uh, instead of uh, going out and getting infected, we can get our harvest within a very short duration. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the result of the rooftop organic immuno immunity garden set up by my students. This is the result just after 21 days. And how to grow, you can see the, the red color one, this is an, an amaranthus. It is a very good crop, like it's antifungal and then antibacterial. So uh, she has spread the, the, uh, the, this one. Uh, the wants of the village people to adopt such type of culture in their village. Next slide. So NAHEP is a uh, national agriculture higher education project. This is under another project where we uh, guide the students uh, in what uh, in what area they want to start their own uh, the project or they want to start their own uh, startup. And we train them, and these are some of the trainings we have given to the uh, to this one, the youth in the rural areas, where we guide them how to prepare orange juice, orange artists, because uh, our natural here, the place where we are seeing, it is very famous for the good quality orange variety, and then at the end we can we get a lot of harvest in the forest, the tapukia. So in of wasting the product unnecessarily in the market, we train them how to do value addition in the uh, chips and then in the oranges, and we sell them in other parts of the uh, northeastern India. This is done by the uh, rural youth in our natural project. Next slide. Another program is the RKB by Raptar Innovation and Agri Entrepreneurship Scheme. It is started by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare for funding and uh, for boosting the youth who want to be an agri product. There are uh, around 29 agri business incubators across the countries. And I'm giving this information like those who are the participants here, those are who are the young youths. 
uh, you can contact me like if you are interested to join in such kind of program here you will be trained in one month and after one month uh, we will be asking uh, we in which area you want to go and establish yourself as an entrepreneur and then in that time we will be giving different types of training like in mushroom uh, how to grow mushroom and how to make many organic fertilizers and after that we will be guiding you how to take the loans and all that and from there we will be showing the right part where you can grow and already there are already uh, uh, successful uh, entrepreneurs who have uh, started from the Zero Rebel by joining the sign-up programs in our universe. Next slide. So this is the Raptor program where we train the youth in making the orthodox tea and many types of green tea and many types of tea uh, in our campus. Next slide. So what I would like to tell is that uh, when we see some, when we hear stories when we were small, then we used to say that, oh, what a charming dream. So I would like to tell that becoming an entrepreneur is a very charming personality because you know why? You are your own boss and you are independent and you no longer work under somebody. You create jobs for others and you can use your creativity and you have you and you get unlimited rewards. And you can prove to the world that yes, you are the achiever because you can you can seek nothing less than excellence. So um, I'm not uh, discouraging people to go for higher studies, but you can go for higher studies. But nowadays, you know, like uh, there is so much of problem for unemployment mainly in the rural area. So that uh, we are doing such programs to, uh, so that uh, the very uh, active resources of the uh, youth of northeastern India does not go away. Next, next slide. So I would like to mention some uh, entrepreneurs who are very successful and who started from the zero level and who are worth following. Okay, this is a very famous farmer, Samir Bordoloi. He is an uh, he is an achiever of the Ashoka Fellow and the general secretary of Spread Northeast. Let's see some of his activities. Next slide. So, uh, according to him, uh, nature has the power to convert nothing to something. He can. He said that I can only assist nature and not alter nature. Please uh, uh, switch uh, to the next slide. And he mimics nature in his ways of raising plants. And back to the roots, he grow local food with the forest and create local food forest with his way of compassionate farming. So, uh, so he grows local food and then he creates local uh, forest and then uh, he mimics the nature and grows his food. And then he created food forest with the motto of compassionate farming. According to him, the nature has the power to make something from nothing and we can only assist nature. So he, uh, he is growing healthy healing food by conserving the local food wisdom. So he says, this is his religion as a farmer. You know what local food wisdom means? Like we, we, if you happen to talk to your uh, grandparents and your forefathers and anybody adjust from your family, they will be talking about what they used to grow, what they used to do. So we should conserve that because those what they have been practicing are the gifts of God for which is suitable for our particular reason. See, if, you, if I try and grow apples, in Manipur. It won't be successful because it is gifted to the northern region, the Himalayan region of North India. So we should add, uh, we are also gifted with many types of uh, vegetables which are suitable to our uh, our area, like our our food yam, the, our king chili. These are of high demand across the country. So why not we work on tea? If, you, if I go to uh, Manipur. These people, they will be calling this uh, green king chili as umura. And if I go to Nagaland, the Nagaland people, people they say that no, no, that is not umura. This is the Naga chili. And again, if I come to Nag Assam, they call it no, no, Naga chili, not umura, but this is the our Bujolokya. So, but nobody in northeastern India, they have uh, adopted this umorok and created a um, product out of the umorok and then the, so our uh, stories, our beautiful stories of our, uh, our reason, what God has gifted in our area and then uh, in nobody has 
back a product and sold to sold adopt that product and then sold in other part of the country because in the market what uh, it is attracted is the story so how we can produce umarok in our northeastern region and out of that how we can uh, how how we have not discovered the scope so uh, i would i would like to uh, say that we should build uh, more value addition on the product which are already suitable in our area so the farmer Sami's story is the story of co-evolution and co-existence according to him whatever is available in the forest he can just then and he mimics nature and growth instead of applying fertilizers and uh, uh, and the other pesticides uh, he don't apply those and because like they go very happily and very abundantly in the in and then uh, they and the natural textures of the art food next slide so this is the story of how we can make seed bomb uh, this one we, we, uh, we can put the seed of many plants and we can put uh, we can make a bowl out of the manure and when you go to the, the picnic uh, family picnic or wherever in countries outskirts uh, we can make these seed bombs and we can throw here and there and we can conserve nature so even i practice this with my two-year-old son we make uh, seed bombs and whenever we go for uh, some uh, picnics or some uh, journey we used to throw the seed bombs and we are happy that we later we found that the seeds uh, they germinated and they are growing happily. Next slide. So this is the result of seed bombing in farmer Samir's uh, for food forest. They just threw the uh, seeds widely and then the plants are growing uh, like the like this uh, crops are coming up. Next slide. So he trains green commandos who are the social agripreneurs to lead. So uh, he trains these youth who are interested to become a social agripreneur and he tried to spread this his idea of farming, his idea of compassionate farming, where all the food crops grow together and we, they brand their product as the locally produced product and they are selling. Next slide. So uh, this is the picture where the school students are involved. Uh, the upper one is the schools in Arunachal Pradesh. The yeah, last one is in Tamenglong district of Manipur. So he showed the seeds for conserving, conserving local ethnic food in the young minds. And he trained that the students, uh, the young minds, how to sow the seeds of social agripreneurship. Next slide. So the products from his forest, there are several products, seed, compost, vermicompost, biochar, how to make all this. If you are interested, you can further contact me how you can make a compost and vermicompost and a bamboo biochar at home level. And then this is the farmer connect. This is this mall in one located in Guwahati where he sells all the products which are produced in the uh, food forest. These are all organic products which are of high demand across the country. Next slide. So this is the Rosal. I have told, already told why Rosal is very becoming very popular, and it has got many antioxidants. It can detoxify our body. And the next one is the uh, this one, Wonder Grass Tree. It is a mixture of some uh, bamboo bamboo leaves and then uh, some other lemon grasses and then they prepare the grass like this and they are selling uh, they are selling to uh, the spanish company they are in high demand next slide so this is how to make a uh, bamboo leaf hot beverage it is a very highly effective uh, it can fight virus by immunity development it has got high silica content which is good for your skin and your hair and it, it gives a soothing and a, re, a soothing relief when you consume it and we all know this turmeric hot beverage which is uh, it contains a very high percentage of curcumin i uh, next slide so what i would like to say here is that keeping our own seed is our freedom you whenever you harvest anything in your 
uh, at your home, then uh, you please keep the city spirit with you. That is our identity, our identity to be born in this beautiful part of the country. So you can collect the seed and then we will buy it for you. If you don't so also, we will buy it for you. You can contact me for that. Mm. So this way of farming is the compassionate farming that I told. And those youths who are very much energetic after this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, you can follow him in Facebook and then you can join as a green commando under his spread notice which is located in Sonapur, 45 kilometers from Guwahati. So you can become a green commando and you can learn how to uh, how to grow food in the forest. So another entrepreneur which, is, which I will not fail to mention is Elizabeth Yambel. Everybody we know, knows her. She is the founder of Duality and becoming very popular. And then instead of uh, she has uh, graduated from University of Warwick and worked as financial analyst in the in in banks like in London and Singapore. But after that, uh, she left her job and she came back to Manipur in her roots. You see, the youth here, I would like to boost an energy that instead of leaving your own village, she is coming back to the root where she belongs. This is the perfect example of right migration. You learn from outside and you are coming back to develop your village. It is a migration from urban to rural area, which we are adding, which we want to sow the seed in the hearts of our youth. Next slide. On a mission to preserve and utilize local herbs and the plants that have immense medicinal values alongside improving, she is producing so many uh, 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 teas in the form of uh, out of the product from the local herbs and the vegetables. They have got rosal tea, garcina, and many others like the nomakha tea, which has got an empty uh, viral property that is of high demand during this COVID pandemic. So you can also make it at your home level. Next slide. Another women entrepreneur, women entrepreneur of the year 2019, these uh, two ladies here, Asim Sundari, Dr. Asim Sundari, and uh, Yum, uh, uh, Gitasuri Yumnam, they are the founder of the Green Biotech and they have come up, they have also learned many things and they have come up to produce many uh, organic fertilizers and on the right hand side you can see there is a bucket there where you can put your uh, waste from your kitchen and it can be converted into a bio well the black diamond okay with other which we call the black diamond which is which you can use as a manure at your home next slide So I've been talking about becoming an entrepreneur and what you would like to do. Many youth here often end up that uh, they want to become an entrepreneur. They want to start up. They will, they want to start up their own business. But where will they get the right thing? So I will guide you. Those who are the youth here, you can go for any AC and ABC training at Manes Hyderabad. Here you can, you will be trained. In this area, you want to start as an entrepreneur. You will be guided how and where you can take the loan. It is a three months and a six months program, and you can go and join them. Next slide. So, in uh, at Manis, Hyderabad, in SC and uh, ABC training, you will get trainings related to floriculture. If you want to further, uh, if you want to start on flower business and the cut flowers and nowadays flowers becoming very popular in every wedding and every functions you go it will be decorated with place flowers so if it is a, it has got a very high scope if you can start if you have your own land you can start on floriculture and other horticulture clinics value addition veterinary clinics vermicomposting and all this so for interested i can email you the details next slide so this green biotech in manipur with an MOU with a MNS, they are also training this. Uh, they have also started this 60 days training for entrepreneurship and startup in, in Manipur. Those who are from Manipur, you can join them. Next slide. So I have been telling you that wherever we are born, God has given us food. So let's mimic nature instead of 
uh, instead out of our loss, instead of destroying the nature, let's mimic nature and grow our local fruits. And you see, you'll be surprised too. You'll get so much of return. And let us understand what God gave us, which is suitable with our reason. That is our local ethnic food. Let's accept changes, but not drastic changes against the local food system. Let's not destroy the beautiful gift of nature, what our grandparents have been doing, what our aged people have been doing. Let's follow them. Let's not eradicate the uh, local, uh, local and traditional farmers. So healthy healing food crops are the immunity building crops. Next slide. Let us conserve our ITK. When I say ITK, I mean the indigenous technical knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge. TEK means the traditional ecological knowledge. When we talk about the aged people, they have their own way of farming. They have their own way of you know, controlling insect, uh, insects without using insecticides. So you listen to your uh, aged people at home and try to uh, follow it. Uh, you see, you can see here the picture of traditional fishing in Dr. Flex. And again, you can see there are three fishermen were, elect, were arrested for electrocutting fish in Lokta Clay, which destroys the entire biodiversity of Lokta Clay. So how to do fishing? Let's, let's not think that we are superior than other, other uh, living beings on this earth. Let's think ourselves as homo sapiens and let's conserve how the other bio and other uh, even if the non, even the non-living things also how they exist and the living things, the flora and the fauna, we all should live compassionately. And another one, a very beautiful picture here in Arunachal, is the petty compass farming of the Apatani tribe of Arunachal Pradesh. Here in the rice field, they, they rear the fish also. So this is the one very good example of compassionate farming with the traditional or ancestral farmers of Arunachal Pradesh have been practicing. Here the fish, in, uh, they eat the, up the insects as their food, and when they go beneath the soil, the soil moisture is made available to the crops. So the rice crop and the fish, they are related. They are growing compassionately. This is a one very good example of symbiosis. So let us uh, let us be like this fish and let us be like this uh, uh, crops growing together. Next slide. So during this COVID pandemic, I'd like to come back to this pandemic situation here. The online classes of our children out there, so as a parent, uh, we should take care of them. It is giving so much of pressure to the organ system of our children. The static lifestyles make them nature deficit syndrome. Our kids are suffering from nature deficit syndrome. So what can we do in order to create their to, uh, to save their immunity, we can involve them in immunity gardens in any space available with other roof, with maybe your rooftop or your balcony. Let's make them grow deep color crops and then vegetables and the herbs. So I would like to ask here, like these are my favorite local fruits. So how many of you have planted your favorite local food? I'm sure you must be eating them. But then in order to further grow your local food so that it doesn't become extinct, you please sow the seed after you eat. It is very much rich in vitamins, iron, protein, and it ensures a healthy pregnancy. It serves, it gives us a good immunity for weight loss also. And then instead of using eating vitamin tablet every day instead of giving vitamin tablet to your kids you can give this fruit these are they are very rich in vitamins next slide and these are microgreens i have also tried this in my kitchen so according to the usda 2014 the mature uh, the uh, the microgreens this is just we sow the seeds in a compost in a kitchen and we have it after the when two to three leaves comes out we have it uh, in seven days or eight or seven days and it, has, it contains lots of vitamins minerals and carotenoids then they are mature counterparts it contains lots of antioxidants and, and it is antibacterial and anti-inflammatory small portion of it in your daily diet will add to your immunity and then uh, you can uh, some of the preparation next slide uh, some of the preparation of this is how to grow microgreens. So you buy the seed, you just sow in your in a, uh, in a soil and put some compost on it, and you grow in your garden. And after five to seven days, it is ready for your harvest. 
and then you enjoy with your family. Next slide. So these are some of the preparation I may, we may we can have uh, this out of this microgreens. It looks very attractive. Also, and then you can garnish it in your salad. And I'm sure if you keep on having once or twice in your week, it will boost up your immunity. Next slide. So this is, you all know this plant, this is the, the Aparajita or the Asian peas and wings. This is a powerhouse of antioxidants, my dear fellow participants. Uh, this is how I used to take my evening cup of tea. The blue color is after directly boiling the bright uh, these flowers and the purple color is after I get a, a little bit of lemon. And you have it, it is a very, you will get a very uh, stress boosting effect. And then it is anti-aging also, those who are aged people. It is anti-aging and it can produce collagen in your body. So please try it. It is a very uh, good uh, and antifungal also, and it can boost up your immune. Next slide. So instead of wasting our uh, harvest, our local fruits, this is a harvest from my university campus, this Amla. Uh, you can, this is how I've met for my two year old son. That I dried amla candy is mixed with gourd or a jaggery, and he likes it instead of giving vitamin tablets. I used to give him this. And this is, don't just throw the seeds of the pumpkin after you, before you, uh, you cook. Uh, you separate it and you roast it in a desi tea. And you can uh, give, uh, give some flavors of your choice. And uh, this one, pumpkin seeds are very much rich in magnesium and selenium and uh, gives your kids and your aged parents at home and it will boost their energy and uh, give them antioxidants. Next slide. So during the COVID pandemic, everybody is talking about how to, uh, in spite of our schedule, we are having the, our schedule work also, uh, even if we do work from home. So everybody is talking about how we increase mental health. This is how we can increase our mental health. We can talk to our friends. You, can, you should have a good sleep and how to eat well. That I have given some of my little experiences. You can share your feelings with your loved ones, be creative, relax, do your duties, listen to your favorite music, uh, go on uh, the start of an immunity garden, involve your kids, walk barefoot in your garden, connect to the mother nature, inhale the fresh oxygen, exercise, and you can do meditation. We can give love and to our dear ones during this hard time in this manner. And I hope that my little talks will contribute a bit to increasing your mental health. Next slide. So it is not the end, it's the beginning, let's say. My late grandmother, yeah, I just want to experience, uh, I want to share one story of my late grandmother. I was very close to her. Uh, she used to tell me that the one who makes good friendship with the Mother Earth is the most wise man. Her wisdom lives on in my heart till now, and it will continue so. She told that from a simple rainwater harvesting to dumping biodegradable waste to, to making nature, nature rewards us back in a way we can't imagine. So we should respect nature. We should plant more trees. So. Uh, when the nature gets angry, we all know the results, and we are in this situation now in this COVID-19 pandemic. When the nature gets angry, we are in this type of situation. However, there is light at the end of every tunnel, and we will be there soon by taking the right path. Thank you all for your time and your valuable attention. And I thank the organizing committee with all my heart out of all the difficulties I created, you made me present some of my little ideas, which I hope that I will contribute and it will boost the energy of the dear participants and the other panelists here. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. It's really informative and a really good uh, presentation indeed. Uh, those who want to have some uh, introduction, they can uh, chat with me. 
All right. Uh, if there are no questions, I request uh, Dr. Siva Subramanian, Director, FICO Spectrum Environmental Research Center, uh, Chennai, and uh, one of the co organizers of this uh, international conference to give what up thanks to uh, Dr. Victoria. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. It's very interesting uh, morning today with uh, excellent uh, speakers on various aspects of uh, their experience and uh, connected to COVID stress management. Um, I think it should be very useful for the audience. And although a lot of questions will be coming, probably they'll be typing these questions. And uh, I was really enjoying the whole uh, program this morning. And it is very interesting and uh, a lot of information we heard and especially the last talk a lot of uh, nutritious uh, stuff you can make out of your own garden to to handle a covid situation it's very interesting thank you very much all right uh <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Like, welcome to the after session. We have our next speaker, Dr. J. Rajendran. Uh, he's assistant professor in the Department of uh, Genetics, School of Biological Sciences, Madre Kamaraj University. Uh, so, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, J. Rajendran. Yes. Dr. J. Rajendran has more than 15 years of teaching experience and uh, uh, so, like, research experience in microbial genomics. This uh, group has sequenced more than 200 bacterial genomes of industrial, uh, industrial and clinical importance and annotated. He has sequenced the whole genomes of several plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and identified genes responsible for the plant growth promotion. Also, he has sequenced the whole genomes of more than 30 Brucella species and more than 100 Staphylococcus species. He has also created a dedicated genome repository of Brucella, namely Brucella base. He identified several genes going for industry enzymes and antibodies from various metagenome sources. He profiled the circulating microbiome in cardiovascular diseases. To his credit, Dr. Ryan has published more than 90 research papers in leading international journals. He is a recipient of uh, American Society of Microbiology, Indo-US Research Professorship from American Society for Microbiology. ASM, Jensen is our from Association of Microbiology of India, UGC Raman Postdoctoral Fellowship to work in USA, a School of Biology Sciences, Madre Kamaraj University Genomics Award from Biotech Research Society, India, and Dr. Wilson Aruni, Best Research Mentor and Teacher Award, Indian Institute of Applied Microbiologists, uh, that is IAAM. So, so that I would like to uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. J. Rajendran, uh, to deliver his uh, presentation. Welcome, sir. Introduction and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. So today I would like to discuss about uh, uh, zoonotic disease and the genomic uh, understanding of the pathogen which causes uh, zoonotic disease called brucellosis. Yeah, so it's a, a true zoonotic disease caused by organism of the genus Brucella. Means uh, true zoonotic disease uh, means so it is uh, mostly transmitted from animals to uh, human, very rarely from human to human. So most often it is transmitted from animals to human beings. So it is also called as uh, ambulant fever, Mediterranean fever, Malta fever based on uh, the symptom or originally the organism was isolated. So it affects all people of the age group on both sexes. So on the right side, I have shown uh, the classification of uh, classification of uh, Brucella. And then it, it's a uh, gram-negative, faculty intracellular, carbobasilite, non-motile and non-spore forming. These are the uh, major uh, characteristics of Brucella. Yeah. 
So, so far, uh, 12 species of uh, brucella has been identified. And uh, all, all the species, all the brucella species are affecting or are, are isolated from mammals only. So, uh, right from uh, pigs, dog, uh, cow, I mean cattle, and or even marine mammals or uh, rich fossil baboons, all those things. So, though there are 12 species, only four species are uh, considered zoonotic. Zoonotic, I mean, causing brucellosis to humans uh, in the order. Brucella militantis, Brucella abortus, Brucella suis, and Brucella canis. And very interesting information with respect to animal brucellosis is uh, each species uh, preferentially infect only one host animal, one type of host animal. Say, for example, brucella abortus preferentially infects cattle, though they can infect other animals like sheep uh, or uh, dog, but preferentially it infects uh, cattle only. So that's why it is uh, having a host preference or host specific uh, infectious model which is the aperture following. Similarly, military does affect books and sheep, but not uh, that of course it can affect, but uh, if you see the statistics, you'll meet maybe less than five percent of the ninety five percent of the infection uh, caused in uh, goats and sheep will be by militancy, only rarely, rarely by abortus or other species. Similarly, suis is infected by, I mean, brucella suis infects uh, pigs and canis infects uh, dogs. So, how humans are getting uh, infected is by taking uh, milk, especially unpasteurized milk, and then uh, slaughter, that is, uh, taking uh, undercooked meat. And then, uh, those who are uh, closely associated with the animals. So veterinary care person or uh, the farm workers, those who are rearing cattle or uh, goat and sheep or having pet animal uh, of dog. And in addition, people like uh, uh, those who are working uh, with uh, uh, pathogens in the laboratory and, uh, and also the handling of vaccines. So animal vaccines are pathogenic to humans. So they, they are uh, non-pathogenic to, say, for example, brucella abortus. Attenuated vaccines are available. So if it is uh, accidentally infected uh, you, then you may get the disease. And then with respect to distribution, so several countries, that is, uh, advanced countries or economically developed countries, have controlled the disease. So Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, UK, and USA, they have declared their country as Brussels a free country. So whereas the other countries like Mediterranean uh, countries, Northern and uh, Eastern Africa, India, Central Asia, Mexico, and then Central and South American countries, they are still we are having uh, the burden of Brussels. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, uh, a older uh, statistic. But there is no much difference uh, in the last 15 years. So you can see, uh, so India, Pakistan, in this region are endemic for brucellosis. Even, I mean, this is for human brucellosis. But uh, most of them, we do not have data of data on uh, the epidemiology of human brucellosis. So that is a fact. So this is the transmission, conjunctiva or broken skin conducting infected blood or vaginal discharges or aborted placentas, everything. I mean, those who are handling animals. And then raw milk and unfortunate dairy products. And also rarely through undercooked meat. So incubation time varies from 5 to 21 days and uh, even it may take uh, 3 months. And diagnosis is uh, very difficult. Most often, since it's an intracellular pathogen, uh, it enters into the body 
So what happened is as soon as uh, people have some fever, they take uh, some antibiotic and uh, paracetamol kind of drug. So they will kill uh, the whatever the animals which are, uh, I mean, whatever the organisms are circulating extracellularly. But within the uh, phagocytic cell and non-phagocytic cell, right, and probably even both type of cells, they replicate and after some time, it will release and then you will get the symptom. And then culturing also, it's not uh, straightforward. Uh, like Staphylococcus or yes or other uh, almonella kind of pathogen, you can uh, grow within 24 hours, but your taste will take longer time and you may need a uh, blood culture system or automated system like this, pack that kind of things. But and then you have to observe at least for four weeks. Again, most often, if there are any other contaminating organisms, when you keep uh, longer time for uh, incubation, the contaminants may also grow faster. So that's why isolation of brucellosis is difficult. And also there is no uh, direct uh, procedure. In fact, in the uh, clinical system, that is in hospitals, no hospitals or no clinical laboratory are having or following any tests for brucellosis. Only veterinarians are giving importance as they consider as a, a veterinary disease. But it's a zoonotic disease. Medical doctors, they do not um, recognize uh, brucellosis as a disease. Most often, it is not uh, diagnosed, and then even people are dying, uh, and they put a spirexy of unknown origin. They do not know why people are dying, but people may die due to brucellosis also, but they report as uh, unknown origin, death due to unknown infection or something like that. Or simply there is some, some viral or something like that. So it's happened. So this is about epidemiology in uh, animal brucellosis. Uh, a recent paper published in 2019, it says approximate uh, prevalence rate is 9.43 in cattle, in buffalo it is uh, 5.4, together 8.4. So if you have 100 cattle, at least 8 cases infected with the brucellosis. So that is the uh, statistic says, but we do not have any data on human brucellosis. But when you taste unpasteurized milk, you will face the problem. Otherwise, everything will be fine. Only those who are having uh, direct contact with the brucellosis, they are prone to get disease. And then with respect to uh, genomics of brucella, so this was the first genome sequence in the year uh, 2002. The genome sequence of the facultative intracellular pathogen brucella militancy. So after having uh, the genome sequences, uh, interestingly, they could not find any classical virulence factors like exotoxin or capsules, uh, classmate, cumbria, or any antibiotic resistant cancer, nothing was found. So it's, it's a different kind of pathogen. So only identified virulence factor was the type 4 secretion system, which is the homologous to agrobacterium cumification where it's uh, transfer TAE plasma. Well, you might remember about a TAE plasma transfer by agrobacterium chemistrician. Similar kind of secretion system was found in brucellosis, which was possibly, which could be possibly horizontally transferred during some time back. And this was the conclusion or question arise from after having the first complete genome sequences. So they have identified T4 FS, T4 secretion system. In fact, uh, people have done some experiments. When they delete T4 SS, make it non-functional, they become a non-pathogenic. So T4 secretion system is essential for its virulence. But what is what factors or what proteins or what uh, metabolites are secreted through T4 SS is not known. And then, uh, so that was an open question. Still, it is an open question. So those people have identified some one or two uh, proteins or factors, but it is still what is being secreted and how it to become pathogenic is not known. Similarly, they are non-motile, but uh, flagellar genes are found, or flagellar genes cryptic, or somehow it is modified as uh, uh, injection system, or like uh, super injecting needle, or something like that. So they have lost motility. Whether the flagellar gene is converted into a secretion apparatus 
forty pages of passing for last something like that. There is a open question. And then which genes are involved when malice injuries invade the uh, uh, multiple diverse hosts? Especially, so which genes are responsible for host specificity of malignancy and then pathogenicity? And then which genes are required for uh, causing abortion in uh, animals? Yeah, this is uh, the Brucella genome. So it has two chromosomes of 2 to 2.1 in one phase and 1.3 in another uh, chromosome. Both chromosomes are essential. So it has unique uh, ability of invading phagocytic and non phagocytic cells. It can survive intracellularly and avoiding the immune system in different ways. And then uh, with respect to immunity, so though humoral uh, response uh, takes place, so recovery from brucellosis, that is uh, only when uh, T cell immune response works, we can get recovered. Okay. So, therefore, uh, there is no efficient vaccine, not even efficient vaccine. There is no, not even a single uh, human vaccine is available for brucellosis. So, the only control mechanism to avoid uh, brucellosis, human brucellosis, is managing the diseases in a cattle or cattle, sheep, and other animals. So, only by means of uh, controlling animal brucellosis, we can avoid human brucellosis. So there is no vaccine. Of course, treatment is uh, possible. There is no antibiotic resistance in uh, brucellosis, but you may need to take uh, a longer regimen for three months or some time. So treatment so that all the intracellular pathogen may get through. So this is the uh, mechanism of infection. The so brucella they get they enter into the cell, they form phagosomes, and then fuse with lysosome and then form phagolysosome. 95% of the cells are killed and then they are degraded. Or 1% to 5% they escape from phagolysosome and they reach endoplasmic reticulum and they become and they create its own replicate image where they multiply within the cells. And then after some time, it creates autophagic membrane and then exits into the cell so that it can infect other cells. So this is the understand, I mean, uh, understanding of the pathogenicity mechanism and intracellular mechanism. But this also, at each step, which proteins or which uh, factors are responsible for all these interactions are not, are not completely known. People have predicted and then they have shown that these are the mechanisms, but complete mechanisms of post pathogen interaction is not known. So genomes of all the cold species are available right now and they are highly conserved. Marker genes typically used for phylogenetic analysis like penis RNA, uh, DNA B, guide B, all those things. So they are hundred percent identical in all the species. So, the, so therefore uh, the epidemiology analysis or differentiation of species is very difficult. So the serious issue is uh, identification of genetic factors responsible for host specificity. What factors are responsible for crucial insect to preferentially infect cattle? Similarly, what factors are responsible for militancy to infect sheep and goats? Are not known. And if you know that, uh, that may give a better uh, idea to control the factors. Uh, the pan genome of brucellosis, and then we do some multiple genome alignment. If you could see, except in uh, one organism, where right, there is a extra piece of information, I mean, genomic fragment. On the other hand, it is missing here. So it was a translocation of a piece of DNA from chromosome 1 to 2. Other than that, almost 99% are similar. Not even a single war of this specific to a particular species. So, that is the case. Say, so, for example, in other uh, uh, pathogens, like uh, if you compare Palmola Taisi and Paratisi, there will be hundreds of genes. Similarly, uh, if you compare Mycobacter and Timophilus, uh, I mean, 
Cuba clothes and uh, the press, you will have thousands of jeans, different. But among the Brusola, everything is conserved. Genome is almost 90% or more than 90% is conserved. Not even a single gene is conserved or unique to any particular species. That is the case. And then we did uh, some analysis and role of recombination in Brusola. So we we did uh, an analysis using a chromosome, I mean, effect of recombination versus point mutation. There is a tool called clonal frame. It measures the recombination and its effect by measuring rho by theta and rm values. So rho by theta measures how often recombination even happen relative to mutation. And then rm value measures how important the effect of recombination was the diversity was in the diversification process. And then uh, this was the data with respect to chromosome rho by theta value was 0.0145. Means uh, out of 100 mutation, there was 0 0.01, that is uh, less than one recombination event happened during evolution. Similarly for chromosome two also it is 0 0.016. Whereas on the other hand, for uh, other example, Listeria monodotogens, rho by theta value is 0.7. Means if there is a 100 mutation, 70 recombination even happen in the genome of Listeria monodotogens. Whereas in the case of uh, Brusola, it is very less. So therefore, it, well, what we call it as it is a clonal evolution because the uh, mean, means so evolution of this species happened. Predominantly, that is mainly because of the fine mutation rather than the recombination. Because the conclusion from this study. And then uh, we have developed an, a genome wide SNP based phylogeny analysis that could distinguish different biovars of suiz. So, Brusula suiz is one of the zoonotic species which frequently infects the uh, but there are uh, some five biovars, not all the biovars are uh, zoonotic. One or two are zoonotic, and others are non zoonotic in nature. So, therefore, uh, if you analyze the genome, it is almost similar. All the genes will be there in all the biovars. But uh, since we found that uh, based on the recombinant analysis, point mutation could be uh, more responsible for the evolution of uh, the species. So we did a, a genome-wide uh, analysis, and then we made a phylogenetic tree. Uh, we can see here, so SNP phase based phylogeny would differentiate different biovars versus different biovars. I mean, biovars specific clade could be generated irrespective of the country of origin or whatever it is. Uh, we compare. Yeah. yeah, this is the SNP based phylogenetic tree where you can see case specific, bio, bio specific clay. So, this is based on genome wide alignment, that is, multiple genome alignment based phylogenetic tree where there is a, a shuffling between biovars. Say, for example, here you have one, one case, this is another biovar. Similarly, there is a uh, interchange of species, I mean, biovars among different clades of phylogenetic tree. So it is another clue or uh, an indication that SNPs are playing a major role. So better is to concentrate on uh, understanding the SNPs. What makes the different biovars similarly, what makes different species can be identified using mutation analysis. But uh, characterizing an SNP, especially uh, multiple SNPs on the genome, is not um, easy. So understanding also will be very difficult. Characterization part is very difficult. So that's why uh, no people are, no one is working on a host specificity or host specific relevance factor. Yeah, so accordingly, so that was the biovar, uh, biovar of a particular species. And then therefore, we extended the study as a genome-wide association study, GWAS. So GWAS is uh, originally uh, used in uh, human genome research, where uh, 
people will uh, study the correlation between different SNPs and the disease susceptibility. Say, for example, what SNPs are uh, correlated or associated with uh, type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes or uh, cardiovascular diseases. All those things. There are a number of studies. So the same uh, genome wide referencing studies could be extended to uh, microorganisms also. So we took some uh, 562 Brusella genome sequences from the database and then using uh, various tools. So here I cannot explain everything due to short of time. So based on this, so we did pan GWAS and SNP GWAS. Pan GWAS could not differentiate anything and then we dropped this. And then SNP GWAS could make uh, could differentiate different species. Now this was the paper, this was the number of SNPs, core SNPs. We use this 31,000 core SNPs for the analysis. Core SNPs means the specific position of uh, was found in all the species, all the 552 Brusola Bruce genomes. So that's what we took. And then this is the phylogenetic tree based on the genome-wide SNPs. Here you can see beautiful uh, bifurcation, that is separation of individual species and with respect to Brusola 2 is one can see individual uh, bio versus fake clades. So accordingly, 16 clades have been uh, generated and then we identified uh, this is gene-based GWAS, here it is SNP-based GWAS. So these are the 16 uh, uh, groups. This is the six and whatever specific groups. Each one we could find out some number of unique SNPs associated with uh, particular species. So, uh, so we can find the say for example in this Brussels water we have included 311 uh, genomes and some number of 143 trait specific SNPs were formed. So these 143 SNPs could have formed well earlier during the period of evolution, and those SNPs would be responsible for the evolution of abortus, access species. And then those SNPs could be responsible for the species specificity. And all these things are predictions so one has to validate Validation, it's not straightforward in a, in a pathogen like a brucellosis. So, but we found that these are the kind of SNP that could be associated with the pathogenicity of different species. Similarly, uh, we did a core genome multilocal sequence typing. So, there was a uh, MLST tool was available, and then that could not uh, classify all the genome sequences. So therefore, people have uh, extended like MLVA and then extended MLST, likewise all those things. And then we have developed a tool called Core Genome MLST. And then again, so we extracted uh, unique genes. And then finally, we found taken uh, 108 loci, TG MLST loci. And then this could be used for phylogeny analysis. So this is the uh, tool, so among 311, Brussel abortus could be classified into sequence types 1, SC1 to SC96. So from 552 genome sequences, we have made different STs, up to 238 sequence types could be identified. So when a new genome is sequenced, it can be subjected to CGMLS analysis, and then we can predict uh, which group it belongs, which sequence type it belongs. And if it doesn't uh, match with any of these SN, SN, ST, that is sequence type, we can assign a new ST, like starting from 239. Yeah, here you can see the core genome MLST can clearly separate different species and bio of uh, two is and yeah, even among the marine mammal specific different clades could be uniquely found. So, and then secretion system, we predicted um, 
so I acknowledge uh, DBT Network Project on Google as it where it was, I mean, where my project was funded. And then we have a DBT IPLS and UGC NAS service program, uh, the instrumentation facility, and so I have T. Gunasegaran, my mentor, and then research scholars who worked in this project, and Dr. Rajesh and his team for giving this opportunity. Thank you all, and uh, I'm happy to, if you have any questions. Thank you, sir. So, if there are any questions, you can uh, raise questions to Dr. Rajendra, or you can type the questions in the chat box. Any questions? I think uh, your presentation is like uh, very clear, so I think uh, they would have understood what is brucellosis, uh, so they might not have any questions, it seems. Any questions? All right, uh, if there are no questions, then uh, I request uh, Dr. Seva Subramanian, uh, Director. Director of uh, Pike Spectrum Environmental Research Center, Chennai, to give uh, a word of thanks to Dr. J. Rajendra. Okay, that was a wonderful speech. A lot of information from Dr. Rajendra. Um, and uh, I think uh, he packed a lot of information. And uh, we really enjoyed. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajendra, for a wonderful talk. Yes, sir. So good afternoon, sir. Good. All right. So yeah. So Dr. Anil Singh, sir, uh, he's a is uh, a medical oncologist and a hematologist. Uh, he has done MBBS and MD medicine from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Raipur, and uh, he's uh, trained in uh, oncology and hematology from Bombay Hospital, Bombay, and CMC Hospital, Bellu, and uh, Varun Mahajan Fellowship in Leukemia. Lymphoma from Memor uh, Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center, in New York, uh, in the year 2001. So he is a UICC Fellowship in Advanced Breast Cancer from the Cornell Vale Medical College, New York, 2005. Uh, Dinkar Kandekar Fellowship in Lung Cancer and uh, G1, oh, sorry, uh, Gastrointestinal Cancer, GI Cancer from Evanston Hospital, Chicago, 2006. Uh, short Fellowship at the Breast Cancer. Uh, Breast Center, uh, Evanston Hospital, Chicago, in October 2006. Uh, working in indoor since 1999 and, and uh, is attached to the CHL Hospital. Uh, it's a multi specialty, I mean, super specialty hospital in indoor, Madhya Pradesh, as uh, honorable hematologist and oncologist. Uh, uh, with that brief introduction, I uh, welcome uh, Dr. Anil Singh sir, to give his presentation. Uh Thank you, uh, Dr. Ram. And uh, first of all, I request all participants to please turn on their cameras, not the mic, just the camera, so that we feel more connected and looks like a real conference. Now, we start off uh, this uh, meeting with the tale of a 30-year-old young man who was found to have some fever and uh, was found to have COVID positive. Now, he was sent a prescription by his friend regarding what he should take. And therefore, he goes and takes all these drugs from the local chemist who is very happy to oblige him. Ivermectin, docycycline, azithromycin, cephalexin, midrol, vitamin C, zinc, cough syrup, and paracetamol. So, I think he, he is taking this whole package and he feels that he is doing well. However, unfortunately, five days later, his oxygen saturation starts to fall and he is admitted into a hospital. Soon after admission, his condition worsens and he is put on a ventilator. Now, what, did he do everything right? Just stop a bit here and examine 
whether everything was done right and he just went on a ventilator because of his bad luck or whether something could have been done differently with a different outcome we hear a lot in the newspapers about this and that and we hear about our friends and about their relatives and how so and so got sick but we never use our brain as to what we should do in a particular situation so we will try to address this question today so that is the question did he do anything wrong so i'll take you back i know you are all scientists and you are all well versed with it so i'll be pretty quick through this but this is a basic uh, primer into how infections happen we have a lot of microorganisms attacking us most of the time and these microorganisms can be divided into various categories like bacteria virus fungus parasites and so on the important thing to understand is that this distinction is not only academic this distinction means that we have different kinds of drugs to take care of different kinds of infections like antibiotics are used in bacterial infections antivirals are used in uh, viral infections like herpes and hiv antiparasitic agents are used for parasites like malaria and antifungals are for fungi now it stands to reason that if you use antibiotics broad spectrum antibiotics in 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 against those micro, microorganisms which are not susceptible it is going to be useless so what are those broad spectrum antibiotics the same that our friend take in in, in that present uh, ex example like azithromycin cefuroxamin meropenem injection doxycycline and so on so they are pretty potent drugs which work against bacteria and they not only work against the targeted bacteria but they also damage the bacteria which are bystanders so but then if you use antibiotic against parasites viruses fungi it is of absolutely zero use in fact the viruses are pretty much happy they tell you that we are not bacteria you can use as much of antibiotics as you can so what happened during the initial um, epidemic last year all over the world a lot of people used antibiotics and these antibiotics were used <clears throat> thinking that they would be useful but they were soon proven wrong and this covid myth has been debunked that uh, covid 19 is actually a virus and antibiotics will not work against viruses only bacteria they then did a lot of study they thought that there will be secondary bacterial infections in these uh, patients with uh, covid and they found that there was only 3.5% patients who had a secondary bacterial infection and therefore antibiotic prescription which was done in more than 75% patients was absolutely unnecessary after this there were clear cut guidelines that antibiotics are not to be used in any uncomplicated covid patient so now how do we defend ourselves from attacking viruses or any other microorganisms so let us go back and uh, uh, review a bit of the theory behind it the as you know anybody if you ask uh, you will see that we have some first lines of defense the first lines of defense are your skin your mucus acid in the stomach and so on tears but there is also a first line of defense of good gut bacteria and this is the schematic of the first line of defense which i just showed you then behind the first line of defense there are the immune cells which are the protective uh, cells like phagocytes neutrophils macrophages and so on and then behind that there are still third line of defense which are the t and the b cells which produce cell mediated and humoral immunity i know most of you are familiar with this i'm not going to go into detail but this is how we tell that this is the innate immunity which is all these cells which are present and they are ready to act at a moment's notice and then there is the adaptive immunity which is a slower response on the right side which is antibodies and cell mediated kill and this is just to show 
how on the first attack by a microorganism the leukocyte comes and challenges it and uh, fights with it with all its uh, strength so this is a schematic of the whole uh, complicated rather uh, structure of the immune system but the more main thing to understand here is that this is a very intricate structure and everything is kind of interlinked and it is a very balanced structure so this immune system can keep out everything like the viruses and uh, bacteria but that is not enough now think about it if this immune system becomes too weak then the viruses or or the bacteria or the fungi are going to attack you and going to overpower you and multiply like anything but if the immune system becomes too strong there is a hyper reactivity of the immune system and that is what is very damaging and this hyper reactivity of the immune system is what is causing problems for covid patients this is what is killing so many covid patients because of the cytokine storm and the damage to the lungs so this is a cytokine storm now imagine if you had a spider which came into your home you don't take a blow torch to kill that spider because with that blow torch you may end up burning down your home and burning down yourself as well and that is what happens in a cytokine storm the point to understand is that the most important part of the covid process is hyper reactivity of your immune system and that is what we have to see why does it happen and as you know these are the markers of your cytokine storm like uh, c reactive protein ldh d dimer ferritin and you are all very familiar with these now imagine that you have a multi storied building with many flats and all those flats are lying empty you would be pretty much scared most of the time that un, uh, uh, criminal elements or those elements which are undesired may come and enter your flats and occupy those flats so you are pretty anxious about it so what do you do with it the first thing you are always looking for is to let out all those flats to your friends who can then be become tenants in those flats so once you have all these tenants living inside those flats that is, is your first line of secure, security that is your first line of defense now these tenants will not let all the bad guys come and live there anyway further these tenants will keep your flats clean and speak and span and shining right that is what nature has designed for us our nature has designed some microbiome to live inside us and to live all over us this as dr wilson aruni told this morning in an amazing lecture is is prehistoric i mean the microbiome has been there since ages and ages and it starts to form inside you soon after you are born this microbiome lives in your lungs in your gut in your throat in your uh, liver everywhere highest concentration of the microbiome is inside your gut so as dr wilson aptly pointed out that your microbiome has 10 times the number of cells than yourself therefore you are not actually what you think you are you are you plus your microbiome the microbiome is you and these happy organisms they live as commensals inside us and they keep doing things for us what do they do for us they influence your mental health it's interesting if you are feeling depressed it is likely that your microbiome is off they promote skin health they help digest food they protest protect against toxins but the most important is they act closely with the immune system how do they protect us see on the left this is healthy microbiome all these purple dots are your microbiome friendly organisms which live over your epithelium now or if they are present in good numbers these red micro microorganisms which are invading are not able to pass through into your system these protect have a barrier besides that they also fight for nutrition i mean they don't allow these bad guys to get nutrition from the environment because they are taking up all the nutrition thirdly they are interacting with the immune cells just inside the epithelium 
and they are sending signals to the immune cells that hey there is something wrong going on here and as you know these are the iga uh, molecules which are then secreted in response to the signals which are sent by the microbiome to this immune cells and things remain good and these guys do not find entry into your system however on the right side if there is a microbiome depletion due to any cause you will see that this thing goes away and the bad guy starts to come in 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 big quantities so this is how the microbiome and the immune system are closely interlinked and the microbiome is the one which teaches the immune system what is foreign and what is ours and that is how things work say for example these are small rota viruses which come inside your gut now you know rota viruses can cause lot of diarrhea so the microbiome the bacteria which is sitting there sends a phone call to the immune system hey guys we got a situation here incoming rota virus and the immune system right away responds no problem what troops do you need we'll send them over and the rota virus is taken care of so we need both the halves of the equation we need the right side as well as the left side we need the immune system as well as the microbiome to function as a unit and protect us therefore looking at all the things that the microbiome can do your brain your gut your digestion your metabolism your obesity everything including your immunity they say that if you want to remain fit you need a fit microbiome period end of story absolutely proven so now let us see how do we mess up with the microbiome we mess up with the microbiome with lot of antibiotics with other drugs which we consume sometimes nsaids the pain killers they can mess up the microbiome wrong foods and if we mess up the microbiome things start to go wrong so let us now examine with this basis that can antibiotics be harmful in viral infections if you have a viral fever and if you took antibiotics what can happen for that you have to understand this pathway now this is a pathway where you take good food like flavonoids and this food inside your gut needs your needs to be digested and this digestion is done by the friendly microbiome by the friendly bacteria clostridium bacteria which is sitting right there it digests the food and extracts a compound for you this compound is known as dat or des amino tyrosine now this this compound is given to you and it remains into your system now if as you see on the right you have a attack of influenza on your lungs this dat then brings interferon all along to fight this influenza and this interferon then clears the virus and your lungs become healthy again so you have to understand that not only you need the good amount of right diet you need the right microbiome to digest that diet so that you get the right molecule which can then recruit interferon to keep your lungs healthy now this is a amazing uh, hypothesis amazing concept but does it really work let us see so scientists have done experiments in mice what they have done was they took two groups of mice and on the right side of this this is the one group of mice which they gave antibiotics and they gave them oral antibiotics and this antibiotics depleted the gut microbiome they did not give antibiotic on the left side of this uh, the left side of the group then after a few days they exposed both the groups of mice to influenza virus now they found that those and those mice who did not receive antibiotics had a good microbiome cleared all the virus from their lungs and they did not have any problem they recovered pretty good their severity of influenza was much low but those who were pre treated with antibiotics they found that the virus grew four times faster in these guys lungs and lot of these mice actually died because of the influenza therefore we see clearly that if you give antibiotics uh, the, they are going to be pretty difficult for you to fight off influenza in the lungs then they repeated this experiment in a very very nice manner with human volunteers what they did they again took two groups of volunteers 
and they treated half of them with antibiotics, oral antibiotics, and they did not give antibiotics to the other half. After some days, they gave both these groups of volunteers flu vaccine. Now, once this flu vaccine was given, they found, they tried to examine what is the response to the vaccine. And they found that these normal volunteers who did not receive antibiotics made antibodies to flu and they were protected against the flu virus from then on. However, these guys who had a depleted gut microbiome, as you can see in the bottom, they did not make any response to the flu vaccine. They did not, they did not make much of antibodies and they had impaired vaccine immunity. Therefore, you can see that even the vaccines do not work if you have taken some antibiotics. Not only that, they also found that those patients who, or those volunteers who had taken antibiotics had an upregulation of inflammation inside their systems. And uh, this upregulation of inflammation caused a uh, hyperreactivity of the immune system. Remember, we are now watching what makes the immune system hyperreactive, more inflammatory. And these inflammation markers were elevated in all those guys who had received antibiotics so that whenever they get a viral infection, may it COVID, may it influenza, they are going to go into a hyperinflammatory response. And they are going to go into a cytokine storm as well. So we see that how consumption of antibiotics messes up with your microbiome and it throws your immune system completely out of balance. So now what the scientists have done in papers which have been published in January and February this year, they started to examine the microbiomes of patients who had recovered from COVID as well as those patients who, uh, who succumbed to COVID. And they found that uh, those patients who had uh, uh, who had uh, uh, who had bad covid had a dysbiotic microbiome had a bad microbiome and uh, these papers then further confirmed the hypothesis that things are going absolutely absolutely wrong so now look at this they have found now what was happening here that the uh, these are the gut microbiome and this is in COVID. So if you have a gut microbiome, which is, uh, so if you have a microbiome, which is uh, unbalanced, you need a balance of the microbiome so that immune system remains balanced. Now, if you have an under reactive immune response, because you have an excess of those bacteria, which are anti-inflammatory, they will depress the scale to this downside and you will have an immune system which is under responsive or which is uh, not working well. If that happens, you will see that you will have virus multiplication much more than normal and this virus is going to damage your lungs and has pneumonia and ARDS. Whereas on the other side, if we have over expression or over preponderance of those bacteria, like the Firmicutes, like the um, Klebsiella, they cause overreactive immune responses. So this scale will be tilted to the top and you will have excessive inflammation, which then causes pneumonia and ARDS. So for the best response or the best outcome, what you need is a balanced immune system here. So this is again a schematic which shows how these, uh, these things work. And if you see here, the, this is basically uh, how you have anti-inflammatory probiotic bacteria, which are good, and the pro-inflammatory bacteria, Klebsiella streptococcus and the Firmicutes, which are bad for you. And they can cause cytokine storms. So this is how the balance needs to be maintained. A balance needs to be maintained by the healthy microbiome, which then leads to a good lung immunity and which leads to a controlled and viral bacterial infection. Dysbiotic microbiome will produce bad lung immunity, defective response and uncontrolled viral and bacterial infection. Now let us also look at this. This is the dark side of uh, antibiotics. 
just so uh, although the antibiotics uh, the dark side of antibiotics adverse effects of the infant immune system against infection now after this is a very recent paper published last year in 2020 october and they found that if you were to give uh, antibiotics to kids who are less than 3 years old you will lead uh, dysbiotic microbiomes now this microbiome in the kids are basically being formed they are in the infancy and once that microbiome gets damaged these kids have a damaged immune system for their whole life therefore now onwards if you have a kid which is less than 3 years old do not give them antibiotics unless otherwise totally importantly necessitated you do not give them antibiotics for little fevers or little diarrhea don't do that so the thing to do is we should not take antibiotics at all for small fevers and we should not take antibiotics at all for um, viral fevers and no antibiotic should be taken for covid because these are all going to mess up with your immune system it has also been found that a single course of antibiotics can mess up the gut microbiome for almost one year so that was about antibiotics the those antibiotics which you go to a chemist shop and buy but what about those which is in your food and we know that uh, we know that a lot of our food is sprayed with pesticides and these pesticides are really uh, uh, are damaging to the microbiome and they can also cause dysbiosis the other thing you have to understand is the food inside your animal products so the micro these animal products are treated with antibiotics now it was found that 16% of all cows treated with antibiotics or mastitis but 100% of the cows get antibiotics for to prevent mastitis as a prophylactic thing and there was a study done by cse which again confirmed all of this and therefore if we consume these uh, animal products we are taking those antibiotics and they will mess with your microbiome and as well as they will cause the resistant bacteria to grow in the community so you need to go vegan especially during uh, epidemics please keep your microbiome intact do not take animal products because it, you cannot prevent antibiotics from coming into the animal products so then there was a study which uh, was that the diverse microbiome appears to have protective effect against external infection including covid and unnecessary use of antibiotics resulting in diminished human microbiome must be completely avoided then we come to the steroids so steroids are a double edged sword steroids should not be taken in the first week of getting covid because steroids are immunosuppressive steroids cause your viruses to multiply four times faster if you take steroids like our patient did if you remember he took solumedrol or medrol tablets they are going to cause excessive multiplication of the virus and you will have poorer outcome steroids are useful in obviously those patients who are advanced and who have a hyper immune response then steroids can be life saving but they, but steroids should not be taken in the first week of the illness besides that they can also lead to bacterial overgrowth and also lead to high blood sugars which is also going to depress your immune system so how do we take care of the microbiome and see that it is healthy and balanced by the right kind of food and if you are if you have anything at all just take ma maximum food which has fiber in it because fiber is something which is loved by all the good bacteria and they can digest that fiber and give you amazing molecules uh, from that keep away from simple carbohydrates keep away from sugars always go for complex carbs and they are going to be better for you because if you were to go and take simple carbs we are going to take more starches and more more simple uh, carbohydrates like this lady is buying from the store you are going to have problems because these sugars and these starches are going to feed the bad bacteria and these bad bacteria will then punch holes into your intestine and the stomach and everywhere else and they this syndrome is very well known as the leaky gut syndrome the leaky gut syndrome 
is now very well established as a cause of hyper inflammatory state you can i'm not don't have time to go into it detail but this is very well known and therefore once you have a hyper inflammatory state and you get you are unfortunate enough to get covid you are in line for cytokine storm so think about it lifestyle diseases are behind 30% of covid casualties can you believe that uh, a guy went on a ventilator a guy dies because he is eating the wrong food a guy dies because he is taking antibiotics a guy has a problem uh, in the uh, with ventilation and has bad lung uh, damage because he took steroids so because he is obese because he has diabetes because all of these all of these diseases are known to be associated with a bad or a dysbiotic microbiome so this is about diabetes now it is well established now that if you have diabetes your risk of death with covid is 11% more than the guy who does not have diabetes so you have to be very careful that you must right away address diabetes and make it controlled completely i for one firmly believe that diabetes is a lifestyle disease and with the right amount of change in the diet and right amount of lifestyle changes you can cure diabetes most of the patients with diabetes can be cured so take care of your diabetes and see that it is well cured controlled i just mentioned about obesity obesity has been completely associated with a dysbiotic microbiome it has also been associated with bad mortality in covid a new study has suggested that exercise could protect against severe covid they had a study of 50000 patients in california and found that those patients who were inactive had the greater risk of being hospitalized and dying and finally good sleep is important sleep if you sleep better you will have a better immune system and obviously much other benefits but the immune system is going to love it now i am really concerned about antibiotics and this is a slide which tells you about the risk of multi drug resistant bacteria being generated in the community because of antibiotic misuse and antibiotic overuse in your in your dairy products in your meat as well as in your pharmacy so you have to be very careful because what i have seen in this epidemic large number of patients have taken large number of antibiotics and i really fear that 6 months down the line we are going to be struck with the epidemic of resistant bacterial infections so that you go and get a cesarean section done you you can have septicemia and die if you have a fracture you go and get it operated you can have infection which is not going to respond and you may had at end up lot of complications so these are things which we have to be very very fearful of and be uh, alarmed about if you have already taken antibiotics you can ask your doctor to give you a prescription for probiotics these are some things which are going to help to rebuild your microbiome faster so now finally uh, just a, uh, two minutes about mucormycosis so everybody understands everybody knows that there is a epidemic of the black fungus going on and what do we do with it and why is it happening so going back to our um, uh, analogy of a building and a flat you see that there was uh, these are your microbiome living inside your various uh, flats that is your various organs then there is a circle of security which is the immune system then there is a police which is taking some patrolling outside and these are your t lymphocytes and this is the third line of defense as i told you so once all these three lines of defense are working well these black guys the bad guys can not come and invade your home they can just not do it but what happens uh, when you take antibiotics all these good guys which live inside you vacate the premises and then once you take steroids steroids suppress your immune system and the circle of sim- immunity also goes away that second line of defense goes away then once you have this infection with the virus this virus is known to be toxic to the lymphocytes and it also removes a lot of these t lymphocytes therefore this police force is also depleted now this is a sitting target for all these bad guys to come rushing in and make uh, a home inside you 
and then you get this mucormycosis. So this is a combination of all these three issues which leads to this mucormycosis. Believe me, it is not because of ox bad oxygen, defective oxygen, or uh, dirty masks or nothing like that. It is as simple as that. That when you remove all three lines of defense, you get mucormycosis, you get aspergillosis, and other things. And as you know, mucormycosis is extremely difficult to treat and eradicate. Once it goes inside your system, it's pretty much of a problem. So, in conclusion, I would just like to say that in the fight against the body and the virus, the body usually wins. 95 to 98% of the time, the body will win. We just have to allow the strength of the body not to get depleted and we should not take unnecessary drugs which are going to interfere from with our strength to fight the virus. And if we can do that, we will win this battle without any problems at all. These are just my contact details in anybody, in case anybody has any questions, not today, but tomorrow or day after or anytime else, you can send me a mail or a WhatsApp message and I'll be very happy to help you out. So finally, what are your take home messages? Your take home messages are that you should not take antibiotics for viral infection. Don't eat food which is laced with antibiotics and pesticides. Try to go for organic food. Don't eat food of animal origin. Try to go vegan. Don't take sugary and processed food. Increase the variety of plant foods in your diet. That will increase the variety of your microbiome. Do not take steroids in fever due to any virus. Definitely not until unless it is absolutely necessary. Tackle your high blood sugar and diabetes. Don't be a cow's potato. Go and exercise. Go and take a walk. Go and do a cycle. Then sleep well because that is going to rejuvenate your immune system and keep away from stress because stress also depresses your immune system and causes uh, uh, viral infections like COVID to come forward. And if we can do that, then I'm sure our future is going to be extremely healthy, vital and promising. Thank you all for a very patient hearing and I would be very happy to take questions. Most of the COVID patients in the country, I mean, in, in our states are given antibiotics to be yes. asked them to stop. Yes, yes, absolutely. That is a very good question. That There are two or three aspects to the question. Uh, in the initial period, nobody knew what to do. So people started to use uh, whatever they thought and then by word of mouth, everybody started to do it. But if you look at the Government of India guidelines, if you look at ICMR guidelines, if you look at any other guidelines, all in institute guidelines, and guidelines outside the country, nobody suggests using antibiotics. So if your doctor is still writing antibiotics, maybe he is misinformed. And we need to spread the message that antibiotics are not necessary. The other part is that a lot of patients are taking antibiotics just without going to a doctor. And they are just taking antibiotics because there is a, a prescription which is floating around on WhatsApp and everybody goes and takes it. So antibiotics should not be given and they are going to harm people in COVID. Okay, Kavita has says that uh, milk forms the basic food of infants. How to avoid antibiotics from milk products? Nice question. First of all, Dr. Kavita, infants should be given mother's milk as far as possible and not top feeds. Secondly, uh, I suggest that, uh, uh, actually this is a whole new topic and I have another lecture on milk. I feel strongly that milk should not be given to people who have crossed infanthood because it is harmful in many ways. But right here, there is no way where we can certify that a milk which is being given is absolutely antibiotic free. So here I would suggest that you, if you need to 100% give the milk, use uh, powdered milk, which has been tested. But once the, the infant is above two years of age, stop the milk, completely stop it. You can switch to soya milk, you can switch to almond milk and other milk substitutes. Yes, so bacterial co-infection is a question and bacterial co-infection has now been completely documented by many studies that it is not a problem. 
it is not a problem they have done lot of studies and thousands and thousands of patients only 2 to 3 percent patients will have bacterial co-infection even in patients who are admitted into the icu the co bacterial co-infection rate is 12 to 13 percent that's all so 90 percent of patients are getting unnecessary highest antibiotics like meropenem picoplanin clindamycin which is going to wipe out your microbiome completely the question of antibiotic resistance is obviously a very uh, valid one as well so that is uh, absolutely wrong uh, uh, here again there there are a couple of units in the uh, icus here who know what i am talking about they are not using antibiotics for any of their patients and they have the best recovery rates in the city once cooked antibiotics to be degraded okay now uh, there has been again if you see my slide on that the, the center of st st research uh, the cse they found that actually the the uh, 20 minute boiling of milk is not destroying your antibiotic but yeah obviously i do not know about meat if you can really cook it deep enough to kill all your antibiotics but uh, i think still a big risk Any other questions? Somebody can come and unmute and ask a question live also, not a problem. Yeah, uh, that is important. This question where Garima is asking is about post-COVID syndrome. Uh, now, more and more papers have come out which tell us that those patients who have already suffered COVID, recovered, they still have a lot of problems, symptoms. A lot of weakness, body pain, uh, giddiness, uneven blood pressure, all kinds of stuff is going on. And now papers are coming out that these patients also have a dysbiotic microbiome, which is causing this uh, uh, post-COVID syndrome. So the thing to do would be to put them on probiotics, number one, and number two, put them on the right kind of diet so that their microbiome gets normalized as fast as possible. And that can happen in a couple of weeks. Thank you, sir, for the excellent lecture. Yes. Yeah, very informative, sir. Sir, uh, one of our uh, friend's daughter, she's been suffering from MISC, that's a post-COVID syndrome. Can you please throw some light on it, sir? What is MISC? Yeah, it's a 12-year-old uh, children. That's a multi-inflammatory syndrome, sir. Yeah. Post-COVID yeah. syndrome, yeah. 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 So can yes. you please throw some light on us, sir? Absolutely. This this also happens because of the dysbiotic gut microbiome, which causes a hyperinflammatory immune system to persist. So what they should do is they should try to rectify it by changing many, making many changes in the diet. Actually, that is another part of my clinical practice where I take patients and I teach them and I train them to change their diet um, gradually over a period of a couple of months. And uh, that leads to amazing changes in health. And uh, you can cure their hypertension, blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and general uh, energy levels, everything, just by changing their diet, reduce their cholesterol, uh, become absolutely uh, normal lipids. Uh, there are amazing changes which can happen. So they should go undergo such a program, and uh, that will definitely help them. If they cannot find a person who can guide them, then I would be willing to take them on as a teleconsultation and guide them you can give them my contacts yes sir thank you so much sir. definitely i'll uh, share with her sir thanks a lot thank you is vaccination essay those who are COVID and COVID? yes vaccination is actually advised for this covid uh, patient and uh, people should take the covid vaccination at least one month after they have recovered from the covid Hello. Yes. Hello, Dr. Singhvi. Yes. Come. Hello, Dr. Singhvi. Are you hearing yes, me? I can... Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, sir, uh, 
कैन कोविड काज लीवर प्रॉब्लम कोविड कैन कॉज प्रॉब्लम ऑल ओवर द बॉडी डेफिनेटली बट एज सच लीवर प्रॉब्लम वेल in 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 the serious condition where there is a cytokine storm you can get multi organ dysfunction the liver is also definitely badly affected but once recover then liver problem should not be too much of a problem uh, sir last year my wife got covid and uh, uh, the pus is formed in liver and uh, uh, collected in abdomen no that can is you not explain? like due to covid usually but you know what i mean covid can cause suppression of the immune system it can cause t lymphocyte depletion and that can lead to various infections anywhere in the body okay sir okay thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you so i think uh, we have come to the end of our time also and thank you all very much for a patient hearing and if you have any further questions you are more, more, can feel free to email me or whatsapp me and i'll be very happy to respond thank you very much and thank you once again dr ram and all the organizers thank you sir thank you very much and uh, i request uh, dr sousa bramanian uh, director of like spectrum and normal center and one of the coordinators of the conference to give formal word of thanks to dr anil Uh, thank you very much uh, doctor and uh, it is very very clear lecture i mean i am listening to your lecture uh, with a lot of clarity after a long time excellent uh, presentation i mean even common fellows like us uh, when are able to understand the importance of the uh, gut biome and uh, the especially the uh, the lactobacillus and other bacteria and uh, do you, and uh, do you suggest uh, also to take uh, the commercial or the normally available lactobacillus and uh, probiotic preparations <laughs> uh, uh, yeah i guess well you have to look at the quality of the preparation and the quantity of the bacteria i would suggest at least 5 million bacteria should be given once a day and uh, but you should not take it if you have no problems i mean if you are if you have given antibiotics then only you should take this or you are recovering from covid then you should take this let me give you a very important example of my mother she is 82 years old and she got covid and she had a, a very she became very weak she was not eating so as usual we did her blood test and the blood test obviously found that we had a crp level which was 208 normally 6 so but she did not have a fall in oxygen or anything now the 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 guidelines say that you have to do a ct scan or go to a hospital only if your oxygen falls and other otherwise nothing has needed to be done so what we did is we just observed her i gave her a probiotic capsule a day and nothing else zero medicine and and i just observed and i reassured her that you will be fine now you will not believe within 5 days her crp fell to 4 3.8 in from 208 and she did not receive any medicine she recovered in 5 to 7 days completely regained her strength and appetite so that is the way to go i mean once you know what is happening in the body you know your immune system is fighting the virus that's why the crp goes up the crp goes up not just because of the virus it because it goes up because the virus is being tackled with your immune system and the immune system is releasing cytokines so that is an example of why you don't need to give unnecessary medicines for most of our diseases most of our diseases can be cured in a natural way thank you doctor i think this is a very very important lecture i think this has to be publicized and then sent to all those uh, um, uh, people who are not attended also um, excellent sir thank you very much thank you uh, good evening uh, everyone present here uh, respected sir and madam all and all my dear friends uh, today i am going to present my e poster on the topic uh, molecular characterization and protein structure prediction of heat shock transcription factors in goat and sheep so uh, basically uh, in uh, developing countries uh, livestock sector contributes significantly to the national economy and the employment of the uh, rural uh, population and the climate change is now uh, recognized as one of the most serious uh, uh, challenge faced by the owners of the small ruminants 
like sheep and goat worldwide and heat stress in animals results in uh, uh, in decreased growth reproduction uh, milk quality and quantity as well uh, and the immunity which makes uh, uh, animal more susceptible uh, to disease and uh, uh, even death so the these economic losses uh, which uh, need to be emphasized uh, and to be objectively assessed for the animal welfare so heat shock genes are activated when uh, cells are exposed to stress stimuli and uh, forms uh, heat shock proteins and these heat shock proteins provide protection for, for the environmental and cellular stress factors as molecular chaperones to keep protein uh, homeostasis uh, now uh, these uh, heat shock transcription factors my work is on uh, heat shock trans transcription factors Uh, they are the major factors which are responsible for the induction of heat shock protein genes and these heat shock factors recognize the dna binding sites on the heat shock elements and activate genes encoding proteins chaperones in response to heat stress uh the oh, uh, now my work is uh, i have characterized uh, heat shock factors uh, in uh, sheep and goat first time and uh, the uh <clears throat> the uh, heat shock factors which are known uh, till now in uh, ruminants are hsf1 hsf2 hsf4 and 5 my work was on hsf2 and hsf5 gene so uh, i have <clears throat> characterized the orf of hsf2 gene uh, and observed as you can see here in the gel picture uh, which i have uh, done yes now <clears throat> if we come to material method first of all i have collected the uh, fresh uh, tissue of testicles tissue from the slaughter house uh, delhi then uh, i have extracted the rna from the uh, tissue uh, use, uh, using the trisol method then i have uh, prepared the cdna synthesis from the reverted method okay and then after that i have amplified the orf sequence of hsf2 and hsf5 gene uh, which we can see in the gel picture now here yes uh, the gel one uh, the gel picture 1 a and b Here the uh, ORF of HSF2 gene was observed to be 1627 base pair in sheep and 1179 base pair in goat. Similarly, uh, in uh, HSF5, the ORF was 1137 base pair in sheep and 1027 in goat. Now, after characterizing the uh, these uh, the sequences of HSF in sheep and goat, I have uh, done the <coughs> uh, domain analysis. Uh, by using uh, various tools the predict uh, predicted nls marcoil net nls that reveal that the members of hsf2 protein orthologs contain all major domains that is dna binding domain oligomerization domain and uh, which we can see in the figure 2 this is the multiple sequence synthesis of sequences known for the heat shock factors using cluster w in and i have uh, made this figure in the bio edit using bio edit program now after that i have went for the uh, phylogenetic analysis of my sequences which i have sequenced uh, in the picture 3 and 4 uh, of both the gene hsf2 and hsf5 uh, having the phylogenetic tree which i have constructed by the neighbor joining method uh, using mega 3 software now this phylogenetic analysis between the different orthologs suggested that these proteins are conserved from bovine to human as well as in other animals which is we can see in the uh, both the figures of uh, both the genes hsf2 and hsf5 now uh, also Uh, now in the this picture uh, showing the structural confirmation of goat uh, hsf2 and hsf5 of uh, 
for the gene from swiss model and domain organization showed uh, through pymol now here uh, that this is the 3d structure of sheep and goat hsf2 protein which was predicted by swiss model and it uh, showed the uh, this showed that the my sequence having the similar con uh, conformation structural conformation with the hsf2 uh, protein sequence showing functional similarity uh, with the human HS hsf2 sequence which i confirmed in the uh, this figure as well as i have also plotted the ramachandran plot for predicted uh, sequence of hsf2 protein uh, in goat and sheep for, from the software rampage this is the ramachandran plot so this was my study and uh, so concluding my study the present study was aimed to clone and sequence and characterize the partial open reading frames of hsf2 and hsf5 gene from cdna isolated from testicular tissue of sheep and goat i have mentioned the uh, species or uh, the specific breed also that uh, sheep uh, masheri and goat for beetle breed and uh, also uh, second i have concluded that the 3d structure of sheep and goat hsf2 protein was predicted by swiss model which showed similar conformation with the human hsf2 protein sequence showing functional similarity between them so this was my uh, uh, work which i have showed in the presentation thank you sir yeah you know uh, there are more than 20000 uh, genes so why do you want to know about uh, the hitch yes, protein 2 and 5 uh, no actually i have also done, uh, sir actually in ruminants in buffalo already this study was done uh, and uh, there was there were four uh, hitch up factor genes uh, which was uh, known in buffalo 1 2 4 and 5 and uh, among which i have done only on hsf2 and hsf5 because i was uh, unable to f uh, find this in hsf rest 2 genes sir that's why i have Uh, done for hsf2 and hsf5 only yeah somebody did our, uh, the characterization of uh, okay, the hitch up protein another you know yes. 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 who is that who is that hello yeah oh, sorry i Actually, think it's your disturbance yes sir hmm. yeah you know uh, i don't know the background well, why this hitch up protein should be uh, focused why the you know the scientist uh, characterized hitch up protein in buffalo what's the reason uh actually sir uh, because uh, hitch up proteins they are the molecular chaperones and when and when whenever there are heat stress or uh, these heat shock genes are activated whenever the cells are exposed to stress stimuli and these yeah, these that we uh, know you know this is uh, you know the domesticated animal why we have to study uh, you know these uh, genes uh, in domesticated animal what's the scientific background behind it so because these heat stress Uh, in animals you know, they are resulting in the uh, economic losses like okay. uh, they okay. are uh, you know, I, I, has been hampered milk quality wait, even wait. even in the buffalo you know i'll put the uh, question in other way suppose if you know that uh, you know complete uh, information about uh, hit shock proteins and their okay. sequences if you know how we can use it how uh, we can use it can we get better uh, uh, you know the line of uh, goat or can we get more meat or can we get disease resistant so what's a you know uh, you know sir uh, actually uh, till now the sequence was uh, not known sir so i have for this i have characterized these genes because in sheep and goat it was in, not known till now just i uh, just i browse it 2010 uh, somebody characterized uh, 
uh, many heat shock protein in goat and also no, it's, it uh, is yes sir, i know yeah go ahead sir i have done work not uh, on heat shock factors these hmm. heat shock factors these are these are the transcription factors which are responsible for the hmm. induction of hhg genes sir they must have work on heat shock proteins but my work hmm. was the heat shock factors okay until okay. now it was still, known only in buffalo and i had worked on sheep and goat yes sir uh, st uh, still i couldn't get uh, the application side of the work Hello. Uh, what is the uh, what is the outcome of your uh, work? What is the outcome? He's asking what is the outcome of your work? Like, now how it's going to like know? Uh, sir. How we can? Hello. Yeah. How we can use it? That the the sequence the and the easy. detail. How hmm. we can use it? So now if I, I if we have the sequence like i've shown in the phylogenetic tree we can uh, do the phylogenetic analysis from this tree which i have uh, created and uh, uh, wait, wait, we can analyze that how wait, wait. this this and hello or more they are uh, connected wait, wait. these species are connected hello and, yeah wait a minute yes, but phylogenetic uh, analysis we have to use uh, cytochrome c after this yes, gene you, you, yes. you know that's the best one so this data you know uh, if you use it for bio biogenic bio phylogenetic analysis and the molecular uh, you know uh, barcoding people won't accept it they will ask you uh, the data of uh, cytochrome oxidase uh, gene so the no, first I uh, you know the Sir, Tell me the precise the use of the sequence. It's okay. not by barcoding. It's not barcoding gene. Okay. Tell me precisely uh, the use, output. Uh, I'm not able to hear Tell because it's breaking. Yeah. Hmm. Tell yes, me sir. the precise application because mal for molecular doc molecular uh, yes. uh, you know barcoding there are uh, some other genes. Commonly, people, you know, uh, yes, you know, scientists accept those for molecular uh, barcoding. Mm -hmm. This is not a molecular barcoding gene. Hello. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, my conclusion of this work, which you are asking, is uh, like uh, after doing the uh, structure analysis, I predict the the protein structure which I predicted for the heat shock factor two in uh, goat and sheep. Uh, which I found similar uh, with the as I've written uh, with the human HSF2 protein, which I've got from RCSB, and uh, I found the similarity which can further help in uh, yeah. further you know, study. It's, it's not... mm -hmm. So, what's the size of your RNA? Yes, sir. The... What's the size of the RNA? The, the sequence which I I have cloned, sir. Hello. Yes. Yeah. The size. But are you yes, not? Yes. The size of the both RNAs. The size. The, the uh, whatever HSF two gene was one six two seven base pair in sheep and one one seven nine base pair in goat. Uh, for HSF two and in HSF five, uh, the it was one one three seven base pair in sheep and one zero two seven in goat. Lantika, what's a Lantika, what's listen, amino listen, listen sequence carefully what is the size of the rna that you have taken you have taken two rnas right like now what are the sizes of those rnas okay the next question what's the size of the protein the heat shock protein uh, 215 what's the size What's the size of the protein and what's the size of RNA? Can you tell me clearly? Size of the RNA you're asking, sir? Yeah, both I'm asking. RNA size and protein size. Number of amino acids in the protein and number of bases uh, in right the now, RNA. Sir, I... I... Mm. sir, right now I remember only this uh, nucleotide only. I can check.
then i'll tell you sir okay i am done thank you hello okay okay sir thank you thank you latika yeah so thank you sir we have uh, the next presenter uh mr ambar gupta ambar gupta are you there yes sir i am present here can you hear me yeah 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 i am present here sir. now you can share your screen yes so my screen is visible to everyone yes 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 sir one minute okay uh so is that full screen is visible to everyone yes yes go ahead go ahead yeah go ahead okay sir uh a warm welcome to all of the present uh, all of the attendees here myself ambar gupta i'm going to present the topic of my presentation is regulatory role of the calcium ion for augmenting the salinity tolerance mechanism in the rice so i am from the institute of life sciences bhubaneswar and welcome to this virtual world of the institute of life sciences which is the dbt autonomous institution so coming to the work the slide is not moving one second so slide is not moving sorry you can find at the bottom like you know there's an next or press in the middle and uh, go the you see up and down buttons yeah so coming with the introduction the salinity stress is one of the most detrimental factor for the crop plants in india around 7 million hectare of the land is affected by its rise so salinity is nothing is just as a component of to the metal ion which harmful for the plant growth salinity in agriculture field concerned with to the sodium toxicity so Gupta, hello. Yeah, she's gone. I think uh, he left. Yeah, some problem. Okay, uh, Miss Neha Singh. Miss Neha Singh. Miss Neha Singh, are you there? Miss Archana Chukla. Miss Archana Chukla. Hello, Miss Archana Chukla, are you there? Doctor C. Hello, Anchana Devi. Hello, sir. Arshana Sukla. Hello. Hello. Sir. Arshana Sukla, sir. Arshana Sukla. Yes, sir. Okay. You can share your screen. Now. Okay. Yeah, go to full screen. That one, Archana Shukla. You can see. You can see. No, no. Just see there the bottom. There's a wine glass, right? Wine glass. That's a icon, like wine glass at the bottom. Near, the, I mean, like before the zoom. Zoom in, like plus minus. You can find there are three icons. Go bottom. Go to bottom. Go to bottom. Okay. 
Sir, is this on full screen? No, it's not in full screen. Hey. You should not go there. Go, go friend. Go friend. There. Before that. So uh, just go where there I have to go, sir? Where I have to go, sir? Listen. Yes, sir. Go to the bottom. Now you are seeing there is a plus minus, right? At the bottom right hand side. Yeah. Next to that. Yeah, next yes, to that. Yes, sir. Next plus minus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Before that, before that, there are three icons. Archana, yes, listen sir. to me. You just go, just go before that icon. Go there to wine class. What did you learn? Like you know, before coming for a PowerPoint presentation, you should know how to go for full. Uh, sir, I saw the video uh, for the presentation. So here I'm taking on the class for the zooming I'm talking, I'm, I'm not talking about the this one. I am talking about your PowerPoint. Go for slideshow. Uh, okay, sir. Go, go to the slideshow. For... First class. Yeah, okay, sir. Slideshow. Uh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, is this visible? Learn how to do this. Yes, now perfect. Go ahead. Okay, sir. Uh, very good evening, respected all, all the guests and uh, all the participants. Uh, myself, Arshana Sutra. I am from uh, Sam Higgin Water Ministry of Agriculture, Technology and Services, Prayagraj. Uh, uh, my topic is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy in COVID Treatment. First of all, the introduction. What is the cognitive behavior? We all know that whatever we think and we sense, we uh, it shows in our behavior. So whenever we think, we uh, it uh, we show in our behavior, which is called as a cognitive behavior. But in CBT, uh, CBT is a, a type of evidence-based treatment to reduce the distress and unpleasant psychological symptoms. It was developed by uh, early 1960 by Aaron Bank, uh, approach known as cognitive therapy as a result of his results of conduction. Uh, for example, how it uh, comes to our cognitive whenever we feel uh, proud or whenever uh, we got good results, we feel proud and it comes to our behavior. And when someone bumps into Russ's past, us, we might feel alarmed and we may think how rude. And it also comes in behavior like we start shouting, complaining to someone, which makes us experience that cycle all over again. How CBT work? Uh, it is a cyclical uh, treatment. Whenever a thought comes, whenever uh, we have some type of emotions, this emotions convert into thought and eventually it comes in our behavior. Then the behavior is also connected to emotion and the cycle is go, uh, going on. So in the CVT, uh, the therapists try to change the perception of patients. What are the objective of this uh, uh, CVT? First, examine the effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy in relieving patient psychological distress during COVID-19 pandemic and to handle the panic condition among the people, uh, the needless hospitalization and crowd in hospital can be controlled, also spreading of the infections by preventing uh, the needless hospitalizations. What are the methods that used in CBD? Uh, Cognitive behavior therapy is considered to be the one of the yes. most Hello? effective. Hello. 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 Yeah, go yes, to sir. go to results. Yeah, go to results. <laughs> so go to the, the go to results sir. section. So, uh, sir, do uh, should I have to proceed or not? 
या गो टू रिजल्ट अच्छा ओके सर ओके रिजल्ट सर एज अ रिजल्ट टुडे वी बिकम सुपर मैनिक सुपर मैनिक मींस वी आर बिकम सो मच एक्टिव बिकॉज वी हैव वी कैन टेक ऑक्सीमीटर ऑल द मेडिसिन आर अवेलेबल वी हैव सो वी कैन बाई देम so we become super manic and it's come to the our cognitive behavior and whenever we feel uh, we have in uh, influenza or uh, uh, flu we fear we have come fear and anxiety then it comes to the breathlessness uh, then uh, a happy a hypoxia term comes in this pandemic where whenever the people uh, infected by the virus or bacteria in our body a system which automatically decrease the level of oxygen which is called as happy uh, happy uh, hypoxia because it could not uh, affect our body but due to uh, this fear and anxiety uh, this uh, pneumonia like situation occurs uh, due to taking uh, different type of steroids and uh, uh, all these antibiotics which resulted to uh, hypoxia immunity weak and death occurs as a result the patient and their family members experienced high level of anxiety depression and thus these observations uh, in inevitably raised the possibility that all the hospitalization patient in case severe covid infection 90% death was due to the cardiac arrest individuals with lower mental ability may experience a higher burden of covid 19 in a recent examination of a primary care records uh, relative to an unif unaffected group people with intellectual disability experienced around 10 times risk of the death uh, described to the covid-19 and 5 times the risk of hospitalization even after adjustment for the age and other comorbidities so cpt could be very effective for the covid patients and also sir uh, there is an alternative way of medicine for cbt because uh, due to the uh, pandemic face to face cbt is not possible so according to the edward back dr edward back who was the uh, british doctor and bacteriologist homeopathic writer best known for developing the back flower remedy uh, uh, as a alternative uh, medicine uh, inspired by a classical homeopathic tradition concluded that the deep disharmony uh, in a sufferer such as worry anxiety in patient uh, so depleted the individual's uh, health and also body lost uh, lost its natural resistance and become vulnerable to the infection uh, which we can see in the current scenario so in the alternative medicine we can use back flower uh, rescue remedy which is developed by the dr edward back uh, particular it is for use to calm and protect the protect against the anxiety during times of extreme stress uh, uh, the rescue remedy was a uh, uh, blend of five different wild flowers cherry palm clematis in uh, impens and rock rose star betulum uh, the uh, the back dr back was taken this idea from dr samuel hemens who was a founder of homeopathy uh, according to him first we have to treat the patient not the disease thank you sir so for your study how many patient did you uh, contact sir uh, it is in my home because in my home uh, already uh, i have we have uh, five members and we all were uh, covid positive uh, so we uh, we have also a fear anxiety but we didn't take any uh, medicine any allopathy medicine or any hospitalization even we were very serious but we didn't have take any uh, oximeter to the home for uh, for the our anxiety we take the rescue remedy and uh, uh, again what, what? Uh, say see here my question yeah. how many patient did you did you contact so your family is uh, how many four or five other five. than that how many patient? okay five, five. Yes. yeah how many other patient did you uh, did you go and see sir uh, 
I have uh, learned about this uh, rescue remedy uh, and the papers from the journals that it was uh, given to the patient who have COVID positive uh, COVID patients. Uh, so, sir, I didn't have any other uh, detail for the patient, but I have learned it, it. I experienced it in my family, or uh, and I also read it in the journal. And all the homeopathy uh, doctors also suggesting the rescue remedy. Or to uh, uh, calm down the patient from anxiety and depression, it can uh, automatically increase our yeah, immunity to fight against the yeah. COVID. Yeah, wait, wait a minute. Actually, we want to change the data as a scientific document. Uh, you know, you should have control. You should have proper experimental group. You know, then uh, from the observation, you can conclude something. Okay. okay. So you may. You may think uh, you may have a lot of uh, hypotheses, but properly the problem should be addressed. Yes. Okay. Study a study group should be there, and also control group should be there, and then uh, after the experiment, uh, after the, all the, all those uh, data collection, uh, you have to statistically approach all the data, and uh, you have to show the data is significant. Yes. Okay. In that case, in that case, it's a scientific document. Yes, sir. Okay. But now, but now, you know, the data I, we can't uh, consider as a, a scientific document because you, you have a small group and also there is no control group in this experiment. So how can we, uh, you know, take uh, the data you are showing here is a scientific document. Sir, uh, sir, I have, uh, sir, I have got example of uh, in my family member uh, uh, for my mama who was uh, suffering from COVID-19 and uh, for, uh, we didn't give him any uh, homeopathy medicine and he uh, hospitalized in the wait, wait, wait. Hello? Yeah, wait. Actually, COVID-19 cases, more than yes, more than 80% are non-symptomatic. Okay, yes. six uh, close to close close to fourteen percent are sy symptomatic. Means they have cough and fever and all. Okay, yes. only like uh, less than four percent people are severe COVID people. Yes. They they need uh, they actually they only have the suffocation and uh, you know breathing difficulty all things. Only four percent people are having. Okay, so systematically go inside. Okay, how many people you saw among them? What type of COVID that is? Is it asymptomatic or symptomatic or severe? What's the classification? And then uh, you, you have to apply whatever you have. You should have a control. We have, you should have an experimental group. All these things you have to complete. Then only we can consider okay, your work as a, a scientific document. Okay? Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Rajesh. Yes, sir. Yeah, next. Uh, next is Dr. C. Anchana Devi. Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Not able to press. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm making it present. Now we can share it. asking for some privacy sorry it's asking for some privacy restart go meeting all right then i think uh, it will be asking you to go to see us from mr welcome to turn on. welcome welcome <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay, it fixed there and come back. Yeah, okay. Thank Dr. you. Uh, Anjana Devi, you fix, you fix that problem, then come back. Dr. Yesam Fazila Mehabu Begum. Are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. 
Okay, I'm making as a presenter, share your screen now. Yes, sir, sure, thank you. Sir, uh, can you give me access? I already gave, like no, now you can open your PPT. No, I've restarted the, this thing, that's why again it's asking for permission. Oh, okay, are you the French now? Okay, okay. Uh, yes. I will call you next. Yeah, okay. Uh, go, for, go for presentation mode. Right. Yes, sir, thank you. A yeah, warm good evening to one and all. I'm Fazila, here to present my research work titled Evaluating the Efficiency of Phytocompounds from Geridelia acerosa in targeting the PA3K, AKT, GSK3 beta pathway in lung cancer. So to begin with, the possible inestral 3 kinases. So these are lipid kinases and they play a central role in the regulation of the cell cycle, apoptosis, DNA repair, senescence, angiogenesis, and cellular metabolism. So these act as intermediate signaling molecules and they play a major role in the regulation of the cell survival pathway, namely the PA3K, AKT, and the MTAR pathway. So what is that work? They transmit signals from the cell surface to the cytoplasm through the generation of the intermediate secondary molecules, namely the phosphoryl inestral biphosphates and the triphosphates. These in turn activate the AKT and which in turn activate the NF kappa B, the MTA, and the BCL XL, resulting in the survival of the cell, proliferation, and, meta and metabolism. On the other hand, when there is a deregulation of this PA3K pathway due to mutations or due to the deletion of its negative regulator, namely the P10, it, reads, it leads to the aberrant activation of the PA3K, which results in the increased expression of this pathway, which leads to the increased survival, proliferation, metabolism, and decreased apoptosis resulting in cancer. Hence, the deregulation of the PA3K leads to cancer and it is observed in one third of the human cancers, including the adenocarcinoma, the breast cancer, the glioblastoma. Hence, this deregulation of the PA3K has, has made the PA3K to be recognized as a viable target for the novel anti-cancer therapy. Hence, there emerged a group of drugs, namely the PA3K inhibitors, which function by inhibiting either the PA3K or its downstream components in the treatment of cancer. But these PA3K inhibitors are discontinued due to the toxicity in animals. Hence, the current study is focused in identifying a potent natural PA3K inhibitor without any adverse side effects from the marine red algae. So why I choose the marine algae? So marine algae are a rich, are rich in bioactive constituents with a unique structure which are entirely different from the terrestrial forms. Hence, the opportunity to discover fundamentally new class of drug agents or the lead molecules is highly promising. And 9% of the biomedical compounds from the marine sources are found in the algae. A brief classification, the marine algae can be classified into the macro and the micro algae. Among these, the macro algae includes the red algae, brown algae, and the green algae. And my study is focused in analyzing the red algae. So the major objectives to isolate and characterize the phytoconstraints from the selected marine alga to determine the anti-cancer activities of the crude extract under in silico, in vitro and in vivo conditions to determine the efficacy of the algal phytocompounds on the apoptotic and the cell survival pathway and to determine its toxicity. Based on these objectives, the marine red alga Gelidalia azirosa was selected for the current study. The overall workflow, the algae was collected from the Mandabam coast of Tamil Nadu and their sample was uh, deposited at CMFRI. The accession number is given here. After collection, the algae was shade dried and it was powdered. And the powder was used for sequential extraction with the following solvents. And the crude extracts were analyzed for the phytochemicals and the anti-cancer efficacy. Based on this preliminary examination, the ethylacid extract of the algae was chosen for further studies. It was subjected to characterization studies, toxicology analysis, anti-cancer activity, and the mechanism of action in apoptosis and the cell survival pathway was elucidated and in vitro and in vivo conditions. About the preliminary results, the phytochemical analysis of the algal extract showed the presence of various phytoconstituents except saponins and resins in all the crude extracts. 
Following this, the anti-cancer activity of the algal extracts was analyzed in the adenocarcinoma mass cell line A549. The cell lines were treated with 1000 mg per ml of the algal extracts and only the ethyl acid extract induced cytotoxicity. Based on this preliminary screening, the ethyl acid extract was chosen for further studies. Characterization study. The ethyl acid extract of the red algae was subjected to GCMS separation and the GCMS chromatogram showed the presence of 14 different compounds which were identified based on the NIST library search. So these compounds, they had a molecular weight ranging from 252 to 361. Once these compounds were analyzed, they were subjected to the in silico analysis by using the Sybil X1.3 as a docking suit and the interaction was visualized in PyMol. The results of the docking with the PA3K, the cell survival protein, showed that the, out of the 14 compounds, only six compounds interacted with the target protein, and this interaction occurred within the substrate binding domain and the ATP binding domain of the protein. Similarly, the compounds were docked with the AKT, and the results showed that only four algal compounds interacted with the AKT and these interactions were found in the inhibitor binding site and also in the hydrophobic pocket of AKT. So these interactions were compared with the PA3K inhibitors which were all, which also coincided with our results. Based on this, the toxicology analysis was carried out. So the toxicology analysis was carried out in the lab on chip technology. So mm -hmm. it's a novel platform to replace the animal models. Further, it enables a rapid screening of the compounds and also reduces the volume of compounds required. So this is the uh, these are the pathological screening of the lab on chip technology. So the cells from the brain, heart, liver, and the muscles, they were treated with 500 mg of the algal extract, and it was observed after 24 hours of incubation. The tissues done were compared with the control tissue chip. The tissues did not show any adverse changes. Hence, the algal extract was found to be safe within the animal models. And then about the in vitro studies, analysis of the anti-cancer activity. The ethyl acid extract of the red algae was analyzed for its viability um, in the normal lung cancer cell line, that's L132, and the adenocarcinoma cell line, A549. So the results of the MTT assay showed that a dosage of 1,500 mg per ml of the ethyl acid extract induced 50 percentage of cytotoxicity in the A54 and cell line, whereas the same concentration induced only 20 percentage of cell death. So these results showed that the ethyl acid extract is more cytotoxic to the adenocarcinoma cell line rather than the normal cell line. As cytotoxicity was observed, we then proceeded for the and for analyzing the hallmarks of apoptosis by using the fluorescent microscopy. The treated cells were stained with DAPI, propidium iodide, and annexin B. So the results showed that the DAPI staining showed that there was a fragmentation of the nucleus in the treated cell. Similarly, in propidium iodide staining, we could observe the crescent-shaped nucleus in the treated cell. Similarly, the annexin B staining showed the translocation of phosphoryl serine from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. So these results confirmed that the algal extract induces apoptosis in the treated cells. Apoptosis can be induced by either the extrinsic pathway or by the intrinsic pathway. And this extrinsic pathway involves the activation of caspase 8, whereas the intrinsic pathway involves the activation of caspase 3. So you know, uh, so the cells, the a cells were treated with the algal extract and the protein was isolated and analyzed by western blot. The results of the western blot analysis showed that there was an increased expression of the pro biotic factor Vax and there was a decreased expression of the BCL2 and BCLXL which are the anti apoptotic factors. So these results showed that there is an alteration of the Vax BCL2 ratio. And also, we observed a cleavage of the caspase 3 rather than the caspase 8. So these results proved that there is an activation of apoptosis through the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. So following this, we then analyzed the expression level of the glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. The results of the Western blot showed that 
there is an activation of the glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, whereas the inactive form, the phosphorylated form of GSK 3 beta was found to be downregulated. As GSK activation is directly dependent upon, on it on the PA3K and PAKT, we then analyze the expression level of the active PA3K and the active AKT. So these results showed that there is a down regulation in the expression of the phosphorylated PA3K and the phosphorylated AKT. Whereas the P so these results showed that the algal extract induced apoptosis through the down regulation of the pro survival genes, especially the PA3K and AKT. We then proceeded to the in vivo studies. The in vivo studies included the induction of tumor in the zebra fish. So, 5 mL of A549 cells was injected in the muscle region of the zebra fish, and the injection was given twice at the interval of 14 days. The fish were maintained for a period of 60 days, and the dissection was done to examine the development of tumors. And then the fish were divided into a control group, which, con which contains fishes. That is a tumor induced model, and other groups which contained six fishes each, and the fishes were treated with the ethyl acetate extract along with the fish pellet. So the dosages were 15 mg, 13 mg, and 60 mg per day. So the uh, results of the histopathology were based on the muscle pathology, the tumor anatomy, and the tumor pathology. So the results showed that the tumor induced model showed an yeah, altered muscle pathology swollen muscles, whereas the tumor which was treated, it showed a yeah, normal muscle pathology. And also the tumor anatomy of the tumor induced showed increased angiogenesis, whereas there were little angiogenesis in the treated model. Similarly, the number of lysing tumor cells in the treated cell, in the treated model was more, whereas the tumor cells were found in the tumor induced model. Following this, we analyze the expression of the apoptotic and the cell survival proteins in the tumor model. So these results showed that there is an upregulation in the expression of the Bax protein, whereas there is a downregulation in the expression of the BCL2, that is an apoptotic protein. Similarly, the activation of GSK3 beta was observed, followed by a downregulation expression of the active form of P3K, that is a phosphorylated P3K and the phosphorylated AKT. So these results showed that the treatment with the algal extract downregulated the expression of BCL2 and also the and also the phosphorylation of PA3K and AKT. So these results of the in vivo study correlated with our in vivo data. So this is the overall mechanism by which the compounds present in the algal extract act or to regulate the PA3K the AKT, the GSK3 beta, and the expression of BATS, BCL2, and CASP3, this promoting apoptosis. So, as uh, so, I would like to conclude that Gildelia acerosa is a source of phytocompounds with anti-cancer activity. So, these compounds inhibit the proliferation of the lung cancer cells both under in vitro and in vivo conditions. Similarly, these compounds induce apoptosis by the activation of the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis and also they inhibit the activation of the PA3K and AKT. That way, they also prevent the inactivation of GSK3 beta. Hence, these compounds can be considered as lead molecules for the development of PA3K or the AKT inhibitors from marine origin. As, this, as these compounds were not found to be toxic, current therapies can be developed which can be used to overcome the toxicity induced by the P3K inhibitors. Further, the economic burden imposed by cancer on the human society can be reduced as these compounds are from the natural sources. Finally, the marine red algae Gelderlia acerosa is a source of novel P3K inhibitors which can be effectively used in the management of lung cancer. Thank you. Yeah, from which college, which university you are from? Sir, I have done my research at a Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, sir. Where is it? At Mandalore, Chennai, sir. Okay. And, um, you know, you took uh, algae and you studied only GCMS. Uh, so, wait, so. No, sir. Only the crude extract I have analyzed by GCMS. So just to identify uh, what are the compounds in the uh, in the yeah. algal extract. Yeah, but if you want to understand the thorough uh, compound profile, 
uh, LCMS may be better. This is for volatile compounds, right? GCMS is for volatile compounds. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, I have done the isolation compounds also from this extract and we have characterized them uh, but i have not uh, but i have not presented those data here just the activity of the crude extract alone i have shared here sir. okay the uh, interaction uh, data the compound with yes, uh, the protein interaction that should be above yeah. minus uh, uh, seven okay the sir, data the value should be above, above uh, uh, Minus seven, but this is close to six point something, right? Minus six point something. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, I have used this. Uh, so there, the values are displayed only in uh, Mostly, the range it starts from five, five to ten. It is a good docking score in Sybil. Actually, uh, if you see and uh, um, if you want to collect the information. Should be above above seven. That that will be nice, uh, okay. you know, docking data. Uh, you know, the, okay. as per the uh, reports. And one more thing, okay, you okay. you have uh, the PDF file. Uh, you did GCMS, then uh, you identify the compound. Then how did you get the PDF file? Uh, so from uh, right. PDB, we can download no sir. From PDB, I have yeah, got yeah. the uh, protein data. Yeah, the PDB. I got the actually PDP, the, the the file for the docking the structural file the PDP file you have to have uh, from the experiment data for example NMR or like um, X-ray diffraction uh, you have to get and then uh, the uh, file will be generated actually okay. the real uh, uh, structural information uh, will be there so from the empirical okay. formula. Uh, use, using ChemDraw, you, we also can generate the PDF file. Yes, yes, sir. We have done that, sir. We have used ChemDraw. Yeah. So which type of which? Uh, you know, uh, do you know? Uh, have you uh, completed the three D structure of uh, the compound, the active compounds you are working now? Have you generated yes. al already yes. the three D three D structure? Yes, sir. We have generated, and uh, those How? compounds are patented, sir. How did you generate that uh, 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 3D structure of the compound? Sir, we have done uh, NMR analysis, then we went for depth NMR analysis. And then based on the depth NMR analysis only, we predicted the uh, structure of the compound. And then those compounds, I didn't refer here, sir. So how many atoms are there in that compound? Uh, sir, uh, like um, it had 16, at, uh, 16 carbon. Mm. And uh, uh, actually, the structure will be more or less similar to what man in sir. More like or similar to several rings. What man in the P3 K inhibitor? Okay, so uh, 16 carbon. Then how many oxygen? How many? How many uh, hydrogen? Hello. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Rajesh? Yes, sir. Hello? I don't know what, what happened. I think this paper she had published in uh, 2018. Hello, sir. They already published? In 2018, uh, okay. BMC complementary and alternative medicine. I have that paper with me. Okay, okay. okay. She had published with along with the Kalai Chitra and Hamalata. Okay, LED okay. And give it lung case application. That's the paper she had published. Yeah. I don't know the whether she's uh, the same thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's the PDP structure for such a big compounds, NMR alone is not enough. We can't okay. predict. Okay, the X-ray diffraction is important. Otherwise, uh, the docking won't be, uh, you know, correct. And that's one uh, from my side. Then uh, 
criticism uh, you know we have to give the uh, drug to the animal and we can see what happened for example fish or some, some other yes. animal we have to give and, and we have to see you know what happened whether they can survive or not and also the dose uh, you know the minimum dose and the maximum dose for the effectiveness they should be uh, found out using some zebra fish or some other animal they have to do i think she is not there I means yeah yeah some problem yes some so so okay. it was published in 2018 right. that's why uh, right. okay okay yeah okay. thank you sir next next presenter uh, dr rajesh kumar are there dr rajesh kumar dr rajesh kumar excuse me sir can i proceed if it's not an issue this is dr anshana what's your name anshana sir the previous presenter i had some technical problem okay okay uh, i think done thank you sir i able to see my screen sir am i audible are you able to see my screen yes 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 thank yes, you, yes. Thank you. so good evening one and all and uh, uh, today my uh, presentation topic is on microbiome and cervical cancer a review study Uh, so as life science students uh, we are very much aware of this term microbiome on and off in the recent decades uh, and today also we have a wonderful talk by dr wilson who was talking about this human microbiome so uh, according to my uh, area of research is on women reproductive health so i thought i would combine uh, and give an aspect of this microbiome how it influences the cervical cancer as i said with dr anshana So just an introduction. I am just not going to run the entire thing. So human microbiome is an artificial microorganism which colonizes different parts of our body. And the term was coined by Lederberg in the year 2001. So the human body, as such, it's mainly made up of microbiome, and we provide a proper environment for these organisms to grow and provide a beneficial aspect for us. So uh, if you see the microbiome map. uh we have different organs uh, colonized by uh, different types of microbes uh, where some may be dominant uh, in certain regions of the body whereas the other regions it might be uh, less so pertaining to the cervical cancer the vaginal region and the cervix region of the women it is mandatory it is uh, dominated by lactobacillus species so as we talk about women health so women uh, as they go uh, into different stages of development start starting from infancy uh, to an elderly women or a centenary women they cross they have a different types of cycle at each and every stage uh, which is influenced or controlled by uh, different hormonal activities so depending upon that the microbial diversity also varies in each stage of the women uh so pertaining to the cervical cancer it is a major concern for women health during the late 20s and 30s uh it it is the predisposing factor of for uh, many other uh, uh, diseases as well so cervical cancer is considered to be the fourth common most cancer worldwide it is due to poor sexual behavior sexual hygiene frequent use of contraceptive pills multiple sexual partners smoking drinking etc and the incidence counts about 569000 569000 and uh, uh, the death accounts for 311000 according to the global con report worldwide every year and uh, it is the causative organism is human papilloma virus uh, and it is classified into uh, 200 different strains and we have major two groups is the high risk hpv and the low risk hpv uh, among the high risk hpv hpv 16 and 18 strain are the main reasons for the cause of cervical cancer so we wonder where the cervix is cervix is nothing but the 
uh, mouth of the uterus where it is mainly made up of two parts ectocervix and endocervix the eto ectocervix is made up of granular cells whereas the endocervix they are made up of squamous cells and there is a trans a transformation zone where these two cells meet up and actually the cancer starts developing in the transformation zone if initially it can be a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia but later on it may even take up to 10 years for this neoplasia to turn into a, a cancerous cell so the change from the normal to a malignant cell we call it as a technical term as dysplasia so a small intro about the hpv genome on the right corner you can see the same image of the hpv uh, uh, virus which is circular non-enveloped and it has a double standard uh, dna as its genome and it is made up of nearly 8000 bases it has got uh, early proteins late proteins and regulatory uh, genes sorry early, pro early genes late genes and regulatory genes the early genes are involved in transcription and replication process of the virus whereas the late genes uh, uh, carry out the transcription process for the capsid protein and the regulatory genes are the ones which control the transcription and uh, establishment of this uh, cancerous condition by expression of these oncoprotein, especially E6 and E7. So coming to the cervical vaginal microbiome, uh, so according to the study, according to the study of Rabel J. et al. 2011, they almost uh, uh, did a study uh, using the vaginal flora of 396 women from different ethnicities and they classified this community state types. CST stands for community state types and they classified into five state types where in each state type uh, each uh, lactobacillus is very much predominant. In state one uh, lactobacillus cryptosis, in state two uh, lactobacillus gesseri, in state three lactobacillus in nurse, in state uh, CST five lactobacillus in and uh, in state four there is no dominance of lactobacillus whereas it is like dominant so, uh, how this lactobacillus, as we know, the vaginal environment is highly acidic and it is predominant with the lactobacillus uh, organism. So, how it happens is due to the thick vaginal epithelium and thick mucus layer and due to the high levels of estrogen and the glycogen, this lactobacillus is capable of thriving by producing lactic acid where it maintains the pH of the vagina of approximately within 3.5 to 4.5. So as such, it discourages the potential pathogen, colonization of potential pathogen like Candida and Gardenella, Vaginalis and E. coli. So if in a healthy woman, we can see the group 1, group 2 and group 5 uh, lactobacillus being predominant. Whereas in a transitional state between a healthy and a disease state or a development of cancer, initially it is indicated by CST group 3, which is dominated by lactobacillus inners and uh, group um, which is non-lactobacillus dominant, which is predominant with the uh, with the anaerobic bacteria. So uh, there are more, two main reasons for this uh, um, dysbiosis, which we call the reduction in the lactobacillus or the acidic condition in the vaginal environment. So one thing is host um, host defense alteration, and the second one is oxidative stress um, and cervical alteration. So the figure tells about uh, these are the host uh, uh, factors which help in maintaining the pH to 3.5 to 4.5 like production of lactic acid with the high amount of lactobacillus or the thick mucosa layer which produces different types of molecules like defenses, antimicrobial peptides and other compounds uh, like uh, secretory leukocyte protease inhibitor which maintains the pH and uh, inhibits the colonization of uh, pathogenic microorganisms. So once when this dysbiosis happens by interrupting either the production, either the number of the lactobacillus is less, so the production of lactic acid becomes uh, less, so the pH move towards the neutral condition. So in such cases, uh, uh, the com community state types of three and four lactobacillus is seen to be predominant. So this was uh, uh, actually uh, published by the sign uh, by a uh, paper uh, in Petrova MI Italy in 2017, where they studied a group of people and they told uh, and they reported that the CST3 and CST4 were major uh, type of CST which was found in women with four infections. So one of the striking feature of the CST3 uh, lactobacillus inners is it, it can produce a cytotoxin called as inerolose uh, inerolysin 
uh, which modulates the immune response and activates the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and other type of uh, chemotactic factors, which actually leads to the development of the cancerous lesion in the cervix. So as there is HPV infection, the two main strains, HPV 16 and 17, it can uh, uh, trigger the production of the cytokines and causes immunosuppression and results in dysplasia, converting the normal cells into a uh, malignant cells. Or on the other hand, it can uh, lead to oxidative damage, the production of ROS, uh, some, uh, like the um, um, superoxide radicals like oxygen, hydrogen peroxide or hydroxyl radical. Uh, which in turn uh, damages the cell. The HPV very much integrates with the cell genome and in case uh, it activates the uh, expression of this E6 and E7, which is an oncogene and uh, 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 results in a profuse uh, cell proliferation and inhibits apoptosis. So these are the two basic mechanisms which can predispose the infection of HPV and develop them into a cervical cancer. So can this microbiomes can be used as a yearly deduction for cervical cancer. So it's, it's not that every woman who is infected with HPV can get a, a cervical cancer. So there are certain factors where it requires a persistent cervical infection by HPV is necessary for the women to develop into a, a develop a, a cervical cancerous lesion. So the fact, certain factors like cervicitis, uh, pelvic inflammatory uh, disease or bacterial vaginosis uh, irrespective of the symptom status or severity of the infection can uh, cause higher incidence of cervical lesions or vi viral infection. So the current diagnostic technique is you are taking a pap smear of the cervical tissue uh, based on the Nugnet score. We uh, classify them as uh, non-infected. Uh, in, that is normal score of zero to three uh, represents normal, four to six is intermediate, and uh, seven to 10 is severe infection. So nowadays we have real-time PCR, semi-quantitative and multiplex real-time PCR, which are more highly sensitive and highly specific in picking up the HPVs. And uh, one study which was reported by WHO in 2017, where they used the CST community state uh, types as biomarkers to predict the outcome of the pregnancy. So they studied uh, in a women, uh, uh, they, uh, they reported, uh, the women who had CST3 group and 4 group um, had a problematic pregnancy, whereas the other group, they had a very healthy pregnancy. So in this study, they have used this uh, CST as a um, biomarker. So the same, uh, same thing, where whether these uh, microbiome profiles or the CSTs can be used as a uh, prediction, yearly deduction of the cervical cancer is yet to be explored. And coming to the probiotic option, so when we talk about these infections, obviously we know that the antibiotics are the much preferred one to control the uh, infection. But uh, 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 controlling the infection can also lead to the dysbiosis of the normal flora. So in this context, uh, the use of probiotics, which are like microorganisms, especially the group of lactobacillus, can be used for proper rest restoration of the vaginal or cervical microbiota. So there was one study which was reported uh, uh, they used uh, probiotics along with the antibiotics for uh, restoring the uh, normal flora and uh, they could see a clearance of clearance rate and even the psychologically abnormality clearance was reported in the uh, probiotic group when compared to the control group. So always when we talk about microbiome, there is a question like whether the gut microbiome is related yeah, to... Too long time. Madam, you yes. are taking too long time. You have to cut short. I'll wind up, sir. That's it, sir. So always there's a, there is only one study which reported that the, that microbiome modulates the estrogen levels, which uh, causes this cervical cancer. So there are future challenges like uh, decoding the functions, uh, studying about um, uh, the understanding about the research of the microbiome in women health is least explored and influence on gut microbiome and development of cervical cancer needs to be studied. And the mechanism is not yet properly understood. And there is always challenges of doing this high uh, throughput screening and data analysis uh, as to be uh, further explored, even though we have to, so many pipelines and softwares available recently. So to conclude, so further vaginal microbiome signatures need to be explored and standardized according to ethnicity and correlated with the biomarkers to understand the role of CST in predetermining the risk of HPV infected women who are vulnerable to develop into CIN or progress into CC. So thank you, sir, and thank you, organizers, and my fellow participants for patient listening. Thank you, sir. 
So totally, how many uh, papers did you read for uh, the review? Uh, almost actually this uh, uh, I prepared as a review paper, which was already uh, almost like 60 uh, references, uh, more than 60 references. Uh, have you ca completed the writing part? Yes, sir. I've completed the writing part. So, so where do you uh, aim for this uh, review? Uh, I'm trying to send it to our uh, book, sir. What? Our uh, book, uh, conference book, sir. Okay, you can publish in a journal. Yes, sir. If it is a good work, if it is a good work, it will be published. Okay, okay, sir, definitely, sir. So, what's your recommendation now? So, as such, uh, the main uh, conclusion here is uh, the uh, these microbiome can be used as biomarkers based on the CST. So, uh, actually, when the infection starts, the patient or the women uh, she develops cancer. It takes nearly ten years. So when there is a change in the CST, we can really diagnose whether the women is uh, vulnerable to the uh, possibility of developing into cancer. So that is one main thing. And the second main thing is whether the gut microbiome has a far more influence uh, in uh, changing this role of CST between the CST3 and CST4, which are considered to be the causes for developing cervical cancer. So we have to study the okay. You know, you are talking too much. You know, <laughs> cut short, cut short your uh, uh, so time taken. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have one question. Yes, sir. So uh, there are several uh, gut microbial components, you know, which are produced by microbes. The metabolites of uh, gut microbes, they yes, reach sir. brain, has been, yes, uh, they, they have been uh, confirmed, okay, in many studies. Is there any study? you know, uh, have uh, confirmed the gut uh, uh, metabolites, microbial metabolites reaching the cerv cervical area? Uh, there was only one paper by Wang Vital, sir, which uh, actually uh, uh, showed the influence of gut microbiome on um, the cervical cancer development, but there is no specific information on the metabolites produced by the gut microbiome. But uh, he told the change in the gut microbiome can influence uh, the CST in the vaginal region. Okay, which uh, system may be good for uh, addressing this issue? The metabolites uh, enrichment, gut metabolite entry enrichment in the cervical area. Which uh, organism or which animal will be the best to study? Which animal we study? Um, I am not sure about it, sir. I mean, rather than animal, because these are human samples, directly we do a uh, metabolite uh, study. So now they are using uh, to restore the vaginal. This thing they are using vaginal tablets, sir. Probiotic vaginal tablets are being used. The metabolites uh, sequestration from the gut to cervical area. Uh, you know the, uh, that area looks like uh, it's like, like no. Yes. You yes. know that that area should be enriched. So which are uh, a model system may be the best. That I want to understand. Yeah, I'm not sure about it, sir. Maybe I can check and get back to you, sir. Model system regarding the model system. Okay, is there any link between papilloma viral uh, cancer and uh, the gut microbial uh, cancer? You know, is there any uh, link between them? Uh, gut microbial cancer, uh, I don't think so, sir, because human papilloma virus, even though you have many 200 states, only 16 and 18 is being reported to cause a cancer in cervical region, where it is not reported, I guess it is not reported to cause cancer in gut region. Okay, the last question from my side. You know, H. pyroli uh, yes. is a cancer-inducing bacteria in the stomach. Yes. Okay, H. pyroli, you know that organism? It's a yes, cancer sir. inducing bacteria in the uh, stomach. Ulcer in okay. the ulcer. Yeah, well, okay. initially cause cancer, then eventually to cancer. Okay. H. Yes, pyroli. Sir. And uh, now, is there any organism in cervical area that can induce cancer? A particular bacteria can induce cancer. Is there any such report? HPV alone, sir. HPV alone. Yeah, yeah, that's virus. I'm talking about uh, bacteria. Um, uh, no, sir. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, 
pertaining to cervical cancer only uh, uh, study this hpv sir it's not specifically any type okay. of bacteria uh, probably okay. it can be addressed with sexually transmitted diseases by uh, gardnerella species uh, petronella species etc but it is not proved to cause a cancer it may okay. have a role in okay thank you yeah, yeah thank, thank you i'm done thank you thank you sir Hello, sir. Yeah, Rajesh. 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 Chibus Promin, sir. Rajesh, what happened? <laughs> Hello? Rajesh. Hello? Okay, who is the next presenter? Sir, uh, this is Ambar Gupta. I technically, uh, sir, I am very yeah. apologize for the technical fault. Last time I could not uh, present uh, my presentation, so I would like to present. May I allow yeah, to yeah, present my? Go. Yeah, I understand. You go ahead. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. So this is Ambar Gupta from Institute of Life Sciences. As previously, I have introduced myself. So my work is related to the regulatory role of the calcium ion for augmenting the salinity tolerance mechanism in the rice. So salinity stress is mainly composed with the different kind of the metal ion which harmfully mm -hmm. attack to the plant growth. Generally, the salinity is concerned with to the sodium metal ion, sodium ion into the plant system where it creates the uh, negativity onto the plant growth as well as the death of the plant. Salt, mainly the NaCl, affects the plant in the two ways. First, it accumulates into the cytoplasm where it where it inhibits the mechanism of the enzyme activity because it mimics to the many other cations, the monovalent cations. And secondly, when its concentration becomes to be higher, the water potential becomes decreased. That's why the plant cannot take the water from the soil to the plant system. It is also reported that how the plant become to be saline. Plant has to be saline tolerant when it has to be retained the higher ratio of to the sodium potassium by sodium ion means sodium ion has to be retained lower in the shoot tissue comparison to the potassium ion. potassium ion. this is the feature of the salt on it already reported so the concentration of the sodium ion is minimized by to the antipoter which is actually the sos1 as well as the another antipoter in the vacuolar system which is the uh, uh, which is the nhx which is also reported in many plants and species but these antipoters depend upon to the primary transporter so there are two kind of the transporter which helps to minimize to the plant salt toxicity. Primary transporter exflex the proton pumps ion out of to the cellular, cellular uh, moiety as well as into the cytoplasm also by the vacuolar S plus ATPase pumps decreates the proton ion gradient and that gradient is utilized by to the antiporter to efflex the sodium ion out of to the cell and whatever the side uh, whatever the sodium ion is present into the cytoplasm it gets accumulated into the vacuolar system so this is the mechanism one of the mechanism how this uh, plant system regulate to the salt toxicity now coming to the uh, main objective of my this work which is already published in the plant biology willy publication the molecular characterization of the affected proteins or genes found to be highly essential for the salt tolerance process regulated by the calcium signaling so this is very uh, observed kind of the question that was how the calcium is regulating the so many pathways which is not being understood so in this work what we have done we have already published one another paper in last year that how the plasma membrane s plus atp is getting accelerated in uh, in presence of the salinity stress in particularly the salt salt tolerant variety for the root treated tissue comparison to the soil sensitive variety so tolerant variety we have taken about to the nona gopra and sensitive variety we have taken about to the ir64 for this present work so how this plasma membrane is is also linked to the cipk24 which is also called as to be sos2 the regulatory of to the many of the primary transporter and antiporter and 1433 which actually helps to dimerize to the plasma membrane sos atps pump for their activation so coming to this objective, so this is one of the pictorial picture that how we have grown up our plant in the hydroponic system. So all the experiment is done into the hydroponic condition and the experimental condition was decided in the vegetative phase of the growth. Five to seven age of the seedling was imposed on the stress. And this is the uh, this is the one of the scene where I can show that calcium negative and calcium upper uh, uh, calcium supplemented plant. There is no drastic effect into the change in the plant height and plant uh, uh, 
plant growth. So this is very short time of period where we have manipulated the calcium ion in a very least concentration and calcium ion supplemented into the very higher concentration. And what, what we have done in our experiment, we just negative out, we just completely washed out the calcium ion before 12 hours stress period of the salt esters. So before imposing the salt esters, we have omitted the calcium ion from one slot and we have supplemented 10 times more calcium ion in the calcium supplemented plant. So all the experiment is proceeded in coming slide. So this is one of the picture what, why we have chosen the cultivar Nona Booker and Pokali. Pokali is very much popular in the coastal area as well as it is also a well popularized cultivar in Carol area where it is uh, that is considered as a salt tolerant cultivar. So the Nona Bukra IR64 I29 we have taken. So this is the IC50 draft where we have done the analysis in the 72 hour salt hour, salt stress, imposed salt stress at the gradient concentration of the 50, uh, no, not 50, that is 85. Uh, 150, then 256 and 352 millimolar, and we have measured the height of to the shoot length based upon to the decrement to the base of the height length in the time period of the 72 hours. We have decided the uh, dose of the IC50 estimation, and based upon this IC50 dose value, this is for the Nona Bukra 305 millimolar of the salt stress, uh, like Bukali and other cultivar. We have again set up the plant in that particular condition for the 72 hours, and we found that yes, IC50 value is totally correct where we have gotten about to the 50 percent reduction into the height line nearby to the 50 percent reduction so this is just as a uh, uh, as a kind of say that the simple approach to determine to the salinity stress limit of of the any rice because vegetative stress is highly sensitive at a particular uh, rice vegetative stress is very sensitive to the salt stress. so this is one of the methodology we have introduced and we have published in the crop and partial science general in the sister general this technique can be used as a primary level of the screening before proceeding to the molecular and high throughput technique. So this is the time saving as well as the cost saving technique. So based upon the selection, we have proceeded our experiment in the IR64 with a salt uh, sensitive cultivar, but it is a high yielding variety, while as the Nona Bokra is a salt tolerant cultivar. So what this diagram is says is the control NACL. These two uh, paragraph, first and second, is without calcium ion supplemented plant. And this is 10 times more supplementation into the uh, plant system. So what we have seen here that sodium ion concentration is getting to be highly induced in the root of the IR64 as well as into the uh, in the in this uh, diagram is this is the control this is the IR64 uh, sodium ion content in without the calcium supplementation but with the calcium supplementation the sodium ion is not accumulating similarly in the shoot tissue you can find that so uh, in in calcium in capsules of the calcium the sodium ion is accumulating is much higher in this diagram but in case of the Nona Bukra, now you can see the decrement of to the sodium ion uptake is happening much in good way from the IR64 root bar tissue in presence of calcium. Similarly, into the Nona Bukra of the shoot tissue, the calcium ion is, uh, calcium ion is inhibiting the transport of to the sodium ion from the root to shoot in presence of calcium. The good behavior you can see the how the calcium ion is implementing the and inhibiting the transport of the sodium ion from the root to shoot tissue. So coming to the next slide. So now this is the potassium by sodium ratio. So you can see the potassium by sodium ratio in absence of the calcium ion and in presence of the calcium ion, it is retaining much in higher for the IR64 for the Nona Bukra. You can see here that in absence of the in absence of the calcium ion and in the presence of the calcium ion, the potassium by sodium ratio is also uptake. So somehow the calcium is actually uh, supporting the role of to the potassium ion uptake. So coming to the uh, plasma membrane explicit TPAs activities. So plasma membrane explicit TPAs, why we have taken? Because in functional plant biology paper, we have deciphered the mechanism of the S plasma membrane explicit TPAs, which is highly active in presence of the salt stress compared to other primary transporter, vacuolar explicit TPAs in the pyrophosphatase pump. So what we have found out here, when we supplemented to the plant without calcium and with calcium and what we have got it here, that in absence of the calcium and the activity of the plasma membrane explicit Piece is not inducing much. Uh, and it is also getting down regulated into the salt stress condition. So this bar graph is second bar graph of the root of IR64 is actually the down regulated. But in apps, but in presence of to the uh, but in presence of the calcium ion, the activity is getting to be induced. But it is not up to the mark for the IR64 because IR64 is highly salt sensitive cultivar. But what is happening into the IR? Uh, but is what is going upon to the uh, salt tolerant cultivar? Salt tolerant cultivar Nona Bukra is induced. Uh, 
induced in for the root tissue because root is the primary defense line where the plasma membrane as the CTPAs is upregulated highly comparison to the shoot tissue. So you can see the changes of to the S plus ATPase activity from this DC uh, from the second bar graph of to the root of Lonabucra in presence of the calcium and also applicable for to the shoot tissue. So now coming to the Western blot issue. So the Western blot, why I'm telling to, about to the Western blot, because several studies have been proposed that uh, plasma membrane SPLCTPase constitutive expression doesn't help to be make the plant to be made, become to be tolerant. So what we have done about to the phospho 309 pattern, we have looked into that one. So phospho 309 pattern, if you see the phospho 309 pattern in absence of the calcium ion, this the first bar is the control then treated, and second, the third four plane is the control and treated without calcium ion. And the rest four, last four is the control treated with calcium, and the uh, this is control treated with with with, with calcium into the nona uh, root tissue. So this is sorry, so this is for the shoot tissue first panel, and the second is to the root tissue. You can find clearly the difference about to the phospho 309 level is to be higher because without phospho 309 phosphorylation plasma membrane s plus atps get get not to be upregulated so in summary i can say uh, this is also applicable for to the root tissue so in summary i can say the phospho 309 already reported is a key activator of the plasma membrane s plus atps but none of the group in up to the till date have presented that calcium ions in influencing the phospho 309 active activity or you can say about to the serine 309 kinase which is uncharacterized is still in rice it is actually stimulating the phosphorylation of the plasma membrane s plus atps phosphorylation that's why the pump is active several reports has already published in uh, past two uh, nine past seven to eight years back how the phospho 309 uh, 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 phosphorylation of the plasma membrane S plus ATPs is helpful for to the uh, for helpful for the S plus ATPs activity under to the salt stress. So this uh, this thing we have shown here. Now coming to the relative expression of the CIPK24. CIPK24 is already reported as to be salt tolerant uh, marker, which is SOS2, and SOS2 is the regulatory system for the SOS1. So we have taken about to the one SIPK24 isoform in absence of the calcium ion you can see there is no control bar this is only for to the stress uh, stress without calcium and stress and imposed with the calcium ion uh, in, with uh, under salinity stress so you can find the difference in between these two bar graph where you can find that with presence of the calcium the expression of the cipk24 is induced up in root as well as shoot for the ir64 for the salt tolerant cultivar it is much up regulated up to the two fold changes so this is also here we have tried to attempted to show how the calcium has in influencing the CIPK24 level of expression in the root as well as the shoot of both the cultivar IR64 and Nona Pokra. So coming to the 1433 expression, I'm not going to be much in detail, but I am summarizing the data. Similarly with the CIPK24, 1433B, 1433C, 1433F, which are actually the uh, actually recognized as a salt tolerant marker and we have done the analysis in absence and presence of calcium all the isoforms is getting up regulated in presence of the calcium and supplemented into the root tissue as well as the shoot tissue for the nona bukra as well as ir64 and the, for the nona bukra the expression pattern of the 1433 1433 protein all the isoform is much up regulated comparison to the ir64 which is the salt sensitive so in summary uh, with summarization of this work so what about the response of the effector and regulator to the nacl stress in presence of calcium so what is happening if you imposing the NaCl stress when the plant is grown without the in presence of the calcium the activity is getting to be upregulated expression of the CIPK24 is get to be higher 1433p protein gene expression is getting upregulated but and plants show low accumulation of sodium and this is the required character for plant to become a tolerant plant what about in absence of calcium the activity is weakly upregulated CIPK expression is weakly induced as well as 1433 expression is weakly up regulate weakly up regulated and plants show high accumulation of sodium ion so these are the two features which is contrasting we have got in our analysis before to this we have done so many work in the functional plant biology but this work we have published in the uh, plant biology really publication just this year so conclusion the ic50 dose estimation conclude the salt tolerance limit for analyzed rice cultivar Enzyme activity result concluded that tolerant cultivar Nona Bukra shows higher activity for the plasma membrane S plus ATPase compared to the IR64 salt sensitive variety. The 
calcium ion imparts the antagonistic effect of to the sodium ion toxicity through ion transporter. A study has already been shown that affected protein where sodium ion is found much higher into the uh, much uh, much uh, inhibited into the shoot tissue in presence of the calcium ion. So the calcium ion is helping to minimize the transport of to the sodium ion from root to shoot. And this is the required and mandatory characteristics for the plant to be become a tolerant how the calcium ion is inhibiting the sodium ion uh, transportation from root to shoot this mechanism is not known but this is ensured that so salt tolerant cultivars in uh, accumulate much higher concentration of the sodium in their root tissue comparison to the shoot tissue vice versa is applicable for to the salt sensitive because in salt sensitive sodium ion easily getting transported from the root to shoot that's why it become to be salt sensitive and Inhibition of the sodium ion in the transportation in the shoot tissue is much required for becoming a tolerant plant uh, for, for any species. So I'm, I'm acknowledged to my director, ILS, who was the former director of the uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Dr. B. Pisha, who is my guide, DST Nai Delhi for my Inspire Fellowship, and RCB Faridabad, which is a DBT institution for my present, uh, for my uh, uh, PhD registration, Mark Bautry for giving us the antibody from the uh, University of Lavian, Kashik Shar, Kashik uh, Chakrabarti, sir, from NRI Qatar for facilitating the, giving the facility of the iron content, and DC Marandi, sir, for giving us the seed material, and my all lab mates and my all friends. Thank you for your patience for listening. I would be happy to receive any question if you have any question to ask. Okay. So, is it any possibility for supplementing uh, uh, the calcium rich uh, uh, manure for the rice? Uh, sir, calcium rich manure already soil uh, contains so many calcium. Ion. But the problem is what? That in soil condition, there is a chelation of the ions as well as the combination with the other organic compounds. So it would be, it is not very easy to take about to the calcium always uh, in the mineral form from the soil condition. So why we have done so far? Because we have done our experiment in the hydroponic. In hydroponic condition, if you add the so if you add anything beneficial or harmful, it would be easily taken up by to the plant. There is no competition at all with any other kind of the uh, uh, disturbance or whatever present into the soil. So people have reported that if you supplemented the calcium and into the soil field, it would take to be uh, it would it would be easy for to be salt. To, uh, it would be easy for the glycophytes plant. Basically, the plants which are glycophytes are actually the soil sensitive and rice is a glycophyte. Okay, so now, it, it, okay, it's, now, it's easy for the soil wait, to wait. become tolerant. You know, hello. Try to try yes. to answer in a crisp. Okay, we have a lot of uh, you know participants, right? All should talk. I understand. You know, yes. crisply how to answer. Okay. Now okay. the another question: uh, the genetically modified organisms are nowadays not uh, uh, in favor. Okay. So people are against uh, the modified or modified plants and uh, uh, those things. Okay. So uh, how we can implement implement all those things? Till now in India, there is no permission to go for the trial of the genetically improved plant. Only the genetics yeah, and plant I'm breeding. Thinking. The breeding program was only for that program. So in our work, we have not done any transgenic race. Okay. We have just shown the effect of the calcium ion directly inhibiting the sodium ion inhibition. So there is no other work is related to the transgenic, but this is the answer that in India, we cannot do the transgenic trial in the field. In US, you can do, but in India, you cannot do it. So in how, how, how my question is, how, yes. how will you implement all those knowledge then? Uh, in uh, means how I can promote to the government to per give permission to for the trial. Like, no, do you, I'm, I'm your you have some data, right? Yeah. You have some data, but uh, yeah. you know, uh, only way we have to genetically modify the plant, then it will be all right. Otherwise, how will yeah. you uh, you know improve improve? Uh, the plant. I'm sir, I'm I'm talking. I can understand. Through this work, I can say the transgenic should be made where it can lead to the calcium ion uptake in much higher uh, rate comparison to the normal plant. So that uh, okay. that paper and that suggestion I can write to the uh, proper authority of the government of India and for, for taking the permission for the field trial, especially for the coastal area where the plant is drastically affected by the salt stress and the crop plants. If it is permitted, then I can go forward. If it is not permitted, then I cannot help to anything. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Sivas Prumne, sir, do you have any question? Sivas Prumne, uh, sir. No, 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 sir, you have asked a lot of questions and we are running short of time. Okay. You have to yeah, yeah, sure. Go yeah, uh, Rajesh, yeah. next. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for patient business. Yeah, thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Ah. Rajesh. Rajesh. Dr. Kumar. Rajesh. Dr. Rajesh Kumar. Dr. Rajesh Kumar. Inachi Rajesh K. Yeah, next person there, please. Yes, sir, I'm here. Uh, yo, what's your okay. name? Okay. Sir, my name is Hello. Yes, share your screen now. Yes, sir. Others kindly keep your mic muted because it's disturbing. Sir, I am Dr. Navin. Sir, just yes, keep sir. your mic muted. Yes, sir, sir. Can I start, yes, sir? Yes, I know. It's like when I call you, you just that time you can turn on your mic. Now keep your mic muted. Hello. Hello? Yes, yes, go ahead, Rajesh Kumar. Yes, yes, okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank Ten you. Good evening. Ten Good evening, judges, uh, Dr. Ram, sir, and all the uh, uh, presenter and the jury. The topic of uh, my review paper is an update of coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 current status and future prospectives. Now uh, I introduce that in December 2019 in Wuhan in China an outbreak of pneumonia symptomatized by fever, dry cough, fatigue and occasional gastrointestinal symptoms was revealed. A novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, was isolated by inoculation of branchioalveolar lavage flu taken from these pneumonia patients. This disease was named COVID-19 by WHO. In the successive month, uh, thousands of people in various provinces of China and uh, in city in China were invaded by the unchecked spread of this disease. After that, this disease traveled to other countries almost throughout the world. Coronaviruses belong to family coronaviridae. They are positive single stranded RNA enveloped viruses. Uh, there are four genera of uh, uh, coronaviruses alpha, okay, beta, okay. gamma, and. So these yes, stories, sir? like, you know, everybody knows. Like, these things, everybody yes, knows. Like, you no, know, go go further. Go further. Okay, it's sir? okay. It's like, we know these things. Everyone knows these things. Like, no, go, go ahead. Like, Okay, Go sir. to your literature studies, show your results, all those things. Sir, uh, I am presenting review paper, not research paper. This is not my research paper. It's okay. Research. How like this how? is review? Yeah. Hello. What is what is the objective of your what is the objective of this review? Sir, I reviewed many paper and uh, take abstract from uh, them about uh, uh, pathogenesis and treatment of. Uh, I can COVID-19 properly. The voice is so low. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I could hear you properly. Your voice is so feeble. Okay, sir. I am um, I am speaking loudly now. Uh, from where I, I should start now, sir? Hello? Yeah, I couldn't hear you properly. Keep your mic close to your mouth and talk. Hello, can you hear, sir? Now you are hearing, sir? Yeah, little better, little better, but still is low. Uh, sir, I am uh, previously I also uh, 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 talked like that, but uh, on the same laptop I am presenting, sir. Okay, can okay. you hear, go sir? Ahead, go ahead, like you know, so what? Uh, Rajesh Kumar, I have a. You just say what is the objective of this review? Why you did this review? And what is the outcome of this review? That's it. 
ओके सर सर आई स्टडीड क्लिनिकल फीचर्स डायग्नोस्टिक क्राइटेरिया थेरेपीज एंड ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ कोरोना वायरस द सैलेंट फीचर ऑफ क्लिनिकल फीचर ऑफ द वायरस द कोविड नाइन्टीन रेंज फ्रॉम सिम्टोमेटिक स्टेट टू एक्यूट रेस्पिरेटरी डिस्ट्रेस सिंड्रोम एंड मल्टी ऑर्गन डिस्पेंशन द कॉमन क्लिनिकल फीचर्स आर फीवर कप सोर थ्रोट एडेक फैटिक मेलेगिया ब्रेथलेसनेस एंड कंजेक्टिस कॉम्प्लिकेशन रिलेटेड टू दिस इन्फेक्शन इंक्लूड एक्यूट रेस्पिरेटरी डिस्ट्रेस सिंड्रोम अरिथीमिया शॉक एक्यूट किडनी इंजुरी एक्यूट कार्डियक इंजुरी लीवर डिस्फंक्शन एंड सेकेंडरी इन्फेक्शन इन सम पेशेंट्स बाई द एंड ऑफ द फर्स्ट वीक द डिजीज कैन प्रोग्रेस टू निमोनिया रेस्पिरेटरी फेलियर एंड डेथ the diagnostic criteria of covid-19 is uh, a suspect case is case is one with fever sore throat and cough till the now the golden clinical diagnosis method of covid-19 is nucleic acid detection in nasal and throat swab sampling or other respiratory tract sampling by real time pcr and further confirmed by next generation sequencing the treatment strategy for uh, of covid-19 the first step is to ensure adequate isolation of covid-19 patients to prevent transmission to other contact patients and healthcare workers the mild illness should be managed at home by managing hydration and nutrition and controlling fever and cough in hypoxic patients oxygen is given to the patient and current therapies uh, for covid-19 there is lack of effective antiviral therapy against covid-19 oxygen therapy was given to nearly all the patients and who recommended hello yes sir hello yes sir hello have you done anything did you do any research on it no sir i am Looks i am like... presenting review review paper sir review paper review paper okay, sir okay cut shot cut shot your information okay finish as, as soon as possible okay sir okay 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 sir okay i am tracing sir the uh, ecm was given to the uh, hypoxemia patients uh, plasma therapy and immunoglobulin g are also given to some critical cases as rescue treatment now uh, at last antiviral treatment remdesivir shows antiviral therapy against several rna viruses and it show uh, uh, treatment in usa successfully a combination of remdesivir and chloroquine was proved to effectively inhibit SARS-CoV-2 in vitro other drugs suggested for therapy are arbidol intravenous immunoglobulins interferons chloroquine plasma of patients recovered from covid-19 and now vaccines like covishield covaxin and sputnik 5 are also available uh, now i can conclude that the outbreak of covid-19 swept across china rapidly and had spread throughout the world then this new virus outbreak has challenged the economic medical and public health infrastructure of china usa and almost all countries we sincerely hope that chinese people and other countries overcome this epidemic as soon as possible thank you sir thank you thank, thank you, you sir yeah so we have okay. yeah next speaker yes uh, neel rajendra kumar red smile yes sir yes sir neel rajesh what's the name of presenter hello neel what's the rajesh name of previous kumar quality yes sir neel sir rajesh it kumar. is known that to show, to share your screen after the auditor to make your presenter rajesh okay now hello. share your screen yeah rajesh yes sir yes sir hey, what's the name of previous presenter previous presenter rajesh kumar rajesh kumar oh rajesh kumar okay visible hello yes you so have screen visible okay yes, sir yes, okay. yes you have 10 minutes yeah yeah okay sir so i am neel dalati and i am working in sardarbat i am i am a research scholar at sardarbatel university and i am going to 
present my e poster on ecological impacts and status of mass crocodile on the selected wetlands of anand and khedar district in gujarat so as, uh, if you talk about the wetlands wetlands are having very important role of, and vital role for the human survivals as well as wetlands are having countless benefits wetlands provide an habitat to the thousands of species of aquatic and terrestrial plants and animals and um, uh, to the terrestrial plants and animals uh, from from last several decades india's water quality has been deteriorating due to the non stop release of influent industrial waste and domestic sewage into the surface water bodies that is inland water bodies and crocodile pelu uh, uh, marsh crocodile cro crocodile is pelustrius uh, being a uh, apex predator of the pond ecosystem is one of the largest carnivores in the indian subcontinent indian subcontinent the and this predator governs the uh, functioning of the freshwater ecosystem the major objective of this work was to evaluate the water samples and and to evaluate uh, with a uh, with a particular reference to physical chemical properties population of the crocodiles size of the crocodiles and activity of crocodiles in the wetland so the study area is of the in, bo in both the districts it is the central gujarat region is anand and kheda district and uh, the direct observations yeah. were the three villages were selected heran deva city two villages from anand to one with heran has been selected for the study area and Dr. the direct Kumar, observations were taken the dr navin kumar uh, hello why are disturbing i told you to keep your mic muted you are doing it again and again Mr. Neil, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, sir. The direct observation in that the data was collected in the de uh, from December to February 2019. All the data were collected between 8 a.m. to 10 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and the crocodiles were have been categorized in the different categories. That is, uh, less than one meter, one to two meter, two to three meter, and greater than two two meters. The method of sampling was done. Uh, water sampling was done. um it was a composite sample made uh, made collected from the different areas at a depth of 1.5 feet approximately and various physical chemical parameters like bod cod uh, uh, bod cod ph conductivity ammonic nitrogen salinity acidity and essential and non essential heavy metals were essential uh, were uh, were analyzed the results were was developed the temperature plays an important role for the uh for the uh, in the growth of both flora and fauna diversity in the ponds average temperature re ranges between 28 to uh, 24 to 28 degrees celsius in patli uh, 26 to 20, 33 degrees in deva and 28 to 32 degrees in hiranj the ph was around 7.5 to uh, uh, 8.5 Uh, respectively the permissible limit is around 6.5 to 8.5 mostly all of them are regulating the bio biochemical uh, reactions of the pond uh, ec ec the electrical conductivity is showing positive uh, positive correlation with the salinity and cod and while it is negatively correlated with the ammonical nitrogen as well as if we talk about bod bod level shows positive relation with the acidity and temperature um, negatively correlated with the salinity ammonical nitrogen cod uh, iron um, conductivity uh, sodium potassium turbidity it means during the winter the temperature decreases so the bod of the pond is also decreasing and uh, the uh, iron iron analysis the essential in element was also been analyzed from all the three villages that is patli of, uh, with 0.3 uh, deva with 0.09 and heran with 0.03 which were all in the permissible limits given by the bureau of indian standards the categorize of uh, the total population of all the uh, uh, total population of crocodiles from all the three villages were 105 uh, in which 1 to 2 meter crocodiles were maximum and the highest population was found in deva village with a number of 56 followed with heran with 28 and deva with 19 number of crocodiles the juvenile individuals especially the juvenile individuals were uh, majorly found in the patli villages uh, and according to the basking act as it's crocodile being a cold blooded animal they need to maintain their body temperature so activity of crocodiles were also monitored in which during the winter maximum uh, individuals during the 8 to 10 10 to 12 12 to 2 2 to 4 uh, the uh, in, in, in the time was slotted in the in this manner and maximum number of 
crocodile were basking during 12 to 2 pm and uh, activity of crocodiles if we monitor then basking was the major activity during this time and few of them were also floating uh, apart from that the preferable basking places of crocodiles were also monitored in which a large number of crocodiles were found uh, basking on the mounds and juvenile especially the juvenile individuals were basking around the lake shore and few of them were floating in the in uh, on, that is the surface basking at, on the water there are also some images which have been shown over here for the human crocodile interaction that is our, of the Pateley village. Um, uh, Eggshells were also been found. Uh, pug mark of crocodiles were also been monitored. Uh, and skate and uh, skate of the crocodiles were also found around the surrounding areas by um, while doing this survey. Uh, the conclusion was that the breeding population of mass crocodiles is around 105 and, and all the uh, and in, in which Deva is having maximum number of 58 number of individuals, the herons with 28 and Pately with 19 number of individuals respectively. The, all the ponds were having good water quality within the permissible limit. However, some of the domestic load should not be dumped into the pond and this is very important to uh, conserve the uh, breeding population of mass crocodile in Gujarat. Uh, further uh, management implications should be also been done. Gram panchayat should work in, uh, work together to provide to protect this ketone species. Uh, no one should be allowed to dump uh, the waste near the near or in the pond. Uh, stone pelleting on crocodile has been frequently monitored by the local individuals and. Uh, Stone pelleting was done on the crocodiles uh, should be stopped. Awareness programs should be done regularly. Fencing around the ponds uh, should be done um, uh, so that essential uh, so, so that to avoid human crocodile interactions or human crocodile conflict. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, Sudhakar, sir. Sudhakar, sir, are you there? I think. Uh... All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Neil. Okay, sir. Yeah. So we uh, we have an next presenter, Doctor uh, Mrs. Rekha Gautori. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. I'm here. Hello. Rekha Hello? Gautori. Hello, yes, sir. Yes, sir. hello. Okay. Hello, all right. Yeah, yeah, you can share your screen now. Hello, sir. Can I start? Hello. Yes, 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 yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good evening, all. I Rekha Gethodi from Department of Biotechnology, Moyen University, Nainital, and my presentation title is Molecular Based Identification. So just a second. Molecular Based and Molecular based identification and estimation of the biological potential of Nicktanthus arboretus from Kumau Hills. Okay. 
Sir, I'm unable to move the PPT slides. You uh, use, use the up and down keys. Use the up and down keys. Yes, I'm Use doing, but... up and down keys. Up and down. You can see in your keyboard there at the right side. Yes, there sir. I'm doing and yes. Down. Yes, yes, yes. These are contents of this study. Uh, now comes an introduction. In this study, we selected the plant Nictanthus arborotus belongs to the Oleaceae family and locally known as Parijat. And it is well known for their medicinal values like antioxidant, antimicrobial, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, etc. But the main selection criteria of this plant was still no report on the anti-neoplastic and anti-inflammatory study via targeting. EMT pathway. EMT is the epithelial to mesen camel transition pathway, which causes the drug resistance and metastasis, which leads to the cancer. That's why we selected this plant here from Kumau Hills. Now comes in methodology. Here, first we collected the plant, and for molecular identification, we used here DNA barcoding technique. In this, first we isolated the genomic DNA by using C type method, and then we amplified the desired amplicon, and then amplified product was. Then we purify the amplified product and then sequencing and database analysis. And other than this, we prepared the phyto extract, ethanolic extract, and then did the phytochemical screening. And then go for the biological activities like antioxidant and antibacterial. Anti now directly comes in result, molecular based identification. First here we isolated the genomic DNA in this figure one. You can see genomic DNA of the Nictanthus by CETA method. Then we amplified the uh, desired gene. We use the here three types of the gene, amplicon, RBCL, ITS, and MATK. And after amplification, we purified this amplified product and then sequencing. After sequencing, we got this sequence. And then we blast the sequence and in this result you can see the maximum matching score confirmed the selected plant as in Ictanthus arbotristis. Similar result was opt obtained with the all three genes. I am showing here only one gene results. Result. And next uh, preparation of the uh, extract and then their phytochemical analysis. Phytochemical analysis done by qualitative and quantitative, quantitative method. In the qualitative method, method first <coughs> we used in comparison to control, you can see the um, both extract and early here we used the two types of the ex flower and the leaf extract or ethanol extract and in comparison to the control, the both extract showing the in colorimetric assay, both extract showing the presence of the confirm the presence of the these phytochemical phytochemicals and uh, Next, we continuing this result in this table. This is the appearance of the color after treatment. And here, this symbol indicating the presence, absence, abundant, and moderate concentration of these, these phytochemicals in the prepared extract. Next, the quantitative analysis of phyto extract. Here, we quantify the phenol and flavonoids in the uh, nictanthus leaf extract and flower extract by using the gallic acid and the curacetin as a standard. So, uh, here, this graph, this is the gallic acid standard and this is the quercetin standard for flavonoids. In this table, you can see the result, both nictensis leaf and flower extract showing nearly equal content of the phenols, but the flavonoid content is higher in the nictensis leaf extract in comparison to flower extract. Further, we estimated here antioxidant assay, antioxidant potential by using diff different scavenging activities. Uh, and here we use ascorbic acid, acid as a standard. Uh, and the, <coughs> this is the DP, DPPH assay and the AVTS assay. In both assay, you can see results in this graph with increasing concentration, both extract uh, increasing the uh, re reducing power or antioxidant potential in comparison to the ascorbic acid. But um, but if it's, if we clearly uh, see here the nictensis leaf extract showing much more higher potential of antioxidant in comparison to the flower extract here we calculated the ic50 value of of this these assays here in this result also this is showing the significantly both extracts significantly increasing the antioxidant potential with increasing the concentration in comparison to 
standard ascorbic acid further we uh, evaluate the antioxidant power by using the frap reducing assay ferric reducing assay and phosphomolybdenum assay uh, again we used here the ascorbic acid as a standard and uh, in this bar diagram you can see with uh, with increasing concentration and in comparison to control the absorbance increased that means the both uh, extract showing have this significant antioxidant potential or power we can say now we have we did the antibacterial activity by colony forming assay method and here this is the and we used here, here four pathogenic bacterial strain strains and uh, uh, this is the canamycin used as a positive uh, and canamycin antibiotic used as a positive control and without treated bacterial cell used as a negative control so in comparison to this canamycin result both extract nle and nfe significantly Showing the antibacterial activity. Here we calculated the fifty percent minimum inhibitory concentration, and in this this result concluded that um, nicotinous leaf extract have higher potential or higher anti antibacterial activity against the aromona salmonicida. This is the gram negative bacteria. Next. This, these are the plates and of the canamycin. I'm showing here only the canamycin plates. You can see in, with increasing concentration and in comparison to the negative control, the number of colonies decreased. We calculated colony by naked eye and with increasing concentration in, and decreased the number of the colonies. Now conclusion, this is study concluded that DNA barcoding validate the identity of nicotine serbotitis. Significant phenolic and flavonoid content present in the both ethanol extract, which is equivalent to standard, and um, gallic acid and curacetin. And both extract also have the significant uh, antioxidant and antibacterial activity. And further in vitro and in vivo study also need to be carried out to validate the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory potential of the nicotine serbotitis. Next, I'm moving. Hello. Uh, have you done? No, sir. sir. Slides are now moving. Yes. You just click, you just click on the slide and use the up and down arrows. Yes. Now, future right. perspective, anti-inflammatory role of the phytoextract, elucidation of antineoplastic activity of phytoextract via EMT, via targeting EMT pathways and the combinatorial studies. And now, acknowledgement, ICMR for funding funding support and the Department of Biotechnology for their infra infrastructural and facilities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Rekha Gautri. And we have a uh, next presenter, Dr. Navin yes, Kumar. Ah, uh, sir, present. This is Dr. Navin Kumar. Yeah, you can share your screen now. Just take 10 minutes, okay, not more than that. Okay, sir, okay, fine. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, sir. Sir, uh, this image visible, sir? It's clear? Yes, yes, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir, thank you. Uh, this is Dr. Navin Kumar, lecturer, Department of Microbiology, Daungir University, Daungir, Karnataka, Karnataka State. Uh, I'm going to present on ethanol production from uh, lignocellulosic wastes. So we have to select it, Arecana tusk waste, Arecana tusk. The paper title is Biological Pretreatment of Arecana tusk for Enhanced Delignification and Enzymatic Digestibility for Ethanol Production through 
separate hydrolysis and fermentation process so in this work uh, we have uh, we have studied uh, that is in uh, the division is uh, shumaga division shumaga in karnataka state so that is a major growing arecana task it is one of the big problem is uh, the agriculture for farmers that is through uh, the uh, arecana task waste is through in roadside area so, so that is one of the major problem that is to cause environmental pollution so that's why uh, we have to find out uh, some alternate solutions so this waste is uh, highly suitable for the production of alcohol alcohol is an uh, so a lot of applications that is used in uh, la uh, diagnostic labs and as well as uh, used as an alternative biofuels so that's why we have to follow uh, methodology so that we collected the arecanatus in shumaga division and go for after second step is uh, uh, mechanical treatment that is go for gr uh, its grinding it's go for its uh, fine particles the arecanat is high lignin content it's very tough for uh, degradation so that's why first in initial step pre treatment method pre treatment is go for physical aspects that is to grinding it's very fine particles so this is very easy and it's uh, effective for in fermentation strategy and second thing is uh, collection of uh, selection of yeast cultures and bacteria so we have to in this study selected the total five yeast strains highly effective strains for uh, alcohol production and also then bacteria that is jaimonas mobilis and uh, final uh, distillation aspect effect of uh, fungal treatment optimization conditions so in this work we have to selected uh, two strains one is uh, aspergillus fumigatus it is an uh, cellulolytic fungi and another one is pneurochaeta chrysosporium that is an white rot fungi basidiomycetes fungi so this uh, in this study first you go for uh, raw material treated with an fungi that is indigenous fungi so that is called biological treatment cellulose the aspergillus fumigatus is, uh, that is highly efficient for only cellulose degrading and the second thing is the uh, pneurochaeta chrysosporium is the uh, lignin degradation so that is only for uh, uh, lignin degradation so so that's why these two strains are selected first initial composition of raw material so that is first initial step analyze the particle size particle size you go for it this is very effective for fermentation strategy that is around 0.6 mm size raw material is a good condition and go for analyze reducing sugars non reducing and cellulose hemicellulose lignin content so after the chemical analysis go for optimization of the culture conditions so go for first thing is ph ph condition so which is the uh, good condition for that is uh, good condition for that is the uh, biological effect the ph compared to ph 4 5 6 7 8 the ph range 6 is uh, that is uh, better and good for uh, the increases the production of sugar rate ph 6 and second thing is temperature the good condition 30 degree the compared to both 20 25 30 and 35 40 degree celsius the condition 30 degree the suitable that is a good condition for the it increases the sugar concentration level and incubation time the fifth day fifth day shows that is maximum sugar concentration so these uh, optimization conditions comparison the ph level uh, in temperature and as well as uh, incubation time though it shows a ph range 6 and uh, temperature 30 and incubation time it shows some maximum sugar concentration both as uh, both the strains uh, cellulolytic fungi aspergillus fumigatus as well as uh, pneurochaeta chrysosporium and go for, uh, go to the fermentation uh, strategy so look at that uh, fermentation aspects optimization of conditions for fermentation uh, uh, steps though so that is effect of temperature effect of temperature effect of uh, ph and uh, inoculum concentration these uh, three parameters we, we go for a comparison and uh, temperature is 30 degree shows a uh, good results for uh, ethanol production so comparison the different strains saccharomyces cerevisiae saccharomyces vivarum saccharomyces pombe pcr stipitis candida sciate and jaimonas mobilis five yeast strains five yeast and one is jaimonas mobilis these uh, these strains comparison jaimonas mobilis is good for compared to yeast strains it shows a good result for the production uh, the, uh, for the for the alcohol production 
uh, in the temperature 30 degree and second thing is ph range ph 6 range it shows the good results almost uh, all strains of five yeast on bacteria and inoculum concentration three percent so first we have to go for uh, uh, different uh, concentration inoculum concentration one percent two percent three percent four percent and five percent so that is the three percent so that uh, increases the alcohol production rate so after st starting uh, it uh, normal amount after gradually after five percent it decreases so it uh, three percent is good so the final conclusion is Arecana Tusk is one of the best uh, source that alternative source for uh, alcohol production go for searching that is in a uh, uh, new one uh, agricultural waste for it to find out the alternate uh, source uh, for uh, biofuel productions okay so that's why uh, uh, Arecana Tusk is a good source for the alcohol production and also consortium that is co-culture of fungal cultures is very uh, good uh, for uh, alcohol productions yes sir Sir, thank you, thank you very much, um, Dr. Navi. Yes, yeah, sir. So, yeah, we have a next presenter, Mrs. Uh, Rajeshri Patil. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Rajeshri Patil. Are you there, Rajeshri Patil? Rajeshri Patil. All right. Uh, Harvi Patil. Patil. Harvi yes, sir. Patil. Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. Sir, I'm not able to share my screen. Rajeshri Patil, are you presenting your work? Rajeshri Patil. Rajeshri Patil. Rajeshri Patil, are you presenting your work? Patil. Yes, sir. I am here. Sir, right. I am Harvi Patil. Yeah, yeah. Share your screen. Okay. Sir, it is visible. Go for presentation mode. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My research topic is impact of population on phytosociology of macrophytes. Suitable quantity and the quality of the fresh water are required for the all living things in the developing world. Various countries facing a water crisis due to the industrialization, agriculture runoff, deforestation, urbanization, uh, etc. Uh, wetland containers reach a huge amount of the biodiversity and it is also a most productive ecosystem Sorry, sir. Have, yes, sir. You have you have only ten minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, plants that are bound to the water are complete their life cycle, known as the aquatic plant. Macrophytes are a large group that possess the macroalgae, mosses, ferns, and angiosperms. Macrophytes play a key role in an aquatic ecosystem because they act as a preliminary producer source in the food chain of the aquatic ecosystem and maintaining the proper equilibrium between the abiotic and abiotic components. Macrophytes are act as a measurable indicator of the ecological condition of the surface water. Uh, objective. The important aim of this investiga investigation to identify the different uh, difference in the native flora dominating in the polluted lake and non-polluted lake to assess the pollution macrophyte relationship and to evaluate the role of the various polluting factor on the distribution of the composition of the macrophyte flora in the selected lakes. 
materials and methods the investigation work has uh, has been carried out at the valsa district gujarat india valsa district is located at the southern most uh, most tip of gujarat india at uh, uh, at the bank of the arabian sea major wetland categories of the district are coastal areas rivers lakes ponds streams reservoir and salt marshes uh, here we selected two different lake based on their pollution status where site one indicate the polluted lake which is situated at the valsa city named rakoria lake this lake carried out a high amount of household sewages and agriculture runoff from the surrounding area where the site two indicate the non polluted lake which is situated at the padi taluka known as a padi lake carried out the less amount of the household runoff from the surrounding area sampling was done in the post monsoon season the uh, water sample was the filtered through the 0.45 micrometer pore size filter and filled in a 50 ml plastic bottle from their uh, portion separately from the periphery to middle uh, from selected side before the collection of the water sample plastic bottle were washed with a source water after collection water sample was brought to the laboratory for the further study the test was performed by the standard method given by the skmat and the afa heavy metal analysis was done was done with the help of the icp oes hc cart uh, to study the floristic composition field trip were undertaken throughout the study time to collect and record uh, and identify with the help of the flora uh, like uh, sa and the cook flora the statistical analysis such as a measurement uh, sanon index uh, uh, linear model cc analysis was done using the past software uh, past software results total 45 vascular macrophytes were the recorded which belonging to the 26 families where the rsc was the most uh, represented family with the six species of the total flora followed by the cypressy family uh, which uh, possess the five species boraginaceae during the study period 31 species were represented in the polluted wetland and 40 species were represented in the non polluted wetland and 26 were represented in a both group iconia classic this was the dominant species in the polluted wetland and seren or uh, ceratophyllum demersum was the dominant at the non polluted wetland at the selected wetland site uh, emergent macrophyte were the dominant category at the both sites where the 51.6 percentage represented at the polluted wetland and 40 percentage represented the non polluted wetland followed by the amphibious categories uh, amphibious macrophytes uh, Uh, free floating macrophytes submerged uh, but rooted floating but rooted macrophyte category and limited species um, around the 3.22 percentage uh, represented uh, uh, the group x and the 5 percentage uh, 5 percentage represented the group y means the non polluted or uh, submerged but not rooted category result of the ronkier life form classification showed that the location of the macrophyte birds were the mostly half hidden uh, which means the hemicryptophytes uh, were the 35.48 percentage or near to the ground uh, means the camophytes are the 32.26 percentage at the selected wetland 25.8 percentage macrophytes were the therophytes and on Only 6.5 macrophytes show the location of the bird below the surface level. Phanerophytes were the totally absent uh, during the study period. Bivariate linear model separates uh, these two groups. Uh, this application revealed a high significance difference between the floristic composition of the non-polluted group and the polluted group. figure shows uh, so shows the significant correlation between the water parameter and table so the uh, inner test correlation intercept correlation which derived from the canonical corresponding analysis of the examined water parameters heavy metal contamination was present in the polluted wetland but in the non polluted wetland the heavy metal was uh, not in the uh, not under the detection range 
Conclusion: Pollution present at the selected study site due to the high anthropogenic activity present surrounding the study area. A general reduction of the macrophyte present at the group X uh, means the polluted area because of the high pollution present in the compared to the group Y. Reduction in the macrophyte diversity and the species richness observed at the study wetland was the supposedly linked to the pollution status of the water parameters. Ecological status indicate the macrophyte community. Found in the non-polluted wetland was the more complex with a higher value of the standard index, which may be the 3.57 percentage. 40, 45 macrophyte species belonging to the 26 families were recording at the study site. Study site where the most common tolerant family was the Araceae and the Cypraceae family. The polluted site has the various species from the tolerant family from the Araceae family, such as the Colocaxia, Lemna, Spirodella, Polyrhiza, Wolfia Araceae. Uh, the bivariate uh, linear model separates the two groups, which clearly show the floristic composition of the polluted and the non-polluted wetland, where the Iconia classicus was the predominant species found as the floating mat throughout the lake. Which is the highly tolerating macrophyte for the contaminated wastewater, and it can also widely used for the phytoremediation. This study proved that the maximum recorded macrophytes were sensitive to the pollution level. However, this explains why there are maximum macrophyte represented in the non-polluted wetland, means the 40 species, while the fewer macrophyte represented the polluted wetland, means 31 species with the multiple invading species. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Harvi Patil. Uh, so, Rajshree Patil, are you going to present or what? Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm sharing yes. the screen. All right. Good evening, everyone. Happy Environment Day to all. As a part of Environment Theme, I am presenting paper on traditional knowledge. Though I belong to law department, uh, since uh, my research area is interdisciplinary, so I would like to present paper on protection of traditional knowledge in the era of globalization. Myself, Rajeshri Patil, Rajeshri Patil. Uh, Rajeshri 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 Uh, yes, sir. I can hear you. Mode. Yes, sir. Go to the presentation mode. Full screen. Okay, sir. Slide show. Slide show. Go to slide show. I'm clicking, sir. Yeah. Why? Why press it online? Like cancel it? Like why did you choose this one? Yes. Cancel this one. Like close it. Go to slide show. There is a presentation. Okay, sir. This is slide show. So yeah. present online. Set up. No, 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 no. Next one, like no, current. No, no, not this one. This is presenting online, not this one. Why did you choose this again? Like cancel it. Okay, slide show. Uh, yeah, from set beginning. Up slide show. No, no, no. Yeah, I use it from beginning. Yeah. From current slide. From current slide. Anything, anything is okay. Is it fine, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Your voice is not audible. Yes, sir.
Let me begin with the introduction part. Can you hear me, sir? Go ahead. You have Can you hear me? Go ahead. Traditional yes, yes, knowledge is the knowledge. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Traditional knowledge is the knowledge of the society. It is the augmentation of culture, a system of society transmitted from generation to generation. One of the notable effects of globalization on traditional knowledge has been shift of local and traditional knowledge into global knowledge, which by itself is no threat to traditional and indigenous knowledge. Claiming monopoly rights over such knowledge by some developed countries is really exploitation of the countries. So really it is a, a great uh, concern for the protection of traditional knowledge. Moving to next slide. So these are the examples wherein we can analyze that these uh, garlic, this picture is very much clear that which is having medicinal value, turmeric, then uh, traditional ecological knowledge. This is also a very important role. It plays a very important role based on the use of plants and animals and natural resources for livelihood. This traditional eco ecological knowledge that plays a very important role. This is a tradition, but not static. So here, uh, the knowledge has been transmitted from generation to generation. That is very important. Moving to the definition and significance of traditional knowledge. Before moving to the definition part, I would like to highlight on the objectives of the study. To study the importance and threats associated with regard to traditional knowledge associated biodiversity then secondly to evaluate the steps taken at the international level in regard to the conservation of biodiversity and more importantly there is a need to understand the development of law towards the sustainable use of biodiversity to analyze the impact of intellectual property rights on traditional knowledge to study the significance of traditional knowledge and biopiracy related cases moving to the hypothesis the current provisions are not enough towards the prevention of biopiracy and moreover doesn't suffice and thus leaves a wide space for reworking upon the provisions which shall be ensuring the prevention of biopiracy and also misappropriation of the traditional knowledge from being patenting. There is a great need and urgency to prevent the unauthorized use of biodiversity and its related traditional knowledge by enacting so generous legislation. Coming to the definition part, traditional knowledge it is widely it has not been defined but for our understanding we can say that it is the cumulative body of knowledge know-how practices and representation traditional knowledge refers to the knowledge innovation and customs of indigenous and local communities embodying traditional lifestyles as well as indigenous and local technologies according to the un convention on biological diversity coming to the traditional knowledge in the global economy Traditional peoples and communities are responsible for discovering, developing and preserving a tremendous range of medicinal plants, health giving herbal formulations and agriculture and forest products and are traded internationally and create considerable economic value. Traditional knowledge is also used as an input into modern industries such as pharmaceuticals, botanical medicines, cosmetics and agricultural products, biological pesticides. Moving to further the challenges of traditional knowledge protection. As we know that India is rich with biodiversity, and but we are not at all so much advanced with regarding to research and technology, wherein the advanced countries, they exploit uh, the countries which are rich with biodiversity, but poor with the economy. Under such circumstances, we need to understand, we need to prevent biopiracy because the rich countries are exploiting the developed countries which are the countries which are having which are rich with biodiversity that is the crux of the point so here we need proper uh, legislation to, to protect traditional knowledge in india we do not have specific legislation with regarding to protection of traditional knowledge though uh, in the international level we have trade related intellectual property rights when we refer article 27 3b which speaks that the protection can be given for plant variety either be by way of domestic legislation or by way of so general system. So general system uh, in the law, it means that enacting our own legislation, that is very important. So here, uh, so, uh, we, we can say that uh, the biological resources plays a very important role in balancing the ecosystem and 
in addition to that even we have to focus with regarding to intellectual property rights this is a part of environment wherein it is harming the environment so here uh, traditional knowledge protection is also very important therefore i would like to say that the traditional knowledge and biodiversity both are two faces of same coin so we cannot segregate because we need someone who has to conserve or protect the biodiversity so who will be the conserver it is the people so it is the traditional knowledge it is the indigenous communities who are who can protect the uh, traditional knowledge who can uh, conserve the biological resources how they will conserve when we give royalties when we give recognition to indigenous people when we acknowledge the traditional community people then only they will come forward they will share their knowledge otherwise the knowledge it will die with those people only so the the basic thing here is that the knowledge is passing from generation to generation so the traditional knowledge has to be protected otherwise it will die with that person that is the crux of the point so he we have a patent patent copyright trademark these uh, processes the part of intellectual property rights so here the traditional knowledge in toto i can say that the protection is very important the specific legislation has to be enacted then coming to the misappropriation of traditional knowledge biopiracy cases when we emphasize on uh, turmeric patent so turmeric is turmeric neem these are considered to be grandmother's recipe the protection is very important so the uh, when the us granted patent on turmeric and neem later on it has been revoked why because india challenged before the csir has challenged before the us court so Uh, we can say that the sanskrit text was available wherein that knowledge was belonging to the india based on that document the patent has been revoked so this is the crux of the crux of the point in this way we can say that like similarly we should have documentation registration is very important we if we maintain properly documentation with regarding to the knowledge then definitely we can protect the traditional knowledge we can uh, prevent biopiracy cases in india we have traditional knowledge digital library wherein uh, the knowledge can be entered and uh, the protection can be given similarly we are, when whenever in, even we have people biodiversity register where is the there in you know, there is a provision in uh, biodiversity act wherein the people the local community people they can share their knowledge in uh, that register that that is a document wherein uh, information will be recorded otherwise the protection cannot be given so written document is very important in case of traditional knowledge that is the lacking that is the missing that we have to identify we have to recognize the traditional knowledge if we focus on jiwani's case that is the kani tribal pe people in kerala where in uh, the arogya pacha uh, usage of this plant was known to the uh, kani tribal people and in this in this is i can say that this is a classic example in case of uh, uh, benefit sharing with regarding to the wherein uh, the jiwani that was a drug has been developed on the basis of arogya pacha plant and uh, they felt that the recognition and the benefit sharing has to be given to the tribal people this is a very important in uh, in the present era what is happening is benefit uh, sharing has not been given to the uh, indigenous community that is missing that we have to highlight that is uh, the missing where everywhere we see that patent has been granted but how the patent has been granted so sometimes what what is happening is based on the discoveries whatever we find in the nature on um, based on that the patent will be granted that is a very important so many uh, patent has been granted but we should challenge it we should, if we have a document then definitely we can challenge before the court and we can uh, conserve the biodiversity we can protect the knowledge of the traditional knowledge people coming to further this is uh, this picture is very much clear that with regarding to the turmeric as already so, uh, told you that the sanskrit text was available with regarding to the protection of traditional knowledge based on this evidence only we won and the us patent that is in neem case then moving on to international uh, initiatives what kind of uh, protection is available at the international level at the international level we have convention on biological diversity when we emphasize on article 8j of uh, cbd this is uh, the main objective of this uh, cbd is conservation of biodiversity sustainable use then thirdly benefit sharing these are the three objectives of this convention and uh, we have to 
another uh, additional protocols that is Cartagena protocol we have. Then uh, we have Nagoya protocol, wherein we can say that benefit sharing has been highlighted. These are the supplementary protocol uh, for the Convention on Biological Diversity. Similarly, we have World Trade Organization, we have World Intellectual Property Organization, Food and Agricultural Organization. The main aim of these organization is to encourage uh, to protect the biodiversity and uh, to protect the traditional knowledge. Then uh, moving to further, the very important thing and the, in the traditional knowledge and uh, in case of uh, IPR, we need to understand where is the lacuna. We have to identify that there is an overlapping between trip segment and CBD. On the CBD, it states that Article 8J, it conserve, it protects that conservation is very important according to CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity. On the other hand, that is the trip segment trade related intellectual property rights. At, based on Article 27.3B, it states that uh, we have to uh, protect the plant variety by way of patenting, by way of uh, domestic legislation, so general system. So TRIPS agreement is not at all giving clear idea with regarding to the protection of traditional knowledge. And in India, we have uh, Biodiversity Act, we have Patents Amendment Act 2002, then the documentation of the traditional knowledge in India, as already I told you that we have digital library, then we have Honeybee database, wherein the database can be entered, then uh, uh, with regarding to this, uh, I would like to say that so general system, it plays a very important role. So there is a great uh, uh, need to raise the public awareness at local, regional, national and international level concerning the existing indigenous knowledge system with respect to the conservation and sustainable use of natural resources, the effective systems of rights and benefit sharing mechanism that has to be encouraged, women uh, conservers has to be encouraged, then um, Coming to the suggestion part, I would like to suggest that documentation of traditional knowledge is a very important thing. Then secondly, we need to enact so general system. We need to uh, make a doc proper documentation. Then only we can protect the traditional knowledge. So otherwise, what will happen? We are not in a, we cannot protect the ecology. When we say that uh, scientific word, environment, ecosystem and all, we need to focus even the traditional knowledge is also, traditional knowledge is also a part of the environment. So here we can say that the uh, I has already told you that both are two faces of same coin. We cannot segregate traditional knowledge and biodiversity. So therefore, the there is a need of protection of traditional knowledge by enacting either by way of enacting so general system or by way of uh, documentation. More uh, uh, what I can say that uh, proper and effective law is very much required. Thank you. So now I thank the organizers for providing me an opportunity to present the paper. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rajiv.